Chapter 54 Picture to yourself, said Volodyovsky to Pan Longin a few days later, that that man has changed in one hour as if he had grown ten years older. So joyous was he, so talkative, so full of tricks, that he surpassed Ulysses himself. Now he does not let two words out of his lips, but dozes away whole days, complains of old age, and speaks as in a dream. I knew that he loved her, but I did not think that he loved her to this degree. What is there wonderful in that, answered the Lithuanian, sighing. He was the more attached to her that he snatched her from the hands of Bogan, and went through so many dangers and adventures in the flight. While there was hope his wit was exerted in inventions, and he kept on foot, but now he has really nothing to do in the world, being alone and without heart for anything. I tried to drink with him, hoping that drink would restore his former vigor, but in vain. He drinks, but does not think as before, does not talk about his exploits. Only becomes sensitive, and then hangs his head on his breast and goes to sleep. I do not know if even Pan Yen is in greater despair than he. It is an unspeakable loss, for withal he was a great knight. Let us go to him, Pan Michael. He had the habit of scoffing at me and teasing me on every occasion. Perhaps the desire will take him now. My God, how people change! He was such a gladsome man. Let us go, said Volodyovsky. It is already late. But it is most grievous for him in the evening, for dozing all day, he is unable to sleep at night. Thus conversing, they betook themselves to the quarters of Zagloba, whom they found sitting under the open window with his head resting on his hand. It was late. Every movement in the castle had ceased. Only the sentinels answered in prolonged tones, and in the thicket separating the castle from the town the nightingales brought out their passionate trills, whistling, smacking, and clapping as quickly as fall the drops in a spring shower. Through the open window came in the warm breeze of May and the clear rays of the moon, which lighted the downcast face of Zagloba and the bald crown bent toward his breast. Good evening! said the two knights. Good evening, answered Zagloba. Why have you forgotten yourself before the window instead of going to bed, asked Volodyovsky. Zagloba sighed. It is not a question of sleep with me, said he, with a drawling voice. A year ago I was fleeing with her on the Kagamlik from Bogan, and in this same way those birds were twittering. And where is she now? God has so ordained, said Volodyovsky. Ordained to tears and sorrow, Pan Michael. There is no more consolation for me. They were silent. But through the open window came, with power increasing each moment, the trill of the nightingales, with which all that clear night seemed filled. Oh, God, God! sighed Zagloba, exactly as it was on the Kagamlik. Pan Langin shook a tear from his great mustaches, and the little knight said after a while, Sorrow is sorrow. But drink some mead with us, for there is nothing better against sorrow. At the glass we will talk of better times. Let us drink, said Zagloba, with resignation. Volodyovsky ordered the servant to bring a light and decanter, and afterward, when they had sat down, knowing that reminiscences enlivened Zagloba more than anything else. He inquired, It is just a year, is it not? since you fled with her before Bogan from Rosloji? It was in May, in May, answered Zagloba. We passed through the Kagamlik to flee to Zolotonosha. Oh, it is hard in this world. And she was disguised? As a Cossack. I had to cut off her hair with my saber, poor thing. So that she shouldn't be discovered. I know the place under the tree where I hid the hair, together with the saber. Oh, she was a sweet lady!" added Langin, with a sigh. I tell you, gentlemen, from the first day I fell in love with her as if I had paid homage to her from youthful years. And she would clasp her hands before me and thank me for her rescue and my care. I wish they had killed me before I had lived to this day. Would that I had not lived to it! Then came silence again, and the three knights drank mead mixed with tears. After that Zagloba began to speak again. I thought to pass a calm old age with them, but now, 
here his hands hung down powerless, nowhere solace, nowhere solace. But in the grave. Before Zagloba had finished speaking a disturbance rose in the anteroom. Someone wished to enter, and the servant would not let him in. A wordy struggle followed, in which it seemed to Volodyovsky that he recognized some known voice. Therefore he called to the servant not to forbid entrance further. The door opened, and in it appeared the plump, ruddy face of Genzian, who, passing his eyes over those present, bowed and said, May Jesus Christ be praised. For the ages of ages, said Volodyovsky. This is Genzian. I am he, said the young man, and I bow to your knees. And where is my master? Your master is in Koritz, and ill. Oh, for God's sake, what do you tell me? And is he seriously ill, which God forbid? He was, but he is better now. The doctor says he will recover. For I have come with news about the lady to my master. The little knight began to nod his head in melancholy fashion. You need not hasten, for Pan Skshetuski already knows of her death, and we here are shedding tears of mourning for her. Jensian's eyes were bursting from his head. By violence. What do I hear? Is she dead? Not dead, but murdered in Kiev by robbers. What are you talking about? In what Kiev? Don't you know Kiev? For God's sake, are you fooling with me? What had she to do in Kiev when she is hidden in the ravine at Valadinka, not far from Rashkov, and the witch was commanded not to move a step till Bogan should come? As God is dear to me, must I run mad? What witch are you speaking of? Why, Horpina? I know that base vial well. Zagloba stood up suddenly from the bench, and began to strike out with his hands like a man who has fallen into deep water and is trying to save himself from drowning. By the living God, be quiet, said he to Volodyovsky. By God's wounds, let me ask him. The company trembled, so pale was Zagloba, and the perspiration came out on his bald head. He sprang over the bench to Genzian, and seizing the young fellow by the shoulders, asked in a hoarse voice. Who told you that she is near Rashkov, secreted? Who should tell me? Bogan. Are you mad, fellow? roared Zagloba, shaking him like a pear tree. What Bogan? Oh, for God's sake, called Genzian, why do you shake me so? Let me go, let me collect my wits, for I am losing my senses. You have turned everything over in my head. What bogan should there be, or don't you know him? Speak, or I'll stab you! shouted Zagloba. Where did you see bogan? In Vlodava. What do you want of me? cried the frightened young man. Am I a robber? Zagloba lost the thread of his thought, breath failed him, and he fell on the bench panting heavily. Volodyovsky came to his aid. When did you see Bogan? asked Volodyovsky. Three weeks ago. Then he is alive? Why shouldn't he be? He told me himself how you split him up, but he has recovered. And he told you that the young lady is at Rashkov? Who else should tell me? Listen, Genzian. It is a question here of the life of your master and the young lady. Did Bogan himself tell you that she was not in Kiev? My master, how could she be in Kiev when he secreted her at Rashkov, and told Horpina on peril of her life not to let her escape? But now he has given me a baton and his ring to go to her. For his wounds opened, and he had to lie down himself, it is unknown for how long. Further words from Genzian were interrupted by Zagloba, who sprang from the bench again, and seizing the remnant of his hair with both hands, began to shout like a madman, my daughter is living, by God's wounds, she is living. They didn't kill her in Kiev, she is alive, she is alive, my dearest. And the old man stamped with his feet, laughed and sobbed. Finally, he seized Genzian by the head, pressed him to his bosom and began to kiss him, so that the young fellow lost his head altogether. Let me go, my master, for I am stifled. Of course she is alive, God grant us to go together for her, my master, but, my master. Let him go, 
let him tell his story, for we don't understand anything yet, said Volodyovsky. Speak, speak, cried Zagloba. Begin at the beginning, brother, said Pan Longin, on whose mustaches, too, thick dew had settled down. Permit me, gentlemen, to draw breath, said Genzian. And I will close the window, for those wretches of nightingales are tearing away in the bushes at such a rate that it is impossible to speak. Mead, cried Volodyovsky to the servant. Genzian closed the window with his usual deliberation, then turned to the company and said, You will let me sit down, for I am tired. Sit down. Said Volodyovsky, pouring to him from the decanter borne in by the servant. Drink with us, for you deserve it for the news which you bring. If you will only speak as soon as possible. Good mead. Said he, raising the glass toward the light. May you be split. Will you talk? shouted Zagloba. You are angry at once, my master. I will talk if you wish. It is for you to command and me to obey, that's why I am a servant. But I see that I must start from the beginning and tell everything in detail. Speak from the beginning. You remember, gentlemen, how the news of the taking of Bar came, how we thought then that the young lady was lost. So I returned to the Genzians, to my parents and my grandfather, who is now ninety years old, I speak correctly, no. Ninety and one. May he be nine hundred, burst out Zagloba. May God give him as many years as possible. I thank you, my master, for the kind word. So I returned home to visit my parents, as I by the assistance of God had passed the robbers. For as you know, the Cossacks took me up in Chigirin last year, and considered me one of themselves because I nursed Bogan when wounded, and arrived at great intimacy with him. And at the same time I collected some little from those criminals, some silver and precious stones. We know, we know, said Volodyovsky. Well, I reached my parents, who were glad to see me, and couldn't believe their eyes when I showed them all I had collected. I had to swear to my grandfather that I had come by it honestly. Then they were glad. For you must know that they have a lawsuit with the Yavorskys about a pear tree which stands on the line between them, half its branches are on the land of the Yavorskys, and half on ours. Now the Yavorskys shake the tree and our pears fall, and many of them go to them. They stick to it that those in the middle are theirs, and we. Don't bring me to anger, fellow. Interrupted Zagloba, and don't speak of that which does not belong to the story. First, with your pardon, my master, I am no fellow, but a noble, though a poor one, and with an escutcheon as well as you, as Pan Volodyovsky and Podbipienta, friends of Pan Skshtusky. Will tell you. And I repeat that this lawsuit has lasted fifty years. Dear little fish, said Podbipienta, sweetly, but tell us about Bogan, not about pear trees. Of Bogan, said Genzian. Well, let it be about Bogan. That Bogan thinks, my master, that he has not a more faithful friend and servant than me, though he struck me in Chigirin. For it is true I nursed him, took care of him, when the Kurtsevichi had wounded him. I lied then when I said I did not like my master's service and preferred to be with the Cossacks, for there was more profit among them, and he believed me. Why shouldn't he believe me when I brought him to health? Therefore he took a wonderful fancy to me, and what is true, rewarded me most liberally, not knowing that I had sworn to have vengeance on him for the wrong he had done me in Chigirin. And if I did not stab him at once, it was only because it is not proper for a noble to stab an enemy lying in bed, as he would stick a pig. Well, well, said Volodyovsky, we know that too, but how did you find him this time? It was this way, when we had pushed the Yavorskys to the wall, they will have to go out with packs on their backs, it cannot be otherwise, I thought, well. It is time for me to look for Bogan and pay him for the wrong he did me. I left my parents in secret, and my grandfather, and he, there is good metal in him, said, if you have taken an oath, then go, if not, you will be a fool. I went, for I thought to myself besides, when I find Bogan maybe I shall learn something about the lady, if she is alive. And afterward when I shoot him and go to my master with the news, 
that too will not be without a reward. Certainly it will not, and we will reward you also, said Volodyovsky. And from me, brother, you will have a horse with trappings, added Podbipienta. I thank you most kindly, said the delighted young man. A present is a fitting return for good news, and I won't drink away what I get from anybody. Oh, the devil take me, muttered Zagloba. You went away from your home and friends then? Suggested Volodyovsky. I did, and on the way I thought, where shall I go in Lester's barrage, for it is not far from Bogan, and I can hear more readily of my master. I go through Bilo to Vlodava, and in Vlodava I find my little horse terribly used up, I halt for refreshment. There was a fair in the place, all the inns were full of nobles. I go to townspeople. Nobles there too. Then a Jew says to me, I have a room, but a wounded noble has taken it. Then I say, This has happened well, for I know how to nurse, and your barber, as it is fair time, cannot get through his work. The Jew said then that the noble took care of himself, did not wish to see any man, still he went afterward to inquire. It is evident the noble was worse, for he gave orders to admit me. I enter, and I look to see who lies in the bed. Bogan. I bless myself in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I was frightened. But he recognized me at once, was very glad, for he takes me as his friend, and says he, God sent you to me. I'll not die this time. And I say, What are you doing here, my master? But he put his finger on his lips, and only afterward did he tell me of what had happened to him, how Malnitsky sent him to the king, who at that time was a prince, sent him from before Zamost. And how Pan Volodyovsky cut him up at Lipki. Did he remember me pleasantly? asked Volodyovsky. I cannot say, my master, otherwise than pleasantly enough. I thought, says he, that he was some little cur. But it turns out that he is a hero of the first water, who almost cut me in two. But when he thinks of Pan Zagloba, then he grits his teeth in great anger, because he urged you on to this fight. May the hangman light him, said Zagloba, I am not afraid of him. We return then to our former familiarity, yes, even to greater. He told me all, how near he had been to death. How they removed him to the mansion at Lipki, taking him for a noble, and he gave himself out as Panhulovich from Podolia. How they cured him and treated him with great kindness, for which he swore gratitude to them till death. And what was he doing in Vlodava? He was going to Volinia. But in Parkeva his wounds opened, for the wagon turned over with him, and he had to stop, though in great fear, for they might easily cut him to pieces there. He told me this himself. I was, said he, sent with letters, but now I have no papers, nothing but a baton. And if they should discover who I am, not only the nobles would cut me to pieces, but the first commandant would hang me without asking permission of any man. I remember that when he told me that, I said to him, it is well to know that the first commandant would hang you. And how is that? asked he. So as to be cautious and say nothing to any man, in which I also will serve you. Then he began to thank me and to assure me of gratitude, and that reward would not miss me. Then he said, I have no money, but what jewels I have I will give you, and later I will cover you with gold, only render me one more service. And now we are coming to the princess? said Volodyovsky. Yes, my master, I must tell everything in detail. When he said that he had no money, I lost all heart for him, and thought to myself, wait. I'll render you a service. He said, I am sick, I have not strength for the journey, but a long and dangerous road awaits me. If I go to Volinia, and it is not far from here, then I shall be among my own. But to the Dniester I cannot go, for my strength is insufficient, and it is necessary to pass through an enemy's country, near castles and troops. Do you go for me? To what place? I ask. To Rashkov, for she is hidden there with a sister of Donietz, Horpina. I ask, is it the princess? Yes, says he, I hid her there where the eye of man cannot see her. 
It is pleasant for her there, and she sleeps like the Princess Vishnyavetska, on golden cushions. Tell me quickly, in God's name, shouted Zagloba. What is done quickly is done in the devil's fashion, answered Genzian. When I heard that, my master, how I rejoiced. But I did not show it, and I say, is she surely there, for it must be a long time since you took her to the place? He began to swear that Horpina was devoted to him, would keep her ten years till his return, and that the princess was there as God is in heaven. For neither Poles nor Tartars nor Cossacks could come, and Horpina would not disobey his order. While Jensian was telling the story, Zagloba trembled as in a fever, the little knight nodded his head joyfully, Podbipienta raised his eyes to heaven. That she is there is certain, continued the youth, for the best proof is that he sent me to her. But I put it off at first so as to betray nothing, and I ask, why should I go? Because I am not able to go. If, says he, I go from Vlodava to Volinia alive, I will have her taken to Kiev, for our Cossacks have the upper hand there everywhere. And you, says he, go to Horpina, and give her the order to take the princess to the monastery of the Holy Virgin in Kiev. Well, it was not to Nikolai the good then, burst out Zagloba. I saw at first that Yerlik was a hypochondriac, or that he lied. To the Holy Virgin, said Genzian. I'll give you my ring, says he, and batten and knife, and Horpina will know what they mean, for we have agreed about them. And God has sent you, says he, all the more because she knows you, knows that you are my best friend. Go at once. Don't fear the Cossacks, but look out for the Tartars, if there are any, and avoid them, for they will not respect the batten. Money, ducats, are buried in the ravine, take them out at once. Along the road you need only say, Bogan's wife is traveling, and you will want for nothing. Besides, says he, the witch is able to help herself. Only go, for my sake. Whom besides can I, unfortunate man, send, whom can I trust, in this strange country, among enemies? He begged, my master, till he almost shed tears. Finally the beast asked me to take an oath that I would go and I took the oath, but in my mind I added, with my master. Then he rejoiced, and gave me the batten, the ring, and the knife at once, and whatever jewels he had, and I took them too, for I thought, better that they be with me than with a robber. At parting he told me what ravine is above the Valadinka, how to go and how to turn so exactly, that I could get there with my eyes bound. Which you will see yourselves if you go with me, as I think you will. Immediately. Tomorrow, said Volodyovsky. What? Tomorrow? We will order the horses to be saddled at daylight today. Joy seized the hearts of all. At one moment could be heard cries of gratitude to heaven, at another the joyful rubbing of hands. Then new questions put to Genzian, to which he answered with his usual deliberation. May the bullet strike you, cried Zagloba what a servant Skshetuski has in you. Well, what of it? Asked Jensian. He will cover you with gold. I think too that I shall not be without a reward, though I serve my master out of faithfulness. What did you do with Bogan? asked Volodyovsky. This, my master, was for me the greatest torment, that he lay sick again, and I could not put a knife into him, for my master would blame me for that. Such was my luck. What had I to do? He had told me all he had to tell, had given me all he had to give, so to my head for wit. Why, say I to myself, should such a villain walk through the world? He imprisons a lady, and struck me in Chigirin. Better that he should not be, and let the hangman light his way. For, I thought to myself, if he gets well, he will be after us with his Cossacks. Not thinking long then, I went to Pan Rogovsky, the commandant, who was in Vlodava with his squadron, and I told him that it was Bogan, the worst of the rebels. They must have hanged him before this time. Having said this, Jensian laughed stupidly enough, and looked on the audience as if waiting for applause. But how astonished was he when answered by silence. After some time Zagloba muttered, No more of this. 
But on the contrary Volodyovsky kept silent, and Pan Longin began to click with his tongue, shake his head, and at last he said. You have acted ignobly, what is called ignobly. How so, my master, asked the astonished Jensian, should I have stabbed him? And that would have been ugly, and this ugly. I know not which is better, to be a murderer or a Judas. What do you say, my master? Is it to be a Judas to give up a rebel who is an enemy of the king and the whole commonwealth? True, but still the deed is ignoble. What did you say the name of that commandant is? Pan Rogovsky. They said his name was Jacob. Ah, that's the same man, muttered the Lithuanian. A relative of Pan Lash, and an enemy of Skshetuski. But this remark was not heard, for Zagloba began. Gentlemen, there is no reason for delay. God has so arranged through this youth, and has so directed, that we shall seek her under better conditions than hitherto. Praise be to God. We must leave in the morning. The prince has gone away already, but we must start without his permission, for there is no time to wait. Volodyovsky will go, I with him, and Jensian. But you, Pan Longin, would better stay, for your stature and your simplicity of soul might betray us. No, brother, I'll go too, said the Lithuanian. For her safety you must stay at home. Whoever has seen you will not forget you for a lifetime. We have the baton, it is true, but they would not believe you, even with the baton. You suffocated Pulian in sight of Krivonos's whole rabble. And since such a pillar has stood before them, they would recognize it. You cannot go with us. You wouldn't find three heads there, and the one you have wouldn't help us much. You would ruin the undertaking. Sad, said the Lithuanian. Sad or not sad, you must stay. When we go to lift birds' nests out of the trees we will take you, but not this time. Disgusting to hear you. Let me kiss you, for joy is in my heart. But stay. One thing more, gentlemen. This affair is of the greatest importance, a secret. Let it not be known among the soldiers, and go from them to the peasants. Not a word to any man. Not to the prince. The prince is not here. But to Skshetuski, if he comes? To him especially not a word, for he would race after us at once. He will have time enough to be glad, and God guard us from a new disappointment, then he would lose his mind. Word of honor, gentlemen. Word of honor, said Podbipienta. Word, word. And now let us thank God. Having said this, Zagloba knelt first, after him the others, and they prayed long and fervently. Chapter 55 The prince had really set out for Zamost a few days before for the purpose of making new levies of troops, and it was not expected that he would return soon. Volodyovsky, Zagloba, and Jensian therefore started on their journey unknown to anyone and in the greatest secrecy, to which only one person in Zbaraj was admitted, Pan Longin. But he, bound by his word, was as silent as if enchanted. Virchel and other officers who knew of the princess's death did not suppose that the departure of the little knight with Zagloba had any connection with the betrothed of the unfortunate Skshetuski, and thought most likely that the two friends had gone to him the more since they had taken Jensian, who was known to be a servant of Skshetuski. They travelled straight to Hlebanovka, and there made preparations for the journey. Zagloba bought first of all, with money borrowed from Pan Longin, five Podolian horses, capable of long journeys. Horses of this breed were used by the Polish cavalry and the Cossacks. They could chase a whole day after a Tartar pony, surpassed in speed even the Turkish horses, and endured better every change of weather and cold, and rainy nights. Five such coursers did Zagloba purchase, besides he got sufficient Cossack clothing for himself and his comrades, as well as for the princess. Jensian busied himself with the packs. And when all was provided and ready they started on the road, putting their undertaking under the guardianship of God and Saint Nikolai, the patron of young ladies. So disguised, it was easy to take them for Cossack adamans, and frequently it happened that soldiers from Polish garrisons fastened on them, 
and guards scattered as far as Kamenets. But Zagloba explained himself to them easily. They went for a long time through a safe country. For it was occupied by the squadrons of the commander Lanskaronsky, which approached slowly toward Bar, in order to keep an eye on the Cossack bands gathering there. It was known universally that nothing would come of the negotiations. War hung over the country, therefore, though the main forces had not moved yet. The Periaslav armistice ended at Whitsuntide. Partisan warfare, it is true, had not ended at any time. Now it increased, and both sides were only waiting the word. At that time spring was rejoicing over the steppe. The earth which had been trampled by the hoofs of horses was now covered with a brocade of grass and flowers which had grown up from the bodies of the slain. Above battlefields the lark pierced the azure of the heavens, various birds coursed through the air with their cries. The overflowed waters rippled in pools under the warm breath of the wind, and in the evenings the frogs swimming in the tepid water carried on joyous converse till late at night. It seemed that nature herself was eager to heal the wounds and cure the pains, to hide the graves beneath flowers. It was bright in the heavens, and on the earth fresh, breezy, gladsome. And the whole steppe, as if painted, glittered like an asphodel meadow, changed like the rainbow or like a Polish girdle on which the skilled needlewoman has joined all colors with exquisite taste. The steppe was full of the play of birds, and the broad breeze passed over it, drying the water and embrowning the faces of men. At such a time every heart rejoices, and is filled with measureless hope. Our nights therefore were full of just such hope. Volodyovsky sang continually. Zagloba straightened himself on the horse, put his shoulders with delight to the sun, and as soon as he was well warmed, said to the little knight. I feel well. For, to tell the truth, next to mead and Hungarian wine there is nothing like the sun for old bones. It is good for everything, answered Volodyovsky. Just see how animals love to warm themselves in the sun. It is lucky that we are going for the princess at such a time, for in the frosts of winter it would have been difficult to escape with the girl. Let us only get her into our hands, and I am a rascal if any man gets her away from us. I tell you, Pan Michael, I have only one fear, and that is in case of war the Tartars might move in those regions and snap us up, for we can get on with the Cossacks. We will give no account whatever to the peasants, for you have noticed that they take us for Starshini, the Zaporozhans respect the Batons, and the name of Bogan will be a shield to us. I am acquainted with the Tartars, for while in the Lubni domains life passed in endless disputes with them. Virchel and I never had rest, answered Pan Michael. And I know them, said Zagloba. I have told you how I passed several years in their company and might have risen to great dignities among them, but since I didn't wish to become a Mussulman I had to leave all. Besides, they wanted to inflict a martyr's death on me because I was persuading their principal mullah to the true faith. But you said some other time that that was in Galitz. Galitz in its own way, and the Crimea in its own. But if you think the world ends in Galitz, then surely you don't know where pepper grows. There are more sons of Belial than Christians in this world. Here Genzian broke into the conversation. Not only may we receive harm from Tartars, said he, but I have not informed you that Bogan told me that unclean powers are guarding that ravine. The giantess herself who guards the princess is a powerful witch, intimate with devils who may warn her against us. I have, it is true, a bullet, which I molded on consecrated wheat, for a common one would not take her, but besides there are probably whole regiments of vampires who guard the entrance. It is for your heads to see that no harm comes to me, if it should, my reward would be lost. Oh, you drone, said Zagloba. We have nothing to think of but your safety. The devil won't twist your neck, and even if he should it is all one, for you will go to hell anyhow for your covetousness. I'm too old a sparrow to be caught with chaff. And beat into yourself that if she is a powerful witch I am a more powerful wizard, for I learned the black art in Persia. She serves the devils, and they serve me, and I could plough with them as with oxen, but I don't want to do so, keeping in mind, as I do, the salvation of my own soul. 
that is well, my master. But for this time use your power, for it is always better to be on the safe side. But I have more confidence in our just cause and the protection of God, said Volodyovsky. Let the devils be the guard of Horpina and Bogan, but with us are the angels of heaven, whom the best brigade in hell cannot withstand. On our behalf I make an offering of seven white wax candles to St. Michael the Archangel. Then I will add one more, said Genzian, so that Pan Zagloba shouldn't frighten me with damnation. I will be the first to pack you off to hell, said the noble, if it should appear that you don't know the place as well. Why shouldn't I know? If we only reach Valadinka, I can find the place with my eyes bound. We will go along the shore toward the Dniester, and on the right hand will be the ravine, which we shall recognize by this, that the entrance to it is closed with a rock. At the first glance it will seem altogether impossible of entrance, but in the rock is an opening through which two horses can pass abreast. Once inside, no one can escape us, for that is the only entrance and exit. All around, the sides are so high that a bird can barely fly over them. The witch kills people who enter without permission, and there are many bones of men inside. Bogan gave orders not to notice these, but to ride on and shout, Bogan! Bogan! Then she will come out to us with friendship. Besides Horpina, there is Cherimus, who is a good marksman. We must kill them both. I say nothing about Cherimus, but it will be enough to tie the woman. How could you tie her? She is so strong that she tears armor to pieces like a shirt, and a horseshoe crumbles in her hand. Pan Podbipienta might possibly overpower her, but not we. But leave the matter, I have a consecrated bullet. Let the black hour come on that she-devil. Otherwise she would fly after us like a wolf, and would howl to the Cossacks, and we should fail to bring back not only the young lady, but our own heads. In such conversation and councils their time passed on the road. They travelled hurriedly, passing villages, hamlets, farms, and grave mounds. They went through Yarmolinsi to Bar, from where they were to advance in the direction of Yampol and the Dniester. They went through the neighbourhood in which Volodyovsky had defeated Bogan and freed Zagloba from his hands, they even came to the same farm and stopped there overnight. Sometimes they slept under the open sky in the steppes, and Zagloba enlivened these halting places by narratives of his previous adventures. Some of which had happened and some of which had never taken place. But the conversations were mostly about the princess and her coming liberation from captivity with the witch. Issuing at length from the regions held in curb by the garrisons and squadrons of Lanskaronsky, they entered the Cossack country, in which nothing remained of the Poles. For those who had not fled were exterminated by fire and sword. May had departed, followed by a sultry June, while they had barely finished a third of the journey, for the road was long and difficult. Happily no danger threatened them from the side of the Cossacks. They gave no account of themselves to the peasant parties, who usually took them for Zaporozhian Starshini. Still, they were asked from time to time who they were. Zagloba, if the inquirer was from the lower country, showed Bogan's baton. If a common murderer from the mob, then, without getting from the horse, he struck the man with his foot in the breast and knocked him to the ground. The bystanders, seeing this, opened a way for them, thinking that they were not only their own, but also very distinguished, since they struck people, perhaps Krivonos, Berlai, or Father Melnitsky himself. Zagloba complained greatly of the fame of Bogan, for the Zaporozhians annoyed him too much with inquiries about the chief, through which delays on the road were not infrequent. And generally there was no end to the questions, whether he was well, or alive, for the report of his death had spread as far as Yagerlik and the cataracts. But when the travellers declared that he was well and free, and that they were his messengers, they were kissed and honoured. All hearts were open to them, and even purses, of which the cunning servant of Skshetuski did not omit to take advantage. In Yampol they were received by Berlai who with Zaporozhian troops and the rabble was waiting for the Tartars of Budjak. This was an old and distinguished colonel. Years before he had taught Bogan his military craft. He went on expeditions over the Black Sea with him, 
and in one of these expeditions the two had plundered Sinope in company. He loved him therefore as a son, and received his messengers with gladness, not exhibiting the least distrust, especially since he had seen Genzian with Bogan the previous year. But when he learned that Bogan was alive and going to Valinia, from joy he gave a feast to the messengers and drank with them himself. Zagloba was afraid that Genzian, when he had drunk wine, might say something dangerous. But it turned out that the youth, cunning as a fox, knew how to manage, so that speaking the truth only when practicable, he did not imperil their affair, but won still greater confidence. It was strange, however, for our knights to hear those conversations carried on with such terrible sincerity in which their own names were repeated so often. We heard, said Burli, that Bogan was slain in a duel. And don't you know who cut him? Volodyovsky, an officer of Prince Yeremy, answered Genzian, calmly. If I could get my hands on Volodyovsky, I would pay him for our falcon. I'd pull him out of his skin. Volodyovsky at this moved his oat-colored mustaches, and looked at Burli with such a look as a hound gives a wolf which he is not permitted to seize by the throat. And Genzian said. That's why I give you his name, Colonel. The devil will have real fun with that fellow Genzian, thought Zagloba. But, continued Genzian, he is not so much to blame himself, for Bogan challenged him without knowing what a saber he was summoning. There was another noble there, the greatest enemy of Bogan, who had once snatched the princess from his hands. And who is he? Oh, he is an old sot who used to hang around our Adaman in Chidron and pretend to be his best friend. He'll hang yet, shouted Burli. I'm a fool if I don't cut the ears off that puppy. Muttered Zagloba. They so cut him up, continued Genzian, that another in his place would have been eaten by the crows long ago. But there is a horned soul in our Adaman, and he recovered, though he barely dragged himself to Vlodava, and there he would have failed surely but for us. We helped him off to Valinia, where our people have the upper hand, and he sent us here for the princess. These women will be the death of him, muttered Burli. I told him that long ago. Would it not have been better for him to take a girl in Cossack fashion, and then a stone around her neck and into the water, as we did in the Black Sea? Here Volodyovsky scarcely restrained himself, so wounded was he in his feeling for the sex, but Zagloba laughed, and said, surely it would have been better. But you were old friends, said Burli, you did not desert him in need. And you, boy, here he turned to Genzian, you are the best of them all, for I saw in Chidron how you nursed and cared for our falcon. I am your friend for that. Tell me what you want, men or horses. I'll give them to you, so that no harm may meet you on the return. We do not need men, said Zagloba, for we shall go through our own country and among our own people and God keep us from evil adventure. It is worse with a large party than with a small one. But some of the swiftest horses would be of service. I'll give you such that the ponies of the Khan would not overtake them. Genzian now spoke up, not to lose an opportunity, and give us a little money, Adaman, for we have none, and beyond Bratslav a measure of oats is a thaler. Then come with me to the storeroom, said Burli. Genzian didn't let this be said twice, and disappeared through the door with the old colonel. And when after a while he returned joy was beaming from his round face, and his blue coat was bulging out over his stomach. Well, go with God, said the old Cossack. And when you get the girl stop in to see me, so that I may look at Bogan's cuckoo. Impossible, colonel, said the youth, boldly. For that Pole is terribly afraid, and once stabbed herself with a knife. We are afraid that something evil may happen to her. Better let the Adaman manage her himself. He will manage her. She won't be afraid of him. The Pole is white-handed, doesn't like the Cossacks, muttered Burli. Go. God be with you. You haven't far now. From Yampol to Valadinka it was not so very far. But the road was difficult, or rather a continual absence of roads stretched before the nights, for at that time those regions were still a desert, with rarely a house or a dwelling. They went then from Yampol somewhat to the west, withdrawing from the Dniester, 
to go afterward with the course of the Valadinka toward Kashkov, for only thus could they strike the ravine. Light was growing in the heavens, for the feast at Burleis had lasted till late at night, and Zagloba calculated that they would not find the ravine before sundown. But that was exactly what he wanted, for he wished, after freeing Helena, to leave the night behind him. While they were traveling they spoke of how fortune had favored them so far in everything along the whole road. And Zagloba, mentioning the feast with Burlai, said. See how those Cossacks who live in brotherhood uphold one another in every trouble. I do not speak of the mob, whom they despise, and for whom, if the devil helps them to throw off our dominion, they will be still worse masters than the Poles. But in the brotherhood one is ready to jump into the fire for another, not like our nobles. Not at all, my master, said Genzian. I was among them a long time, and I saw how they tear one another like wolves. And if Melnitsky were gone, who sometimes by power, sometimes by policy, keeps them in check, they would devour one another. But this Burlai is a great warrior among them, and Melnitsky himself respects him. But you feel contempt for the man, of course, since he let you rob him. Oh, Genzian, you will not die your own death. What is written for each man, my master, that he'll have, but to deceive an enemy is praiseworthy, and pleasing to God. I do not blame you for that, but for greed, which is the feeling of a peasant, unworthy of a noble, for this you will be damned without fail. I will not spare money for candles in the church when I succeed in gaining anything, so that God too should have some profit from me and bless me, and it is no sin to help my parents. What a rascal, what a finished scoundrel, cried Zagloba to Volodyovsky. I thought my tricks would go with me to the grave, but I see that this is a still greater rogue. So through the cunning of this youth we shall free our princess from Bogan's captivity, with Bogan's permission, and on Burlai's horses. Has any man ever seen such a thing? And to look at him you wouldn't give three copper coins for the fellow. Gentian laughed with satisfaction, and said, Will that be bad for us, my master? You please me, and were it not for your greed I should take you into my service, but since you have tricked Bogan in such style, I forgive you for having called me a sot. It was not I who called you that, but Bogan. Well, God has punished him. In such conversation the morning passed. But when the sun had rolled up high on the vault of heaven they became serious, for in a few hours they were to see Valadinka. After a long journey they were near their object at last. And disquiet, natural in such cases, crept into their hearts. Was Helena still alive? And if alive, would they find her? Horpina might have taken her out, or might at the last moment have hidden her somewhere else among the secret places of the ravine, or have killed her. Obstacles were not all overcome yet, dangers were not all past. They had, it is true, all the tokens by which Horpina was to recognize them as Bogan's messengers, carrying out his will. But would the devils or the spirits forewarn her? Gentian feared this most, and even Zagloba, though pretending to be an expert in the black art, did not think of this without alarm. In such a case they would find the ravine empty or, what was worse, Cossacks from Rashkov ambushed in it. Their hearts beat more strongly. And when finally, after some hours yet of traveling, they saw from the lofty rim of the ravine the glittering ribbon of water, the plump face of Genzian paled a little. That is the Valadinka, said he, in a suppressed voice. Already, inquired Zagloba, in an equally low voice. Are we so near as that? May God guard us, replied Genzian. Oh, my master, begin your exorcisms, for I am awfully afraid. Exorcisms are folly. Let us bless the river and the secret places, that will help more. Volodyovsky was the calmest of all, but he kept silent, examining however his pistols carefully, and added new powder, then he felt to see if his saber would come out of the scabbard easily. I have a consecrated bullet too in this pistol here, said Genzian. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let us move on. Move on. Move on, said Volodyovsky. After a time they found themselves on the bank of the little river, 
and turned their horses in the direction of its course. Here Volodyovsky stopped them, and said. Let Jensian take the baton, for the witch knows him, and let him be the first to talk with her. So that she may not get frightened at us and run off with the princess into some hiding place. I will not go first, no matter what you do, said Jensian. Then go last, you drone. Having said this, Volodyovsky went first, after him Zagloba, and in the rear with the packhorses clattered Jensian, looking around with apprehension on every side. The hoofs of the horses rattled over the stones, around about reigned the dull silence of the desert. But grasshoppers and crickets hidden in the cliff chirped, for it was a sultry day, though the sun had passed the meridian considerably. Night had come at last to the eminence, rounded like an upturned shield, on which rocks fallen apart and burnt from the sun presented forms like ruins, tumble-down houses, and church steeples. You might have thought it a castle or a place stormed by an enemy. Jensian looked at Zagloba and said, This is the Devil's Mound, I know it from what Bogan told me. No living thing passes here by night. If it does not, it can, answered Zagloba. Tfo! What a cursed land! But at least we are on the right road. The place is not far, said Jensian. Praise be to God, answered Zagloba, and his mind was turned to the princess. He had wonderful thoughts and seeing those wild banks of the Valadinka, that desert and silent wilderness. He scarcely believed that the princess could be so near, she for whose sake he had passed through so many adventures and dangers. And loved so that when the news of her death came he knew not what to do with his life and his old age. But on the other hand a man becomes intimate, even with misfortune. Zagloba, who had grown familiar with the thought that she had been taken away and was far off in Bogan's power, did not dare to say now to himself, the end of grief and search has come. The hour of success and peace has arrived. Besides other thoughts crowded to his brain, what will she say when she sees him? Will she not dissolve into tears when like a thunderbolt comes to her that rescue, after such long and painful captivity? God has his wonderful ways, thought Zagloba and so succeeds in correcting everything that from this come the triumph of virtue and the shame of injustice. It was God who first gave Jensian into the hands of Bogan, and then made friends of them. God arranged that war, the stern mother, called away the wild Adaman from the fastnesses to which like a wolf he had carried his plunder. God afterward delivered him into the hands of Volodyovsky, and again brought him into contact with Jensian. All is so arranged that now, when Helena may have lost her last hope and when she expects aid from no side, aid is at hand. Oh, cease your weeping, my daughter. Soon will joy come to you without measure. Oh, she will be grateful, clasp her hands, and return thanks. Then she stood before the eyes of Zagloba as if living, and he was filled with emotion and lost altogether in thinking of what would happen in an hour. Jensian pulled him by the sleeve from behind. My master. Well, said Zagloba, displeased that the course of his thoughts was interrupted. Did you not see a wolf spring across before us? What of that? But was it only a wolf? Kiss him on the snout. At this moment Volodyovsky reined in his horse. Have we lost the road, he asked, for it should be here? No, we have not, answered Jensian. We are going as Bogan directed. I wish to God it were all over. It will not be long, if we ride well. I want to tell you another thing. When I am talking to the witch keep an eye on Cherimus. He must be a terribly nasty fellow, but shoots fearfully with his musket. Oh, cavalry, don't be afraid. They had barely gone some yards when the horses pricked up their ears and snorted. Jensian skin began to creep at once, for he expected that at any moment the howling of vampires might be heard from the cliffs in the rocks, or some unknown and repulsive form would creep out. But it appeared that the horses snorted only because they were passing near the retreat of that wolf who had so disturbed the youth a little while before. Roundabout was silence. Even the grasshoppers had ceased chirping, for the sun had already inclined to the other side of the sky. 
Jensian made the sign of the cross and calmed himself. Volodyovsky held in his horse suddenly. I see the ravine, said he, in the throat of which a rock is thrust, and in the rock there is a breach. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Muttered Jensian. After me, commanded Pan Michael, turning his horse. Soon they were at the breach, and passed through as under a stone arch. Before them opened a deep ravine, thickly overgrown with bushes at the sides, widening in the distance to a broad half-circle, a small plain, enclosed as it were by gigantic walls. Jensian began to shout as loud as the power in his breast permitted, Bogan! Bogan! Witch, come out! Bogan! Bogan! They halted and remained for some time in silence. Then the youth began to shout again, Bogan! Bogan! From a distance came the barking of dogs. Bogan! Bogan! On the left rim of the ravine on which the ruddy and golden rays of the sun were falling the thick branches of the plum and wild cherry trees began to rustle. And after a while there appeared, almost at the very source of the spring, a human form, which bending forward and covering its eyes with its hand looked carefully at the travelers. That's Horpina, said Jensian, and putting his palms around his mouth, he began to shout a third time, Bogan! Bogan! Horpina began to descend, bending back to keep her balance. She came on quickly, and after her rolled along a sort of dumpy little man with a long Turkish gun in his hand. Twigs broke under the weighty step of the witch. Stones rolled from under them and rattled to the bottom of the ravine. Bent in that fashion, in the ruddy glare she seemed really some gigantic superhuman creature. Who are you? called she in a loud voice, when she had reached the bottom. How are you, base vile, said Jensian, to whom his usual deliberation returned at the sight of human beings instead of spirits. You are Bogan's servant? I know you, you fellow, but who are these? Friends of Bogan. Ah, she is a handsome witch, muttered Pan Michael, under his mustaches. And what have you come for? Here is the baton, the knife, and the ring for you, you know what they mean. The giantess took them in her hands and began to examine them carefully, then she said. They are the same. You have come for the princess? Yes. Is she well? She is. Why didn't Bogan himself come? Bogan is wounded. Wounded? I saw that in the mill. If you saw it, why do you ask? You lie, you buglehorn, said Jensian, confidently. The witch showed in a smile teeth white as the teeth of a wolf, and doubling her hand nudged Jensian in the side, You are a boy, you are a fellow, you are. Be off. You won't give a kiss, will you? And when will you take the princess? Right away, we will only rest the horses. Well, take her. I will go with you. What do you want to go for? Death is fated for my brother the poles will impale him on a stake. I will go with you. Jensian bent toward the saddle as if for easier conversation with the giantess, and his hand rested unobserved on the butt of a pistol. Cherimus! Cherimus! said he, wishing to turn the attention of his comrades on the dwarf. Why do you call him? His tongue is cut out. I am not calling him, I'm only admiring his beauty. You will not leave him, he is your husband. He is my dog. And there are only two of you in the ravine? Two, the princess is the third. That's well. You will not leave him? I will go with you, said she. But I tell you that you will remain. There was something in the voice of the youth of such a character that the giantess turned on the spot with an alarmed face, for suspicion suddenly entered her mind. What do you mean? asked she. This is what I mean, answered Jensian, and he thundered at her from the pistol so near that the smoke covered her completely for a moment. Horpina pushed back with open arms. Her eyes protruded, a kind of unearthly yell rose out of her throat, she tottered and fell on her back, full length. 
At the same moment Zagloba cut Cherimus through the head with a saber so that the bone gritted under its edge. The deformed dwarf uttered no groan. He merely wound himself in a lump like a worm, and began to quiver. But the fingers of his hand opened and closed in succession like the claws of a dying wildcat. Zagloba wiped the steaming saber with the skirt of his coat. Gensian, springing from the horse and taking up a stone, threw it on the broad breast of Horpina. Then he began to look for something in his bosom. The enormous body of the witch dug the ground yet with its feet, convulsions twisted her face terribly, on her grinning teeth came out a bloody foam, and dull rattles issued from her throat. Meanwhile the youth got from his bosom a piece of consecrated chalk, drew a cross with it on the stone, and said, Now she will not rise. Then he sprang into the saddle. To horse! commanded Volodyovsky. They rushed like a whirlwind along the brook running through the middle of the ravine. They passed the oaks scattered thinly along the road, and a cottage appeared before their eyes. Farther on was the lofty mill, the moist wheel of which glittered like a ruddy star in the rays of the sun. Under the cottage two enormous black dogs, tied with ropes at the corner, sprang at the men, barking with rage and howling. Volodyovsky, riding in advance, arrived first, sprang from his horse, ran to the entrance, kicked in the door, and rushed to the anteroom with clattering saber. In the anteroom on the right through an open door was seen a wide room, with shaving scattered about and a smoking fireplace, on the left the door was closed. She must be there. Thought Volodyovsky, and he sprang toward the door. He pushed, it opened. He stepped on the threshold and stood there as if fastened. In the depth of the room, with head resting on the edge of a couch, was Helena Kurtsevichovna, pale, with hair falling on her neck and shoulders. With frightened eyes fixed on Volodyovsky, she asked, Who are you? What do you want? For she had never seen the little knight before. He was astonished at the sight of that beauty and that room covered with silk and brocade. At last he came to his speech, and said hurriedly, Have no fear, we are the friends of Skshetuski. That moment the princess threw herself on her knees, Save me, she cried, clasping her hands. Just then Zagloba, trembling, purple, and out of breath, rushed in. It is we! cried he, it is we with succor. Hearing these words and seeing the familiar face, the princess bent over like a cut flower, her hands dropped, her eyes were covered with their bordered curtains. She had fainted. Chapter 56 the horses were given barely time to rest, and the return was begun with such speed that when the moon had risen on the steppe the party was already in the neighborhood of Stadenka. Beyond the Valadinka. Volodyovsky rode in front, looking carefully on every side. Next came Zagloba at the side of Helena. And Gensian closed the procession, driving the pack animals and two saddle horses, which he had not failed to take from Horpina's stable. Zagloba's mouth was not closed. And in truth he had something to tell the princess, who shut up in the wild ravine knew nothing of what was passing in the world. He told her how they had looked for her at first. How Skshetuski, without knowing of the duel, had sought Bogan as far as Periaslav, how finally Gensian gained the secret of her concealment from the Ataman and brought it to Zberich. Merciful God, said Helena, raising her beautiful pale face to the moon, then Pan Skshetuski went beyond the Dnieper for me? To Periaslav, as I tell you. And surely he would have come with us now, but we had no time to send for him as we wished to hurry to your aid at once. He knows nothing as yet of your safety, and offers prayers for your soul every day, but have no sorrow for him now. Let him suffer a while longer since such a reward is awaiting him. And I thought that all had forgotten me, and I was only imploring the Lord for death. Not only did we not forget you, but all the time our single thought was how to come to your aid. Wonders we planned. I was drying my brain, and so was Skshetuski, but that was to be expected. This knight too who is riding in front of us spared neither toil nor sword. May God reward him. It is clear that you both have that which makes people cleave to you, but in truth you owe Volodyovsky gratitude, for as I said we cut up Bogan like a pike. 
In Rosloji, Pan Skshatuski spoke much of Volodyovsky as of his best friend. And justly. He has a great soul in a little body. This moment he is somehow dull. It is evident that your beauty has stunned him, but wait, let him only grow used to it and he will come to himself. Oh! He and I worked wonders at the election. Then there is a new king? Poor girl! In this cursed wilderness you don't know that Yen Kazimir was elected last autumn and has been reigning eight months. There will be a great war this time with the rabble. God grant us good fortune, for Yeremy has been set aside and others appointed who are altogether unfitted. And will Pan Skshatuski go to the war? He is a true soldier, and I don't think you can stop him. He and I are alike. When powder entices, nothing can restrain us. Oh, we gave it to the ruffians in grand fashion last year. The whole night would be short were I to tell you all as it happened. We shall be sure to go, but with a light heart now. The main thing is that we have found you, poor girl, without whom life was a burden to us. The princess inclined her sweet face to Zagloba. I know not why you love me, but it is sure that you do not love me more than I do you. Zagloba began to puff with satisfaction. Then you love me? As I live, I do. God reward you, for my old age will be lighter. Women pursue me yet, as was the case in Warsaw more than once during the election. Volodyovsky is witness of that. But I don't care for love, and in spite of my hot blood, I am content with the feeling of a father. Silence followed but the horses began to snort violently, one after another, a favorable omen. Good health, good health, said the travelers. The night was clear, the moon rose higher and higher in the sky, which was filled with twinkling stars, that became weaker and paler. The tired horses lessened their speed, and weariness seized the travelers. Volodyovsky reined in his horse first. The dawn is not distant, said he, it is time to rest. It is, said Zagloba. I am so sleepy that my horse seems to have two heads. But before resting, Jensian prepared supper. He made a fire, removed the saddlebags from a horse, and took out provisions which he had obtained from Burlai in Yampol, such as corn bread, cold meat and Wallachian wine. At the sight of these two leather bags, well filled out with liquid which gave forth a pleasant sound, Zagloba forgot his sleep, the others also fell to eating and drinking with a good will. There was abundance for all, and when they were satisfied, Zagloba wiped his mouth and said, Till death I shall not cease to repeat, wondrous are the judgments of God. Now, my young lady, you are free, and here we sit comforted under the sky, drinking Burlai's wine. I will not say that Hungarian would not be better, for this smells of the skin, but on the road it will pass. There is one thing at which I cannot wonder sufficiently, said Helena, that Horpina consented so easily to give me up to you. Zagloba looked at Volodyovsky, then at Jensian, and blinked rapidly. She consented, for she had to. There is nothing to hide, for it is no shame that we rubbed out both Cherimus and the witch. How? asked the princess, with fright. Didn't you hear the shots? I heard them, but thought Cherimus was firing. It was not Cherimus, but this young fellow here, who shot the witch through and through. The devil sits in him, we don't dispute that. But he could not act otherwise. For the witch, whether it was because she knew something, or was stubborn, insisted on going with us. It was difficult to permit that, for she would have seen at once that we were not going to Kiev. He shot her, and I killed Cherimus, a real African monster, and I think that God will not count it ill of me. There must be a universal disgust of him in even the regions below. Just before leaving the ravine I went ahead and pulled the bodies aside a little, so that you might not be frightened at them or take it as a bad omen. In these terrible times I have seen too many dead persons who were kindred of mine to be frightened at the sight of slain bodies, said the princess. Still I should prefer not to have blood shed, so that God might not punish us for it. It was not a knightly deed, said Volodyovsky, harshly. I would not put my hand to it. 
What is the use of thinking over it, said Genzian, when it could not be avoided? If we had destroyed some good person I should not speak, but an enemy of God may be killed. And I myself saw how that which entered into fellowship with devils. It is not for her that I am sorry. And why is Pan Genzian sorry, asked the princess. Because money is buried there, of which Bogan told me, but you gentlemen were so urgent that I had no time to dig it up, though I know well where it is, near the mill. My heart was cut also at having to leave so much property of every kind in that room where you, my lady, lived. Just see what a servant you are going to have, said Zagloba to the princess. With the exception of his master, there is no one, not the devil himself, from whom he would not strip skin to make a coat collar for himself. With God's help, Gentian will not complain of my ingratitude, answered Helena. I thank you humbly, said he, kissing her hand. During this time Volodyovsky sat with a sullen look, drinking wine quietly from the skin, till his unusual silence attracted Zagloba's attention. Ah, Pan Michael, said he, you have given us scarcely a word. Here the old man turned to Helena. I have not told you that your beauty has deprived him of reason and speech. You would better take a nap before daylight, was the little knight's reply, and he began to move his mustaches like a rabbit trying to gain courage. But the old noble was right. The beauty of the princess had kept the little knight in a sort of continual ecstasy. He looked at her, looked again, and in his mind he asked, Can it be that such a woman moves upon the earth? He had seen much beauty in his day. Beautiful were the princesses Anna and Barbara's Baraska, and Anusia Borzobogata, charming beyond expression. Panna Jukovna, to whom Rozvarovsky was paying court, had many a charm, and so had Vershalovna and Skoropadska and Bohovitnyanka. But none of these could compare with that marvelous flower of the steppe. In presence of the others Volodyovsky was vivacious, full of speech. But now, when he looked on those velvet eyes, sweet and languishing, on the silken lashes, the shade of which fell on the pupils, on the arrowy form, on the bosom lightly moved by the breath. On the bloom of the lips, when Volodyovsky looked at all this, he simply forgot the tongue in his mouth. And what was worse, he seemed awkward, stupid, and above all diminutive, so small as to be ridiculous. She is a princess, and I am a little boy, thought he, in bitterness. And he would have rejoiced could some giant have issued from the darkness by chance, for then poor Pan Michael would have shown that he was not so small as he seemed. He was irritated also because Zagloba, evidently glad that his daughter was so attractive, coughed every little while, quizzed, and winked fearfully. And each instant she was more beautiful, as calm and sweet she sat before the fire, shone on by the rosy flame and the white moon. Confess, Pan Michael, said Zagloba, early next day, when they found themselves alone for a moment, that there is not such another girl in the commonwealth. If you show me another such, I will let you call me idiot and give me a drubbing. I do not deny, said the little knight, that she is dainty and rare, such as I have not seen till this hour. For even those forms of goddesses cut from marble which seem alive, and which we saw in the Kazanovsky palace, are not to be compared with her. I do not wonder that the best men are risking their lives for her, for she is worth it. Well, well, said Zagloba, as God lives, you cannot tell when she is better, morning or evening, for she always moves in beauty, like a rose. I have told you that I was once of extraordinary beauty myself, but I should have been forced to yield to her, though some say she resembles me as one cup does another. Go to the devil! cried the little knight. Don't be angry, Pan Michael, for you are bad enough to the eye already. You gaze on her as a goat on a head of cabbage. One might swear that longing has seized you. But the sausage is not for the dog. Tfu, cried Volodyovsky. Are you not ashamed, being an old man, to talk such nonsense? And why are you frowning? Because you think we have passed all danger, like a bird in the air, and are entirely safe, but now careful deliberation is needed, so that when we have escaped one evil we may avoid another. There is a terrible road before us yet, and God knows what may happen, 
for these regions to which we are going must be already on fire. When I stole her from Bogan out of Razloji it was worse, for there was pursuit in the rear and rebellion in front, still I passed through the whole Ukraine as through a flame, and went to Bar. And why is the head on my shoulders? At the worst, it is not far to Kamenets. True, but it is not far for the Turks and Tartars, either. Oh, what stuff do you tell me? I tell you the truth, and say that it is worth thinking over. It is better to avoid Kamenets and move on towards Bar, for the Cossacks will respect the Baton. With the rabble we can get on. But if the Tartars see us, all is lost. I know them of old, and I could flee before a Tartar party with the birds and the wolves, but if we were to meet them I could be of no service. Then let us go through Bar or around Bar, let the plague take the limes and cherries of Kamenets. You don't know that Genzian took a baton from Burlai. We can go everywhere among the Cossacks singing. We have passed the worst of the wilderness, we shall enter a settled country. We must think of stopping here and there at a farm about the time of evening milking, for such a place is more proper and comfortable for the princess. But it seems to me, Pan Michael, that you look at things in too somber a light. Just think that three men like us, without flattery to you or me, should not be able to make our way in the steppe. We'll join our stratagems to your saber, and now for it. Nothing better can be done. Gentian has Burlai's baton. And that is the main thing, for Burlai commands all Podolia at present, and if we are once beyond Bar, Lanskaronsky is there, with the squadrons of the crown. On, Pan Michael, let us lose no time. And in fact they lost no time, but tore on through the steppes toward the north and the west as fast as their horses could go. On the heights of Mogilev they entered a more settled land, so that in the evening it was not difficult anywhere to find farms or villages in which to spend the night. But the ruddy dawn always found them on horseback and on the road. Fortunately the summer was dry, warm days, with dewy nights, and in the early morning the whole steppe was silvered as with frost. The wind dried the waters, the rivers decreased, and they crossed without difficulty. Going for some time along and above Lozova, they stopped for a somewhat longer rest than usual in Shargorod, where there was a Cossack regiment not belonging to Burlai's command. There they found messengers from Burlai, and among them Kuna, a Sotnik, captain, whom they had seen in Yampol at the feast with Burlai. He was somewhat surprised that they were not going through Bratslav, Regorod, and Skvira to Kiev. But no suspicion remained in his mind, especially when Zagloba explained to him that they had not taken that road from fear of the Tartars, who were about to march from the direction of the Dnieper. Kuna told them then that Burlai had sent him to proclaim the campaign, and that he himself was ready to come at any moment, with all the forces at Yampol and the Budjak Tartars to Shargorod. Whence they would advance immediately. Couriers had come from Melnitsky to Burlai with news that war had begun, and with orders to lead all the regiments to Volinia. Burlai had long wished to move on Bar, and was merely awaiting the Tartar reinforcements, for somehow it had begun to go badly at Bar for the rebellion. Lanskaronsky, the Polish commander, had cut up considerable bands there, captured the place, and put a garrison in the castle. Several thousand Cossacks had been killed. Burlai wished to avenge these and recapture the castle. But Kuna said that the final orders of Melnitsky to march on Volinia prevented these plans, and Bar would not be besieged unless the Tartars should insist on it. Well, Pan Michael, said Zagloba the next day, Bar is before us and we might hide the princess there a second time. But the devil take it, I have no more trust in Bar, or any other fortress, since these ruffians have more cannon than the armies of the crown. This, however, troubles me somewhat that clouds are gathering around. Not only are clouds gathering, answered the knight, but a storm is rolling up behind, namely the Tartars. And if Burlai should come up with us he would be greatly astonished that we are not going to Kiev, but in the opposite direction. He would be ready to show us another road. May the devil show him first the straightest road to his own kingdom. Let us make an agreement, Pan Michael. I will explain everything to the Cossacks but let your wit work against the Tartars. 
It is easier for you to manage the ruffians who take us for their own, answered Volodyovsky. Against the Tartars there is but one help, to flee with all swiftness, to slip out of the snare while there is time. We must buy good horses on the road wherever we can, so as to have fresh ones at any moment. Pan Longin's purse will suffice for that, and if it does not we will take Burlai's money from Genzian. But now forward. And they pushed on still more hurriedly, till foam covered the sides of the ponies and fell like snowflakes on the green steppe. After they had passed Derla and Ladeva, Volodyovsky bought new horses in Barak, without leaving the old ones. For those which they had as a gift from Burlai were of rare breed, and they kept them attached by the bridle, and drove on, making shorter stops and night rests. Everyone was in good health, and Helena in excellent spirits. Though wearied with the road, she felt that every day gave her new strength. In the ravine she had passed a secluded life and scarcely left her gilded room, not wishing to meet the shameless Horpina and listen to her talk and persuasion. Now the fresh breeze of the steppe brought back her health. The roses bloomed on her face, the sun darkened her complexion, but her eyes gained brightness. And when at times the wind blew the hair over her forehead, you would have said she was some gypsy, the most wonderful soothsayer. Or that a gypsy queen was traveling in the wide steppe, flowers springing up before her, knights following behind. Volodyovsky grew accustomed to her beauty by degrees, as the journey brought them together, so that finally he became used to her. Then he regained his speech and cheerfulness, and often while riding at her side told of Lubni, and especially of his friendship for Pan Yen, thinking she heard this with gladness. At times he even teased her, saying, I am Bogan's friend and am taking you to him. Then she would fold her hands as if in great dread, and say in a sweet voice, Oh, cruel knight, better kill me at once than do that. Impossible, I must take you, answered the stern knight. Strike, said she, closing her eyes and stretching her neck to him. Then the ants began to travel along the back of the little knight. That girl goes to the head like wine, thought he. But I cannot drink this wine, for it is another's. The honest Pan Michael then shook himself and urged his horse forward. When he plunged into the grass like a sea mew into water, the ants fell from him, he turned all his attention to the journey. Was it safe, were they going well, or was any adventure approaching them from any side? He straightened himself in the stirrups, raised his yellow mustaches over the waving grass, looked, sniffed. Listened like a tartar when he is prowling in the wild fields through the grass of the steppe. Zagloba too was in the best of spirits. It is easier for us to escape now, said he, than when on the Kagamlik we had to sneak off on foot like dogs, with our tongues hanging out. My tongue at that time was so dried up in my mouth that I could have planed a tree with it, but now, thanks be to God, I have something to sleep on in the evening. And something to wet my throat with from time to time. Do you remember how you carried me over the water? God grant us to wait. You'll have something to carry in your arms, I'll bet Skshatuski's head on that. Ho! Ho! laughed Genzian. Desist, I beg you, whispered the princess, blushing and dropping her eyes. Thus they conversed over the steppe, to shorten the time. Finally, beyond Barak and Yeltishkov they entered a country recently gnawed by the teeth of war. Their bands of armed ruffians raged. There also, not long before, Lanskaronsky burned and slew, for it was only a few days since he had withdrawn to Zbaraj. Our travelers learned also from the people of the town that Melnitsky and the Khan had set out with all their forces against the Poles. Or rather against the commanders whose forces were in mutiny and refused to serve except under the command of Prince Yeremy. In this connection it was generally prophesied that destruction or the end of either the Poles or the Cossacks would surely come, for Father Melnitsky and Yeremy were to meet. The whole country was as if on fire. All were rushing to arms and marching to the north to join Melnitsky. From the lower Dniester, Burlai was advancing with his entire force. And along the road every regiment was in motion from garrisons, quarters, and pastures, for the order had come to all. They marched then in hundreds, in squadrons, in thousands. 
and at their flank rolled on like a river the mob, armed with flails, forks, knives, and pikes. Horse boys and herdsmen left their herds, settlers their lands, beekeepers their bees, wild fishermen their reeds by the Dnieper, hunters the woods. Hamlets, villages, and towns were deserted. In three provinces there remained at home but old women and children, for even the young women had gone with the men against the Poles. Simultaneously from the east approached with his entire main army Melnitsky, like an ominous storm, crushing by the way with his mighty hand castles, great and small, and killing all who were left from the previous defeats. Having passed Bar, full of gloomy reminiscences for the princess, our travelers took the high road leading through Latici and Plaskiri to Tarnopol, and farther to Lvov. Now, they met more frequently, at one time regular tabers of wagons, at another detachments of Cossack infantry and cavalry, now parties of peasants. Now countless herds of cattle surrounded with clouds of dust, and driven on as food for the Cossack and the Tartar armies. The road became dangerous, for they were asked continually what they wanted, whence they came, and where they were going. Zagloba showed the Cossack companies Burlai's baton, and said. We are sent from Burlai, we are taking Bogan's wife. At sight of the baton of the terrible colonel, the Cossacks generally opened the way the more readily. Since everyone understood that if Bogan was alive he must be near the forces of the commanders in the neighborhood of Zberaj or Konstantinov. But it was far more difficult for the travelers to pass the mob with its wild parties of herdsmen, ignorant, drunk, and having almost no idea of the ensigns given by colonels for a safe conduct. Had it not been for Helena, these half-savage people would have taken Zagloba, Volodyovsky, and Jensian for their own, in fact they did so even as it was. But Helena attracted universal attention by her sex and unusual beauty, hence the dangers had to be overcome with the greatest care. At one time Zagloba showed the baton, at another Volodyovsky his teeth, and more than one corpse fell behind them. A number of times the unapproachable steeds of Burlai alone saved them from too grievous adventure, and the journey so favorable at the beginning grew more difficult each day. Helena, although brave by nature, began to fail in health from continual alarm and sleeplessness, and looked in truth like a captive dragged against her will into the tent of an enemy. Zagloba exerted himself savagely, and was continually inventing new stratagems which the little knight put into practice at once, both of them consoled the princess as best they could. We have only to pass the swarm which is now in front, said Volodyovsky, and reach Zberaj, before Melnitsky with the Tartars fills the region about. They learned on the road that the commanders had concentrated at Zberaj, and intended to defend themselves there. They went to that place, expecting justly that Prince Yeremy would come to the commanders with his division, since a part of his forces, and that a considerable one, had its permanent post at Zberaj. The swarms grew thinner on the road, for the country occupied by the squadrons of the crown began only fifty miles beyond. The Cossack parties did not dare therefore to push on farther. They preferred to wait, at a safe distance, the arrival of Burlai from one and Melnitsky from the other side. Only fifty miles now. Only fifty miles, repeated Zagloba, rubbing his hands. If we could but reach the first Polish squadrons, we might go to Zberaj in safety. But Volodyovsky determined to supply himself with fresh horses at Plaskiri, for those which he had bought at Barak were already useless. And it was necessary to spare Burlai's steeds for a black hour. This precaution became imperative, since news came that Melnitsky was already at Konstantinov, and the Khan with all his hordes was moving from Palavtsi. Jensian and I will remain here with the princess near the town, for it is better not to show ourselves on the marketplace, said the little knight to Zagloba. When they came to a deserted house about two furlongs from the town, and you go and inquire if there are horses for sale or exchange. It is evening now, but we will travel all night. I'll return soon, said Zagloba. He went to the town. Volodyovsky told Jensian to let out the saddle girths a little, so that the horses might rest. Then he conducted Helena into the house, begging her to strengthen herself with some wine and with sleep. I should like to pass those fifty miles before daybreak tomorrow, said he. 
then we shall all rest. But he had scarcely brought the wineskin and food when there was a clatter in front of the house. The little knight looked out through the window. Zagloba has already returned, said he, it is evident that he has found no horses. The door opened that moment, and Zagloba appeared in it, pale, blue, sweating, puffing. To horse, he cried. Volodyovsky was too experienced a soldier to lose time on inquiries. He didn't lose it even in saving the skin of wine, which Zagloba carried off nevertheless, but he seized the princess with all haste, took her out, put her on the saddle. Gave a last look to see if the girths were drawn, and cried, forward. The hoofs clattered, and soon horses and riders had vanished in the darkness like a party in a dream. They flew on a long time without rest, till at last nearly five miles of road separated them from Pluskiri. Before the rising of the moon darkness became so dense that every pursuit was impossible. Volodyovsky drew near Zagloba, and asked. What was the matter? Wait, Pan Michael, wait. I am terribly blown. I came near losing the use of my legs. U.F. But what was the matter? The devil in his own person, the devil or a dragon. If you cut one head off him, another will grow. But speak plainly. I saw Bogan on the market square. Are you mad? I saw him on the square, as I live, and with him five or six men, for I nearly lost the use of my legs. They held torches for him, and I thought, some devil is standing in our road. I lost all hope of a successful end to our undertaking. Can this imp of hell be immortal, or what? Don't speak of him to Helena. Oh, for God's sake, you slew him, Gentian gave him up. That wasn't enough, he is alive now, free, and stands in the way. Oh, my God, my God! I tell you, Pan Michael, that I would rather see a ghost in a graveyard than him. And what devilish luck that I am the first to meet him everywhere! It's luck to cram down a dog's throat. Are there no other people in the world? Let others meet him. No! Always I, and I. But did he see you? If he had seen me, Pan Michael, you wouldn't be looking at me now. That alone was wanting. It would be important to know whether he is chasing after us, or is going to Valadinka to Horpina with the intention of seizing us on the road. It seems to me that he is going to Valadinka. It must be so. Then we shall go on in one direction and he in the opposite, now there are five miles and more between us, and soon there will be twenty-five. Before he hears about us on the road, and returns, we shall be not only in Zberage, but in Jokvi. Your speech, Pan Michael, thank God, is like a plaster to me. But tell me how it can be that he is free, when Genzian gave him into the hands of the commandant of Vlodava? Oh, he simply ran away. The head of a commandant like that should be struck off. Genzian. Genzian. What do you wish, my master? asked the youth, reining in his horse. To whom did you deliver Bogan? To Pan Rogovsky. And who is this Pan Rogovsky? He is a great knight, a colonel of an armored regiment of the king. There it is for you, said Volodyovsky, snapping his fingers. Don't you remember what Pan Longin told about Skshetuski's enmity with Rogovsky? He is a relative of Pan Lash, on account of whose disgrace he has a hatred for Skshetuski. I understand, I understand, shouted Zagloba. He is the one who must have let Bogan out through spite. But that is a capital offense, and smells of death. I'll be the first to report it. If God lets me meet him, muttered Volodyovsky, we shall be sure not to go to a tribunal. Gentian did not know yet what the trouble was, for after his answer he pushed forward again to the princess. They were riding slowly. The moon had risen. The mists, which since evening had settled upon the land, fell away, and the night became clear. Volodyovsky was sunk in meditation. Zagloba was digesting for some time yet the remnants of his astonishment, at last he said. Bogan would have given it to Gentian now if he had caught him. Tell him the news. 
Let him be afraid too, and I'll go immediately to the princess, answered the little knight. Here, Genzian. Well, what is it? asked the youth, reining in his horse again. Zagloba came up with him. He was silent for a while, waiting for Volodyovsky and the princess to ride far enough away. At last he asked, Do you know what has happened? No. Pan Rogovsky set Bogan at liberty. I saw him in Pluskiri. In Pluskiri? Today? asked Genzian. Yes. Why don't you drop from the saddle? The rays of the moon fell straight on the round face of the youth, and Zagloba saw on it not terror, but, to his utmost astonishment, that expression of stern, almost brutal stubbornness which Genzian had when he killed Horpina. Well, are you not afraid of Bogan? My master, answered the youth, if Pan Rogovsky has let him go, then I must seek revenge on him again myself for the wrong done me and the insult. I do not forgive him, for I took an oath, and if we were not conducting the lady, I should turn back on the road at once. Let what belongs to me be mine. I am glad not to have offended this young fellow. They spurred their horses, and soon came up with the princess and Volodyovsky. In an hour they turned through the Medvedovka and entered a forest extending from the very bank of the river in two black walls along the road. I know the neighborhood well, said Zagloba. There will soon be an end to this forest, after it is about a mile and a quarter of level land, and then another forest still larger extending to Matchin. God grant us to find Polish squadrons there. It is high time that rescue came, muttered Volodyovsky. They rode a while in silence over a road clearly lighted by the rays of the moon. Two wolves have run across, said Helena, suddenly. Yes, said Volodyovsky, and here is a third. The gray shadow shot across a little more than a hundred rods in front of the horses. There is a fourth, said the princess. No, that is a deer. Look, two, three. What the devil, cried Zagloba. Deer chasing wolves. The world, I see, is overturned. Let us go a little faster, cried Volodyovsky, with a voice of alarm. Genzian, come this way and go ahead with the lady. They shot on. But Zagloba bent forward as they rode to Volodyovsky's ear, and inquired, Pan Michael, what tidings? Evil, answered the little knight. You have seen wild beasts rushing from their lairs and escaping in the night. But what does that mean? It means that they are frightened. Who frightens them? Troops, Cossack or Tartar, are coming toward us from the right hand. But it may be our squadrons? Impossible, for the beasts are fleeing from the east, from Palavtsi. Doubtless, then, the Tartars are marching in a wide body. Let us flee, Pan Michael in God's name. There is no help. Oh, if the princess were not here, we could go quite near them. But with her the passage will be very difficult if they set eyes on us. Have the fear of God, Pan Michael. Shall we turn to the woods and run after the wolves, or what? Impossible. For though the enemy would not reach us at once, they would deluge the country in front of us, and then how should we escape? May brimstone thunderbolts shake them. This alone was wanting to us. Oh, Pan Michael, are you not mistaken? You know wolves follow an army, they do not run before it. Those at the flanks follow the army and gather in from every side, but those in front get frightened. Look! On the right, between the trees, there is a fire. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Silence! Is there much more of this forest? We shall be at the end in a moment. And then a field? Yes, O oh Jesus! No noise! Beyond the field there is another forest. Extending to Matchin. We shall be all right if they don't overtake us in this field. If we reach the second forest in safety, we are at home. Let us go together then. Luckily the princess and Genzian are on Burlai's horses. They put spurs to the horses, and joined the princess and Genzian. What fire is that on the right? 
asked the princess. There is no use in hiding it from you, that may be Tartars. Jesus, Mary! Have no fear. My neck for it, we shall escape them, and our squadrons are in Machin. For God's sake, let us be off, said Genzian. They were silent, and sped on like ghosts. The trees began to grow thinner. They were reaching the end of the forest, and the fire was somewhat dimmer too. Suddenly Helena turned to Volodyovsky. Swear to me, gentlemen, said she, that I shall not go alive into their hands. You will not, said Volodyovsky, while I am alive. They had barely passed the end and come into an open field about a mile in width, and on the other side of it another line of forest stood dark. That bald space of earth open on every side was all silvered over from the rays of the moon. All things were as visible on it as in the daytime. This is the worst piece of road, whispered Volodyovsky to Zagloba, for if they are in Corny Ostrov, they will pass between these forests. Zagloba gave no answer. He only pressed the horse with his heels. They had run to the middle of the field, the opposite forest was growing nearer each moment and more distinct, when suddenly the little knight stretched out his hand to the east. Look! said he to Zagloba, do you see? Some kind of branches and thicket in the distance. Those branches are moving. Now on, on, push on. For they see us beyond a doubt. The wind whistled past the ears of the fleeing, the forest of salvation drew nearer each instant. All at once out of that dark mass approaching from the right side of the field flew on as it were the roar of sea waves, and the next moment one great shout rent the air. They see us! bellowed Zagloba. Dogs, ruffians, devils, wolves, scoundrels. The forest was so near that the fugitives almost felt its cold, austere breath. But also the cloud of Tartars became each moment more clearly outlined, and from the dark body of it long arms began to push out like the horns of some gigantic monster and approached the fugitives with inconceivable rapidity. The trained ear of Volodyatsky already distinguished clearly, Allah! Allah! My horse has stumbled, shouted Zagloba. That is nothing, cried Volodyovsky. But through his head that moment there flew like thunderbolts the questions, what will happen if the horses do not hold out? What will happen if one of them falls? They were valiant Tartar steeds of iron endurance, but they had come already from Plaskiri, resting but little on that wild flight from the town to the first forest. They might, it is true, take the led horses, but they too were tired. What is to be done, thought Volodyovsky. And his heart throbbed with alarm, perhaps for the first time in his life, not for himself, but for Helena, whom during that long journey he had come to love as his own sister. And he knew too that the Tartars when they had once begun pursuit would not relinquish it very soon. Let them keep on, they will not catch her, said he, setting his teeth. My horse has stumbled! cried Zagloba a second time. That is nothing, answered Volodyovsky again. They were now in the forest, darkness around them. But single Tartar horsemen were not farther than a few hundred yards behind. But the little knight knew now what to do. Gentian, cried he, turn with the lady to the first path leading out of the highway. Good, my master. The little knight turned to Zagloba. Pistol in hand. At the same time, seizing the bridle of Zagloba's horse, he began to restrain his course. What are you doing? cried the noble. Nothing. Hold in your horse. The distance between them and Genzian, who had escaped with Helena, increased every moment. At last he came with her to a point where the highway turned rather sharply towards Barrage, and straight ahead lay a narrow forest trail half hidden by branches. Genzian rushed into it, and in a twinkle the two had disappeared in the thicket and the gloom. Meanwhile Volodyovsky had stopped his own horse and Zagloba's. In the name of God's mercy, what are you doing, roared Zagloba. We delay the pursuit. There is no other salvation for the princess. We shall perish. Let us perish. 
Stop here right by the side of the road, right here. Both stood close under the trees in the darkness. Presently the mighty thumping of Tartar horses approached and roared like a storm till the whole forest was filled with it. It has come, said Zagloba, raising the skin of wine to his mouth. He drank and drank, then shook himself. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, coughed he. I am ready for death. This minute. This minute, cried Volodyovsky. Three of them are riding in advance, that is what I wanted. In fact three horsemen appeared on the clear road, mounted evidently on the best horses, wolf hunters, so called in the Ukraine. For they came up with wolves in the chase, and two or three hundred yards behind them a few hundred others, and still farther a whole dense throng of the horde. When the first three came in front of the ambush two shots were discharged. Then Volodyovsky sprang like a panther into the middle of the road, and before Zagloba had time to think what was done the third Tartar was on the ground. Forward, shouted the little knight. Zagloba did not let the order be repeated, and they rushed over the road like a pair of wolves hunted by a pack of angry dogs. That moment the other Tartars hastened to the corpses, and seeing that those hunted wolves could bite to death they curbed their horses a little, waiting for their comrades. As you see, I knew that I should stop them, said Volodyovsky. But although the fugitives gained a few hundred steps, the interruption in the chase did not last long. Only the Tartars pressed on in a larger crowd, not pushing forward singly. The horses of the fugitives were wearied by the long road, and their speed slackened, especially that of Zagloba's horse, which bearing such a considerable burden stumbled once and twice. What there was left of the old man's hair stood on end at the thought that he should fall. Pan Michael, dearest Pan Michael, do not abandon me! cried he, in despair. Oh, be of good heart! answered the little knight. May the wolves tear this whore! He had not finished this sentence when the first arrow hissed near his ear. And after it others began to hiss and whistle and sing as if they were horseflies and bees. One passed so near that its head almost grazed Zagloba's ear. Volodyovsky turned and again fired twice from his pistol at the pursuers. Zagloba's horse stumbled now so heavily that his nostrils were almost buried in the earth. By the living God, my horse is dying, shouted he, in a heartrending voice. From the saddle to the woods, thundered Volodyovsky. Having given this order, he stopped his own horse, sprang off, and a moment later he and Zagloba vanished in the darkness. But this movement did not escape the slanting eyes of the Tartars, and several tens of them springing from their horses also gave chase. The branches tore the cap from Zagloba's head, beat him on the face and caught his coat, but putting his feet behind his belt he made off as if he were thirty years of age. Sometimes he fell, but he was up again and off quicker than ever, puffing like a bellows. At last he fell into a deep hole, and felt that he could not crawl out again, for his strength had failed him completely. Where are you? called Volodyovsky, in a low voice. Down here. It's all over with me, save me, Pan Michael. Volodyovsky sprang without hesitation to the hole and clapped his hand on Zagloba's mouth, be silent. Perhaps they will pass us. We will defend ourselves anyhow. By that time the Tartars came up. Some of them did in fact pass the hole, thinking that the fugitives had gone farther. Others went slowly, examining the trees and looking around on every side. The knights held the breath in their breasts. Let someone fall in here, thought Zagloba, in despair, I'll fall on him. Just then sparks scattered on every side, the Tartars began to strike fire. By the flash their wild faces could be seen, with their puffed cheeks and lips sticking out, blowing the lighted tinder. For a time they kept going around a few tens of steps from the hole like ill-omened forest phantoms, drawing nearer and nearer. But at the last moment wonderful sounds of some sort, murmurs, and confused cries began to come from the highway and to rouse the slumbering depths. The Tartars stopped striking fire, and stood as if rooted to the earth. Volodyovsky's hand was biting into the shoulder of Zagloba. 
The cries increased, and suddenly red lights burst forth, and with them was heard a salvo of musketry, once, twice, three times, followed by shouts of Allah. The clatter of sabers, the neighing of horses, tramping, and confused uproar. A battle was raging on the road. Ours, ours, shouted Volodyovsky. Slay! Kill! Strike! Cut! Slaughter! bellowed Zagloba. A second later a number of Tartars rushed past the hole in the wildest disorder, and vanished in the direction of their party. Volodyovsky did not restrain himself. He sprang after them, and pressed on in the thicket and darkness. Zagloba remained at the bottom of the hole. He tried to crawl up, but could not. All his bones were aching, and he was barely able to stand on his feet. Ah, scoundrels, said he, looking around on every side, you have fled. It is a pity some one of you did not stay, I should have company in this hole, and I would show him where pepper grows. Oh, pagan trash, they are cutting you up like beasts this minute. Oh, for God's sake, the uproar is increasing every moment. I wish that Yeremy himself were here, he would warm you. You are shouting, Allah. Allah. The wolves will shout, Allah. Over your carrion pretty soon. But that Pan Michael should leave me here alone. Well, nothing wonderful, he is eager, for he is young. After this last adventure I would follow him anywhere, for he is not a friend to leave one in distress. He is a wasp. In one minute he stung three. If at least I had that wineskin with me. But those devils have surely taken it, or the horses have trampled it. Besides insects are devouring me in this ditch. What's that? The shouts and discharges of musketry began to recede in the direction of the field and the first forest. Ah, ah, thought Zagloba, they are on their necks. Oh, dog brothers, you could not hold out. Praise be to God in the highest. The shouts receded farther and farther. They ride lustily, muttered he. But I see that I shall have to sit in this ditch. It only remains now for the wolves to eat me. Bogan to begin with, then the Tartars, and wolves at the end. God grant a stake to Bogan and madness to the wolves. Our men will take care of the Tartars not in the worst fashion. Pan Michael. Pan Michael. Silence gave answer to Zagloba. Only the pines murmured, and from afar came the sounds fainter and fainter. Shall I lie down to sleep here, or what? May the devil take it. Pan Michael. But Zagloba's patience had a long trial yet, for dawn was in the sky when the clatter of hoofs was heard again on the road and lights shone in the forest. Pan Michael, I am here. Crawl out. But I cannot. Volodyovsky with a torch in his hand stood over the hole, and giving his hand to Zagloba, said, Well, the Tartars are gone, we drove them to the other forest. But who came up? Kushal and Rozdvorovsky, with two thousand horse. My dragoons are with them too. Were there many of the pagans? A couple of thousand. Praise be to God. Give me something to drink, for I am faint. Two hours later Zagloba, having eaten and drunk what he needed, was sitting on a comfortable saddle in the midst of Volodyovsky's dragoons, and at his side rode the little knight, who said, Do not worry. For though we shall not come to Zbaraj in company with the princess, it would have been worse if she had fallen into the hands of the heathen. But perhaps Genzian will come back yet to Zbaraj. He will not. The highway will be occupied, the party which we drove back will return soon and follow us. Besides Berlai may appear at any moment before Genzian could come in. Melnitsky and the Khan are marching on the other side from Konstantinov. Oh, for God's sake! Then he will fall into a trap with the princess. Genzian has wit enough to spring through between Zbaraj and Konstantinov in time, and not let the regiments of Melnitsky or the parties of the Khan catch him. You see I have great confidence in his success. God grant it. He is a cunning lad, just like a fox. 
you have no lack of stratagem, but he is more cunning. We split our heads a great deal over plans to rescue the girl, but in the end our hands dropped, and through him the whole has been directed. He'll slip out this time like a snake, for it is a question of his own life. Have confidence, for God, who saved her so many times, is over her now. And remember that in Zbaraj you bade me have confidence when Zahar came. Zagloba was strengthened somewhat by these words of Pan Michael, and then fell into deep thought. Pan Michael, he said after a time, have you asked Kushal what Skshatuski is doing? He is in Zbaraj, and well, he came from Prince Koretsky's with Zatsvilikovsky. But what shall we tell him? Ah, there is the rub. Does he think yet that the girl was killed in Kiev? He does. Have you told Kushal or anyone else where we are coming from? I have not, for I thought it better to take counsel first. I should prefer to say nothing of the whole affair. If the girl should fall again into Cossack or Tartar hands, which God forbid. It would be a new torture, just as if someone were to tear open all his wounds. I'll give my head that Jensian takes her through. I should gladly give my own to have him do so. But misfortune rages now in the world like a pestilence. Better be silent, and leave everything to the will of God. So let it be. But will not Podbipienta give the secret to Skshatuski? Don't you know him? He gave his word of honor, which for that Lithuanian is sacred. Here Kushal joined them. They rode on together, talking, by the first rays of the rising sun, of public affairs, of the arrival at Zbaraj of the commanders in consequence of Yeremy's wishes. Of the impending arrival of the prince himself, and the inevitable and awful struggle with the whole power of Melnitsky. Chapter 57 Volodyovsky and Zagloba found all the forces of the crown assembled at Zbaraj, and waiting for the enemy. The cupbearer of the crown, Ostrog, who had come from Konstantinov, was there, and Lanskaronsky, Castellan of Kamenets, who had gained the first victory at Bar. The third commander, Pan Ferle of Dombrovitsa, Castellan of Belsk, and Andrei Serikovsky, Secretary of the Crown. Konyatspolsky, the standard-bearer, and Shiemsky, commander of the artillery, a warrior specially expert in the capture and defense of towns. And with them ten thousand troops, not counting a number of Prince Yeremy's squadrons previously quartered at Zbaraj. Pan Shiemsky, on the southern side of the town and the castle and the two ponds, had laid out a strong camp, which he fortified in foreign fashion and which it was only possible to capture in front. For at the rear and two sides it was defended by the ponds, the castle, and the river. In this camp the commanders intended to offer resistance to Melnitsky, and delay his avalanche till the king, with the rest of the forces and the national militia of all the nobility, should come. But was that plan possible of execution in view of the power of Melnitsky? There was much doubt, and there were reasonable causes for the doubt, among them the disorder in the camp itself. First of all, secret contention was raging among the leaders. The commanders had come against their will to Zbaraj, yielding in this to the desires of Prince Yeremy. They wished at first to make their defense at Konstantinov. But when the news went forth that Yeremy would appear in his own person only in case Zbaraj should be the point of defense, the soldiers declared immediately to the leaders of the crown that they would go to Zbaraj, and would not fight elsewhere. Neither persuasion nor the authority of the Baton availed. And in short the commanders discovered that if they should continue in longer resistance, the army, from the heavy hussar regiments to the last soldier of the foreign companies, would leave them and go over to the banners of Vishnyavetsky. This was one of those sad cases of military insubordination of increasing frequency in that time, and caused by the incapacity of the leaders, their mutual disagreements. The unexampled terror before the power of Melnitsky, and the defeats unheard of till then, especially the defeat of Palavtsi. So the commanders had to march to Zbaraj, where the command, in spite of the appointments made by the king, had by the force of circumstance passed into the hands of Yeremy. For the army would obey only him, fight and perish under him alone. But that leader de facto was not in Zbaraj yet. 
therefore unrest was increasing in the army, discipline was relaxed to the last degree, and courage fell. For it was already known that Melnitsky, together with the Khan, was approaching with forces the like of which the eyes of men had not seen since the days of Tamerlane. Fresh tidings kept flying to the camp like ill-omened birds, reports, each more recent and more terrible than the preceding, and weakened the manhood of the soldiers. There were fears that a panic like that of Palavtsi might break out suddenly and scatter that handful of an army which stood between Melnitsky and the heart of the Commonwealth. The leaders themselves had lost their heads. Their contradictory orders were not carried out, or if carried out, with unwillingness. In fact Yeremy alone could avert the catastrophe hanging over the camp, the army, and the country. Zagloba and Volodyovsky dropped at once into the vortex of army life. They had barely appeared on the square when they were surrounded by officers of various regiments, interrupting one another in their inquiries for news. At sight of the Tartar captives, confidence entered the hearts of the curious. The Tartars are plucked. Tartar prisoners. God gave a victory, repeated some. The Tartars are here, and Burli with them, cried others. To arms. To the walls. The news flew through the camp, and Kushal's victory was magnified along the road. An increasing throng gathered around the prisoners. Kill them. What are we to do with them? Questions fell thick as flakes in a snowstorm. Kushal would give no answer, and went with a report to the quarters of Furlay, the castellan of Belsk. Volodyovsky and Zagloba were greeted at once by their acquaintances of the Russian squadron. But they escaped as well as they could, for they were in haste to see Pan Yen. They found him in the castle with Zatsvilikovsky, two Bernardine priests of the place, and Pan Langin Podbipienta. Skshetuski grew a little pale on seeing them, and half closed his eyes, for he was reminded of too much to see them without pain. Still he gave a calm and even joyful greeting, inquired where they had been, and was satisfied with the first convenient answer. Since he looked on the princess as dead, he wished for nothing, hoped for nothing, and not the slightest suspicion entered his soul that their long absence related to her. They made no mention of the object of their journey, though Pan Longin looked first on one and then on the other with an inquiring glance, sighed, and turned in his place wishing to read even a shadow of hope on their faces. But both were occupied with Pan Yen, whom Volodyovsky seized by the shoulders repeatedly. For his heart grew soft at the sight of that old and trusty friend, who had passed through so much and lost so much that he had almost nothing to live for. We shall have all the old comrades together again, said he to Skshetuski, and you will be happy with us. A war too will come, I see, such as has not been yet, and with it great delights for every soldier soul. If God gives you health, you will lead the hussars many a time to come. God has already returned me my health, and I wish nothing more for myself than to serve while my service is needed. Skshetuski was in fact well, for youth and his sturdy strength had conquered the illness within him. Grief had bitten his spirit, but it could not bite his body. He had merely grown spare and pallid, so that his forehead, cheeks, and nose seemed formed of church wax. The former austerity had settled firmly on his face, and there was in it the rigid repose that we note in the visage of the dead. An increasing number of silver threads wound through his dark beard. In other regards he differed in nothing from the rest of men, except, contrary to soldier custom, he avoided crowds, noise, and drinking. He conversed more readily with monks, to whose discourse on the life of the cloister and the life to come he listened with eagerness. But he performed his service with diligent care, for the expected siege occupied him equally with all the others. Soon conversation touched on this subject, for no one in the camp, castle, and town thought of aught else. Old Zatsvilikovsky asked about the Tartars and Burli, with whom he had an acquaintance of ancient date. That's a great warrior, said he. It is too bad that he should rise against the country with others. We served together at Kodum. He was still a youth, but already gave promise of ripening into an uncommon man. But he is from the Trans Dnieper, and leads men of that region, said Skshetuski. 
How is it, father, that he is now marching from the south, from the direction of Kamenets? It seems, answered the old man, that Melnitsky fixed winter quarters for him there on purpose, since Tugai Bay remained on the Dnieper. And that great Mirza has a hatred for him from former times. No one has cut up the Tartars like Berlai. And now he will be a comrade to them? Yes, said Zatsvilikovsky, such are the times. But Melnitsky will watch and keep them from devouring each other. When do they expect Melnitsky here, father? asked Volodyovsky. Any day. But who can tell? The commanders should send out scout after scout but they do not. I was barely able to prevail on them to send Kushal to the south and Piglovsky to Kulgansky Cayman. I wish to go myself, but there are councils without end. They should send also the secretary of the crown with some squadrons. They would better hurry, lest it be too late. God give us the prince at the earliest moment, or we shall be met by disgrace like that of Palavtsi. I saw those soldiers as we rode through the square, said Zagloba, and I think there are more fools among them than good men. They should be market boys, not comrades to us who are enamored of glory, esteeming it beyond our own lives. What are you talking about, blurted out the old man. I do not belittle your bravery, though once I was of another mind. But all the knights here are the first soldiers that the commonwealth has ever had. Only a head is needed, a leader. Lanskaronsky is a good skirmisher, but no general, Furlay is old, and as to the cupbearer, he and Prince Dominic made a reputation for themselves at Palavtsi. What wonder that no one wants to obey them. A soldier will shed his blood freely if sure that he will not be destroyed without need. But now, instead of thinking of the siege, they are disputing about positions. Are there provisions enough? asked Zagloba, in alarm. Not so many as are necessary. But we are still worse off for provender. If the siege should last a month, there will be only shavings and stones for the horses. There is still time to get provender, said Volodyovsky. Then go and tell them so. God give us the prince. I repeat. You are not the only one who is sighing for him, interrupted Pan Langin. I know that, answered the old man. Look out on the square. All at the walls look with longing eyes toward Old Zbaraj, others in the town have climbed the towers, and if anyone cries in a joke, he is coming, they are mad with joy. A thirsty stag is not so eager for water as we for the prince. Oh, if he could only get here before Melnitsky. But I think he must have been delayed. We too pray, whole days at a time, for his coming, said one of the Bernardines. The prayers and wishes of all the knighthood were soon to gain their object, though the following day brought still greater fears and was full of ominous prophecies. On Thursday, July 8, a terrific storm raged over the town and the freshly raised ramparts of the camp. Rain fell in torrents. A part of the earthworks was swept away. Nezna and the two ponds overflowed. In the evening lightning struck the infantry under command of Furlay, Castellan of Belsk, killed a number of men, and tore the banner to pieces. This was considered of evil omen, an evident sign of the anger of God, the more since Furlay was a Calvinist. Zagloba proposed that a deputation be sent to him with the request and prayer to become a Catholic. For there could be no blessing of God for an army whose leader was living in disgusting errors hateful to heaven. Many shared this opinion and only the dignity of the castellan's person and the command prevented the sending of the deputation. But their courage fell all the more. The storm raged without interruption. The bulwark, though strengthened with stones, willows, and stakes, became so soft that the cannon began to sink. They were obliged to put planks under the howitzers, mortars, and even under the eight-pounders. In the deep ditches the water roared to the height of a man. Night brought no rest. The storm drove to the east new gigantic piles of clouds which, concentrating and discharging with terrific noise in the heavens, cast out on Zbaraj their whole stock of rain, thunder, and lightning. Only the servants remained in the tents at the camp, soldiers, officers, and commanders, with the exception of the castellan of Kamenets, 
took refuge in the town. If Melnitsky had come with the storm, he would have taken the camp without a blow. Next day it was a little better, though rain was still falling. About five o'clock in the afternoon the wind drove away the clouds, the blue sky opened above the camp, and in the direction of Old Zverage a splendid seven-colored rainbow was shining. The mighty ark with one arm extended beyond Old Zverage, while the other, seeming to drink in the moisture of the black forest, glittered, changed, and played on the background of fleeing clouds. That moment confidence entered all hearts. The knights returned to the camp and stood on the slippery bulwark to gladden their eyes with the sight of the rainbow. Immediately they began to talk loudly and to guess what this favorable sign might announce, when Volodyovsky, standing with others over the very ditch, covered his panther eyes with his hand and cried. Troops are coming from under the rainbow. There was a stir as if a whirlwind had moved the human mass, and then a sudden murmur. The words, troops are coming, flew like an arrow from one end of the rampart to the other. The soldiers began to crowd and push, gathering in groups. Murmurs rose and fell, still all hands rested above the eyes, all eyes were turned, strained with effort, into the distance. Hearts were throbbing, and all, holding the breath in their breasts, were suspended between hope and fear. Then something began to sway, and swayed still more definitely, and rose out of the distance, and approached still nearer, and became still more distinctly visible, till at last the banners, flags, and bunchucks appeared, later a forest of streamers. The eyes doubted no longer, it was an army. Then one gigantic shout rose from the breasts of all, a shout of inconceivable joy. Yeremy! 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 The oldest soldiers were simply seized with frenzy. Some threw themselves from the ramparts, waded through the ditch, and hurried on foot through the water-covered plain to the advancing regiments. Others rushed to their horses, some laughed, others wept, placing their hands together and crying, Our Father is coming, our Saviour, our Chief. It might have seemed that the siege was raised, Melnitsky finished, and the victory won. Meanwhile the regiments of the prince had drawn so near that the banners could be distinguished. In advance came, as usual, the light regiments of the prince's Tartars, the Cossacks, and the Wallachians, after them Machnitsky's foreign infantry, then the cannon of Virchel, the dragoons, and the heavy Hussar regiments. The rays of the sun reflected on their armor and on the points of their upraised lances. All marched in unusual splendor, as if the halo of victory were around them. Skshetuski, standing with Pan Longin on the ramparts, recognized from afar his own squadron, which he had left in Zamost, and his faded cheeks colored a little. He drew several deep breaths, as if he had thrown some great weight from his breast, and his eyes grew glad. For days of superhuman toil were near him too, as well as heroic struggles which heal the heart better than all and hurl down painful memories deeper and deeper somewhere into the bottom of the soul. The regiments continued to approach, and barely a thousand yards separated them from the camp. The officers too had hurried up in order to witness the entrance of the prince. The three commanders also, and with them Pan Shiemsky, Pan Konyetspolsky, Pan Marek Sobieski, Starosta of Krasnostav, Pan Korf, and all the other officers, as well of Polish as foreign command. All shared in the universal joy, and especially Lance Garonsky, one of the commanders, who was more a knight than a general, but enamored of military glory. He stretched his baton in the direction from which Yeremy was coming, and called in a voice so loud that all heard him. There is our supreme chief. And I am the first to give him my command and my office. The regiments of the prince began to enter the camp. They were three thousand men in all. But the courage of the garrison increased by a hundred thousand, for they were the victors from Pogrebish, Nymarov, Maknovka, and Konstantinov. Then acquaintances and friends greeted one another. After the light regiment's Virchel's artillery came in at last with difficulty, bringing twelve cannon. The prince, who had sent his regiments from Old Zbarage, entered after sunset. All that was living assembled to greet him. The soldiers, taking lamps, candles, torches, bits of pitch pine, 
surrounded the prince's steed and barred his advance. The horse was caught by the bridle, so that the warriors might sate their eyes with the sight of the hero, they kissed his garments, and almost bore him away on their shoulders. The excitement rose to that degree that not only soldiers of his own regiments but of foreign companies declared they would serve three months without pay. The throng became denser each moment, so that he was unable to move a step. He sat then on his white steed, surrounded by the soldiery as a shepherd by his flocks, and there was no end to shouts and applause. The evening was calm and clear, thousands of stars glittered in the dark sky, and then appeared favorable omens. Just as Lanskaronsky approached the prince to deliver the baton into his hand, one of the stars, torn away from the sky and drawing after it a stream of light, fell with a noise. And was quenched in the direction of Konstantinov, from which Melnitsky had to come. That is Melnitsky's star, shouted the soldiers. A miracle! A miracle! An evident sign! Vivat Yeremy Victor, repeated a thousand voices. Then Lanskaronsky approached and gave a sign with his hand that he wanted to speak. Immediately there was silence, and he said. The king gave me this baton, but into your more worthy hands do I yield it, wishing to be first to obey your orders. And we are with him, repeated two other commanders. Three batons were extended to the prince, but he drew back his hand, saying, It was not I that gave them, and I will not receive them. Let there be a fourth with the three, said Furlay. Vivat Vishnievetsky. Vivat the commanders, shouted the knights. We will die together. At that moment the prince's steed raised his head, shook his purple-stained mane, and neighed mightily, so that all the horses in the camp answered him in one voice. This too was considered prophetic of victory. The soldiers had fire in their eyes, their hearts were hot with thirst for battle, the quiver of eagerness ran through their bodies. The officers shared the universal ecstasy. Prince Ostrog wept and prayed. Lanskaronsky and the starosta of Krasnostav began first to wave their sabers, encouraging the soldiers, who, running to the edge of the rampart and stretching out their hands in the darkness, shouted in the direction from which they expected the enemy. Come on, dog brothers. You will find us ready for you. That night no man slept in the camp, and till daybreak there was thunder of shouts with the rushing to and fro of lamps and torches. In the morning Pan Serikovsky, secretary of the crown, came with a scouting party from Kalgansky Cayman, and brought news that the enemy were twenty-five miles from the camp. The party had a battle with a superior force of Tartars, in which the two Mankovskys and Pan Oleksik had fallen, with a number of good soldiers. The informants brought in declared that behind this body the Khan and Melnitsky were marching with all their forces. The day passed in waiting and preparations for defense. The prince, having taken the command, without further delay put the army in order, he showed each part where to stand, how to defend itself, and how to give succor to the rest. The best spirit reigned in the camp, discipline was restored, and instead of the former confusion, antagonism of authority, and uncertainty, accuracy and order were everywhere present. Before midday all were in their places. The pickets thrown out before the camp reported at intervals what was doing in the neighborhood. The camp attendants dispatched to the adjacent villages brought in provisions and forage, whatever was yet to be found. Soldiers standing on the ramparts chatted merrily and sang, and they passed the night slumbering by the fires, saber in hand, with the same readiness as if the assault might begin at any moment. At daylight something dark began to appear in the direction of Vishnevets. The bells in the town rang in alarm, and in the camp the prolonged plaintive sound of the trumpets roused the soldiers to wakefulness. The infantry regiments mounted the ramparts, the cavalry took position in the intervals, ready to rush forward at the signal of attack. And through the whole length of the ditch ascended slender streaks of smoke from the lighted matches. At this moment the prince appeared on his white steed. He was in silver armor, but without a helmet. Not the least concern was visible on his forehead, but gladness shone out of his eyes and his face. We have guests, gentlemen, we have guests, he repeated, riding along the ramparts. Silence followed, 
and then could be heard the waving of banners, which the light breath of air now raised and now wound around the staffs. Meanwhile the enemy came so near that it was possible to take them in with the eye. This was the first wave. Not Melnitsky himself, with the Khan, but a reconnoitering party made up of thirty thousand chosen Tartars, armed with bows, muskets, and sabres. Having captured fifteen hundred men sent out for provisions, they went in a dense mass from Vishniavets. Then, stretching out in a long crescent, they began to ride around from the opposite side toward Old's Barrage. The prince, satisfied that this was merely a party, ordered the cavalry out of the entrenchments. The voices of command were heard. The regiments began to move and issue from behind the ramparts like bees from a hive. The plain was soon filled with men and horses. From a distance could be seen the captains riding around the squadrons and putting them in line of battle. The horses snorted playfully, and sometimes their neighing went through the ranks. Then from out this mass pushed forth two squadrons of Tartars and Cossacks, and advanced on a light trot, their bows shook on their shoulders, and their caps glittered. They rode in silence, and at their head was the red Virchal, whose horse reared under him as though wild. Throwing his front hoofs in the air as if wishing to escape the bit and spring at once into the tumult. The blue of heaven was unspotted by a cloud, the day was clear, transparent, and the assailants were visible as on the palm of the hand. Now there appeared from the side of Old's Barrage a small wagon train of the prince, which had not succeeded in entering with the army, and was hurrying with all its might to escape capture at a blow by the Tartars. Indeed it had not escaped their glance, and the long crescent moved swiftly toward it. Cries of Allah flew to the ears of the infantry on the ramparts. The squadrons of Virchal shot on like a whirlwind to the rescue. But the crescent arrived at the train sooner, and engirdled it in a moment as if with a black ribbon. And simultaneously several thousand of the horde turned with an unearthly howl to surround Virchal in like manner. Here might be noted the experience of Virchal and the skill of his soldiers. Seeing that they were flanking him on right and left, he divided his forces into three parts and sprang to the sides, then he divided them into four, then into two. And each time the enemy had to turn with his whole line, for he had no opponent in front and his wings were already broken. The fourth time they met breast to breast. But Virchal struck with all his force in the weakest part, burst through, and immediately found himself in the rear of the enemy, whom he left, and rushed like a tempest to the train. Regardless of pursuit. Old soldiers, beholding this from the ramparts, stood with armored hands on their hips, crying, May the bullet strike them, only the prince's captains lead in that style. Then Virchal struck in the form of a sharp wedge the ring surrounding the tabor, and pierced it as an arrow pierces a man. In the twinkle of an eye he was in the center. Now instead of two battles there raged one, but all the more stubborn. It was a marvelous sight. In the center of the plain was a small tabor, like a moving fortress, throwing out long streaks of smoke and vomiting fire. Without, a black and wildly moving swarm, as one gigantic eddy followed another, horses fleeing without riders, within, noise, uproar, and the thunder of guns. In one place some were rushing through others, in another they struggled unbroken. As a wild boar at bay defends himself with his white tusks and tears the raging dogs, so that Tabor in the midst of the cloud of Tartars defended itself desperately, hoping that assistance greater than Virchal's would come from the camp. The red coats of the dragoons of Kushal and Volodyovsky soon twinkled on the field. You would have said they were red leaves of flowers driven by the wind. They rushed to the cloud of Tartars and disappeared in it as in a black forest, so for a time they were invisible, but the uproar increased. The troops wondered why the prince did not send force enough at once to the succor of the surrounded. But he delayed, wishing to show exactly what he sent, and in this way to raise their courage and prepare them for still greater perils. However, the fire in the tabor grew weak. It was evident they had no time to load, or the barrels of the muskets had grown hot. The shouts of the Tartars increased continually. The prince therefore gave a signal, and three hussar squadrons, one, his guard, under Skshetuski, 
the second under the starosta of Krasnostav. The third a royal squadron under Poglovsky, rushed to the battle from the camp. They struck them as an axe strikes, they broke the ring of Tartars at once, threw them back, scattered them, pressed them to the woods, redispersed and drove them more than a mile from the camp. The little Tabor entered the entrenchments in safety, amidst joyous shouts and the thunder of cannon. The Tartars, however, feeling that Melnitsky and the Khan were following, did not disappear altogether, but came again, and shouting, Allah! Galloped around the whole camp, occupying at the same time the roads, highways, and villages, from which pillars of black smoke were soon rising to the sky. Many of their skirmishers came near the trenches. Against these the soldiers of the prince and the quarter soldiers rushed out at once, singly and in parties, especially from the Tartar, Wallachian, and Dragoon squadrons. Virchow was unable to take part in the skirmishes, for, struck six times in the head while defending the Tabor, he lay as if dead in the tent. Volodyovsky, red as a lobster, though untouched, still unsatisfied, took his place, and moved first to the field. These skirmishes, at which the infantry and heavy cavalry looked from the camp as at a spectacle, lasted till evening. Sometimes one side excelled, sometimes the other. They fought in groups or singly, captives were taken alive. But Pan Michael, as soon as he struck anyone and finished him, turned again, and his red uniform circled over the whole field of battle. At last Skshatuski pointed him out from a distance to Lanskaronsky as a curiosity, for as often as he met with a Tartar it might be said that lightning had struck that man. Zagloba, though beyond the hearing of Pan Michael, encouraged him with shouts from the ramparts. From time to time he turned to the soldiers standing around, and said. Look, gentlemen. I taught him to use the saber. Well done. If he goes on, with God's help, he will equal me soon. But now the sun had gone down, and each skirmisher began to withdraw slowly from the field, on which remained only bodies of horses and men. From the town the first sounds of the Ave Maria were heard. Night fell gradually, still darkness did not come, for fires in the country about gave light. Zalostsits, Barzants, Lublyanki, Stryavka, Kredovitz, Zarudzi, Vaklavka were burning, and the whole vicinity, as far as the eye could reach, was blazing in one conflagration. The smoke in the night became red, the stars were shining on the rosy background of the sky. Clouds of birds rose from the forests, thickets, and ponds with a tremendous noise, circled in the air lighted by the burning, and looked like flying flames. The cattle in the camp, terrified by the unusual spectacle, began to bellow plaintively. It cannot be, said old soldiers to one another in the trenches, that the Tartars of that party have set such fires, surely Melnitsky, with the Cossacks and the whole horde, are advancing. These were not empty surmises, for Pan Serikovsky had brought intelligence on the preceding day that the Zaporozhian Hetman and the Khan were in the rear of that party. They were expected therefore with certainty. The soldiers were in the trenches to a man, the citizens were on the roofs and towers, all hearts were unquiet. Women were sobbing in the churches, stretching out their hands to the most holy sacrament. Uncertainty, worse than all, oppressed with immeasurable weight the town, the castle, and the camp. But it did not last long. Night had not fallen completely when the first ranks of the Cossacks and Tartars appeared on the horizon, then the second, third, tenth, hundredth, thousandth. You would have said all the forests and groves had torn themselves suddenly from their roots, and were marching on Zbarage. In vain did the eye seek the end of those ranks. As far as the eye reached swarms of men and horses were blackening, vanishing in the smokes and fires of the distance. They moved like clouds, or like locusts which covered the whole country with their terrible moving mass. Before them went the threatening rumble of human voices, like wind in a forest among the branches of the ancient pines. Then, halting about a mile and a quarter away, they began to settle down and make fires for the night. You see the fires, whispered the soldiers. They extend farther than a horse could go in one journey. Jesus and Mary, said Zagloba to Skshatuski. I tell you there is a lion in me and I feel no alarm. 
but I would that a blazing thunderbolt might crush them all before morning. As God is dear to me, there are too many of them. Unless perhaps in the valley of Jehoshaphat there will not be a greater crowd. And tell me, what do those scoundrels want? Would not every dog brother of them be better at home, working his serfage peaceably for his land? What fault is it of ours if God has made us nobles and them trash, and commanded them to obey? Tfo. I am beside myself with rage. I am a mild-mannered man, soft as a plaster, but let them not rouse me to anger. They have had too much freedom, too much bread. They have multiplied like mice in a barn, and now they are dying to get at the cats. Ah, uh, wait. There is one cat here called Yeremy, and another called Zagloba. What do you think, will those two enter upon negotiations? If the rebels had surrendered with obedience, then their lives might be granted, might they not? One thing disturbs me continually, are there provisions enough in the camp? Oh, to the devil! Look, gentlemen, fires beyond fires, and still fires. May black death fall on such a crowd. Why talk about treaties, said Skshetuski, when they think they have us all under their hands, and will get us tomorrow. But they won't get us, will they? asked Zagloba. Well, the will of God for that. In any case, since the prince is here, it won't come easy to them. You have consoled me indeed. I do not care that it should not come easy to them, but that it should not come at all. It is no small pleasure for a soldier not to yield his life for nothing. True, true. But may lightning strike the whole affair, and your consolation with it. At that moment Podbipienta and Volodyovsky approached. They say that the Cossacks with the horde are half a million strong, said the Lithuanian. I wish that you had lost your tongue, said Zagloba, you have brought good tidings. It is easier to kill them in assault than in the field, continued Pan Longin, mildly. Now that our prince and Melnitsky have met at last, there will be no talk about negotiations. Either master or monk.18 tomorrow will be the day of judgment, said Volodyovsky, rubbing his hands. He was right. In that war the two most terrible lions had not yet stood eye to eye. One had crushed the hetmans and the commanders, the other powerful Cossack adamans. On the footsteps of both followed victory, each was a terror to his enemies. But whose side will be weightiest in a direct encounter? This was to be decided now. Vishniavetsky looked from the entrenchments on the countless myriads of Tartars and Cossacks, and strove in vain to embrace them with the eye. Melnitsky looked from the field on the castle and camp, thinking in his soul, my most terrible enemy is there, when I have finished with him, who can oppose me? It was easy to guess that the conflict between these two men would be long and stubborn, but the result could not be doubtful. That prince in Lubny and Vishnevets stood at the head of fifteen thousand troops, counting the camp servants. While the peasant chieftain was followed by mobs, from the Sea of Azov and the Don to the mouth of the Danube. The Khan too marched with him at the head of the Crimean, Belgorod, Nogai, and Dobruja hordes. Men marched with him who dwelt on the tributaries of the Dniester and the Dnieper, men from the lower country, and a countless rabble from the steppes, ravines, woods, towns, hamlets, villages, and farms, and all who had formerly served in private regiments or those of the crown. Cherks, nineteen Wallachians, Silistrians, Rumelians, Turks, bands of Serbs and Bulgarians were also in that host. It might appear that a new migration of nations had abandoned the dreary abodes on the steppes, and were moving westward to win fresh lands and found a new kingdom. This was the relation of the struggling forces, a handful against legions, an island against the sea. No wonder then that many a heart was beating with alarm. Not only in that town, not only in that corner of the land, but in the whole commonwealth they looked on that lonely trench, surrounded by a deluge of wild warriors. As the tomb of great knights and their mighty chief. Melnitsky too looked on it in just the same way. For scarcely were the fires well kindled in his camps, when a Cossack envoy began to wave a white flag before the trenches, to sound a trumpet, and cry out not to shoot. 
the guards went and brought him in at once. From the hetman to Prince Yeremy, said he to them. The prince had not yet dismounted, and was on the bulwark with face as calm as the sky. The flames were reflected in his eyes, and invested his delicate white countenance with rosy light. The Cossack standing before the face of the prince lost his speech. His legs trembled under him, and a shiver went through his body though he was an old wolf of the steppes and had come as an envoy. Who are you? asked the prince, fixing his calm glance upon him. I am the Sotnik Sokol, from the Hetman. And why have you come? The Sotnik began to make bows as low as the stirrups of the prince. Pardon me, lord. I tell what has been commanded me. I am to blame in nothing. Speak boldly. The hetman commanded me to inform you that he has come as a guest to Zberaj, and will visit you in the castle tomorrow. Tell him that not tomorrow, but today I give a feast in the castle, answered the prince. In fact an hour later the mortars were thundering salutes, joyous shouts were raised. All the windows of the castle shone with a thousand gleaming lights. The Khan, hearing the salutes of the cannon and the sound of trumpets and drums, went out in front of the tent in company with his brother Nureddin, the Sultan Galga, Tugai Bey, and many Mirzas. And later sent for Melnitsky. The hetman, though he had been drinking, appeared at once. Bowing and placing his fingers to his forehead, his beard, and his breast, he waited for the question. The Khan looked long at the castle, shining in the distance like a gigantic lantern, and nodded his head slightly. At last he passed his hand over his thin beard, which fell in two long tresses upon his weasel-skin shuba, and asked, pointing to the gleaming windows. Zaporojan Hetman, what is that? Most mighty Tsar, answered Melnitsky, that is Prince Yeremy giving a feast. The Khan was astonished. A feast? He is giving a feast for the slain of tomorrow, said Melnitsky. That moment new discharges thundered from the castle, the trumpets sounded, and mingled shouts reached the worthy ears of the Khan. God is one, muttered he. There is a lion in the heart of that infidel. And after a moment of silence he added, I should rather be with him than with you. Melnitsky trembled. He paid for the indispensable Tartar friendship, and besides was not sure of his terrible ally. Any whim of the Khan, and all the hordes might turn against the Cossacks, who would be lost beyond redemption. Melnitsky knew this, and knew too that the Khan was aiding him really for the sake of plunder, gifts, and unfortunate captives, and still looking upon himself as a legitimate monarch. Was ashamed in his soul to stand on the side of rebellion against a king, on the side of such a Amel against such a Vishnevetsky. The hetman of the Cossacks often got drunk, not from habit alone, but from desperation. Great monarch, said he, Yeremy is your enemy. It was he who took the trans Dnieper from the Tartars. He hanged, murdered Mirzas like wolves on the trees, as a terror, he intended to visit the Crimea with fire and sword. And have you not done damage in the Ulysses? asked the Khan. I am your slave. The blue lips of Tugai Bey began to quiver. He had among the Cossacks a deadly enemy, who in his time had cut a whole shambol to pieces and almost captured him. The name of that man was pressing to his mouth from the implacable power of revengeful memories, he did not restrain himself, and began to snarl in a low voice, Burlai. Burlai. Tugai Bey, said Melnitsky, immediately, you and Burlai, at the exalted and wise command of the Khan, poured water on your swords the past year. A new salvo of artillery from the castle interrupted further conversation. The Khan stretched out his hand and described a circle with it enclosing Zberaj, the town, the castle, and the trench. Tomorrow will that be mine? asked he, turning to Melnitsky. Tomorrow they will die there, answered Melnitsky, with eyes fastened on the castle. Then he bowed again, and touched with his hand his forehead, beard, and breast, considering the conversation ended. The Khan wrapped himself in his weasel skin shuba, for the night was cool, though in July, and said, turning toward the tent, It is late already. Then all began to nod as if moved by one power, and he went to the tent slowly and with dignity repeating in a low voice, 
God is one. Melnitsky withdrew also, and on the road to his quarters muttered, I'll give you the castle, the town, booty, and captives, but Yeremy will be mine, even if I have to pay for him with my life. Gradually the fires began to grow dim and die, gradually the dull murmur of thousands of voices grew still. But here and there was heard the report of a musket, or the calling of Tartar herdsmen driving their horses to pasture. Then those voices were silent, and sleep embraced the countless legions of Tartars and Cossacks. But at the castle there was feasting and revelry as at a wedding. In the camp all expected that the storm would take place on the morrow. Indeed the throngs of the mob, Cossacks, Tartars, and other wild warriors marching with Melnitsky had been moving from early morning. And approached the trenches like dark clouds rolling to the summit of a mountain. The soldiers, though they had tried in vain the day before to count the fires, were benumbed now at the sight of this sea of heads. This was not yet a real storm, but an examination of the field, the entrenchments, the ditch, the ramparts, and the whole Polish camp. And as a swollen wave of the sea, which the wind urges from afar, rolls, advances, rears itself, foams, strikes with a roar and then falls back, so did they strike in one place and another, withdraw. And strike again, as if testing the resistance. As if wishing to convince themselves whether the very sight of them by numbers alone would not crush the spirit of the enemy before they would crush the body. They fired cannon too, and the balls began to fall thickly about the camp, from which answer was given with eight pounders and small arms. At the same time there appeared a procession on the ramparts with the most holy sacrament in order to freshen the benumbed soldiers. The priest Mukovetsky carried the gilded monstrance. Holding it with both hands above his face and sometimes raising it on high, he moved on under a baldachin, calm, with closed eyes and an ascetic face. At his side walked two priests supporting him under the arms, Yaskalsky, chaplain of the hussars, a famous soldier in his time, in military art as experienced as any chief. And Jabkovsky, also an ex-soldier, a gigantic Bernardine, second in strength only to Pan Longin in the whole camp. The staffs of the baldachin were supported by four nobles, among whom was Zagloba. Before the baldachin walked sweet-faced young girls scattering flowers. They passed over the whole length of the ramparts, and after them the officers of the army. The hearts of the soldiers rose, daring came to them, fire entered their souls at the sight of the monstrance shining like the sun, at the sight of the calmness of the priest. And those maidens clothed in white. The breeze carried about the strengthening odor of the incense burned in the censers, the heads of all were bent down with humility. Mukovetsky from time to time elevated the monstrance in his eyes to heaven, and intoned the hymn, before so great a sacrament. The powerful voices of Yaskalsky and Jabkovsky continued, We fall on our faces, and the whole army sang, Let the old give place to the new law with its testament. The deep bass of the cannon accompanied the hymn, and at times the cannonballs flew past, roaring above the baldachin and the priests. Sometimes the balls striking lower in the rampart scattered earth on the people, so that Zagloba wriggled and pressed up to the staff. Fear affected especially his hair. When the procession halted for prayer there was silence, and the balls could be heard distinctly flying like great birds in a flock. Zagloba merely reddened the more. The priest Yaskalsky looked to the field, and unable to restrain himself muttered, they should rear chickens and keep away from cannon. For in truth the Cossacks had very bad gunners, and he, as a former soldier, could not look calmly on such clumsiness and waste of powder. Again they went on till they reached the other end of the ramparts, where there had been no great pressure from the enemy. Trying here and there, especially from the western pond, to see if they could not create a panic, the Tartars and Cossacks drew back at last to their own positions. And remained in them without sending out even skirmishers. Meanwhile the procession had freshened the minds of the besieged completely. It was evident that Melnitsky was waiting for the arrival of his tabor. Still he felt so sure that the first real storm would be sufficient, that he barely ordered a few trenches to be made for the cannon and did not undertake other earthworks to threaten the besieged. The Tabor arrived the following day, and took its place near the camp, wagon after wagon, 
in a number of tens of rows a mile in length, from Vernyaki to Demini. With it came also new forces. Namely, the splendid Zaporozhian infantry, almost equal to the Turkish genissaries in storms and attacks, and far more capable than the Cossacks or the mob. The memorable day, Tuesday, July 13, was passed in feverish preparations on both sides. There was no doubt that the assault would take place, for the trumpets, drums, and kettledrums were sounding the alarm from daybreak in the Cossack camp. Among the Tartars a great sacred drum, called the Balt, was roaring like thunder. The evening came, calm and clear, but from both ponds and the Nyesna thin mists were rising. At length the first star began to twinkle in the sky. At that moment sixty Cossack cannon bellowed with one voice. The countless legions rushed with a terrible cry to the ramparts, and the storm began. It appeared to the soldiers standing on the ramparts that the ground was quivering under their feet. The oldest remembered nothing like it. Jesus and Mary. What is that? asked Zagloba, standing near Skshetuski among the hussars, in the interval of the rampart. Those are not men coming against us. Of course you know they are not men, the enemy are driving oxen ahead, so that we may spend the first shots on them. The old noble became as red as a beet, his eyes were coming out of his head, and from his mouth burst one word, in which all the rage, all the terror. All that he could think at that moment was included, scoundrels. The oxen, as if mad, urged by wild, half-naked herdsmen with clubs and burning brands, were insane from fear. They ran forward with an awful bellowing, now crowding together, now hurrying on, now scattering or turning to the rear. Urged with shouts, burned with fire, lashed with rawhides, they rushed again toward the ramparts. At last Wurzel's guns began to vomit iron and fire. Then smoke hid the light, the air was red, the terrified cattle were as if cut by a thunderbolt. Half of them fell, and over their bodies went the enemy. In front ran captives with bags of sand to fill the ditch, they were stabbed from behind with pikes and scorched with musketry fire. These were peasants from around Zberage, who had been unable to take refuge in the town before the avalanche came, young men as well as old, and women. All ran forward with a shriek, a cry, a stretching of hands to heaven, and a wailing for mercy. Hair stood on end from the howl, but pity was dead upon earth at that hour. On one side the pikes of Cossacks were entering their shoulders, on the other the balls of Wurzel mashed the unfortunates, grapeshot tore them to pieces, dug furrows among them. They ran on, fell, rose again, and went forward, for the Cossack wave pushed them, the Cossack, the Turk, and the Tartar. The ditch was soon filled with bodies, blood, and sandbags. At last it was evened, and the enemy rushed over with a shout. The regiments pushed on, one after another. By the light of the cannon fire were to be seen the officers urging forward new regiments to the ramparts. The choicest men rushed to the quarters and troops of Yeremy, for at that point Melnitsky knew the greatest resistance would be. The Kurens of the Sage therefore came up. After them the formidable men of Periaslav, with Loboda. Voronchenko led the regiment of Sherkasi, Kalak the Karvov regiment, Nechai the Bratslav, Stepka the Yuman, Mrozovetsky the Korsan regiment. Also the men of Kalnik went, and the strong regiment of Balatserkov, fifteen thousand men in all, and with them Melnitsky himself, in the fire, red as Satan. Exposing his broad breast to the bullets, with the face of a lion and the eye of an eagle, in chaos, smoke, confusion, slaughter, and tempest, in flames, observant of everything, ordering everything. After the Zaporozhans went the wild Cossacks of the Don, next, Cherks fighting with knives, Tugai Bey led chosen Nogais, after them Subahazi, Belgorod Tartars. Then Kurdluk, swarthy men of Astrakhan, armed with gigantic bows and arrows, one of which was almost equal to a spear. They followed one another so closely that the hot breath of those behind was blown on the necks of those in front. How many of them fell before they reached the ditch filled with the bodies of the captives, who shall tell, who shall relate? But they reached and crossed it, and began to clamber on the ramparts. 
then you would have said that that starry night was the night of the last judgment. The cannon, unable to strike the nearest, bellowed unceasing fire on the farther ranks. Bombs, describing arcs of fire through the air, fell with a hellish laughter, making bright day in the darkness. The German infantry with the Polish land regiments, and at their side the dismounted dragoons of Vishniewetsky poured fire and lead into the faces and breasts of the Cossacks. The first ranks wished to fall back, but pressed from behind they could not, they died in their tracks. Blood spattered under the feet of the advancing. The rampart grew slippery. Hands, feet, and breasts went sliding upon it. Men grasped it, and again fell covered with smoke, black from soot, stabbed, cut, careless of wounds and death. In places they fought with cold weapons. Men were as if beside themselves from fury, with grinning teeth and blood-covered faces. The living battled on top of the quivering mass of wounded and dying. Commands were not heard. Nothing was heard but a general and terrible roar, in which all sounds were merged, the thunder of guns, the cough of the wounded, the groans, and the whistling of bombs. This gigantic struggle without quarter lasted whole hours. Around the rampart rose another rampart of corpses, which hindered the approach of the assailants. The Zaporozhans were cut almost to pieces, the men of Periaslav were lying side by side around the ramparts, the Karvov, Bratslav, and Yuman regiments were decimated. But others pressed on, pushed forward themselves from behind by the guard of the Hetman, the Rumelian Turks and Tartars of Uarum Bay. But disorder rose in the ranks of the assailants when the Polish land infantry, the Germans, and the dragoons drew back not a step. Panting, dripping with blood, carried away with the rage of battle, streaming in sweat, half mad with the smell of blood, they tore over one another at the enemy. Just as raging wolves rushed to a flock of sheep. At that juncture Melnitsky pressed on again with the remnants of his first regiments and with the whole force, as yet intact, of the Balotserkov Tartars, the Turks and Cherks. The cannon from the rampart ceased to thunder, and the bombs to flash, hand weapons alone were heard through the whole length of the western rampart. Discharges flashed up anew. Finally, musketry fire also stopped. Darkness covered the combatants. No I could see what was doing there, but something was turning in the darkness like the gigantic body of a monster cast down in convulsions. Even from the cries it could not be told whether it gave forth the sounds of triumph or despair. At times these sounds also ceased, and then could be heard only one measureless groan, as if it were going out on every side, from under the earth, over the earth, in the air, higher and higher. As if spirits were flying away with groans from that field of conflict. But these were short pauses, after such a moment the uproar and howls rose with still greater power, ever hoarser and more unearthly. Then again thundered the fire of musketry. Machnitsky with the rest of the infantry was coming to aid the wearied regiments. The trumpets began to sound a retreat in the rear ranks of the Cossacks. Now came a pause. The Cossack regiments withdrew a furlong from the ramparts, and stood protected by the corpses of their own men. But a half hour had not passed and Melnitsky rushed on again and hurried his men to the assault a third time. But this time Prince Yeremy appeared on the rampart himself, on horseback. It was easy to know him, for the banner and bunchuk of the hetman were waving above his head, and before and behind him were borne a number of tens of torches, shining with blood-colored gleams. Immediately they opened the artillery on him, but the awkward cannoneers sent the balls far beyond the Nyesna, and he stood calm and gazed upon the approaching clouds. The Cossacks slackened their gait as if bewitched by the sight. Yeremy! Yeremy! passed in a low murmur, like the sound of a breeze, through the deep ranks. Standing on the rampart in the midst of the blood-colored torches, that terrible prince seemed to them like a giant in a myth-tale of the people. Therefore a quiver ran over their wearied limbs, and their hands made signs of the cross. He stood motionless. He beckoned with the gilded baton, and immediately an ominous flight of bombs sounded in the air, and fell into the advancing ranks. The host twisted like a mortally wounded dragon. A cry of terror flew from one end of the line to the other. 
On a run. On a run, commanded the Cossack colonels. The dark mass rushed with all its impetus to the ramparts under which refuge from the bombs could be found. But they had not passed half the interval when the prince, ever visible as on the palm of the hand, turned somewhat to the west and again beckoned with his baton. At this signal, from the side of the pond, through the space between it and the ramparts, the cavalry began to push forth, and in the flash of an eye they poured out on the edge of the shore level. By the light of the bombs were perfectly visible the great banners of the hussars of Skshetuski and Zatsvilikovsky, the dragoons of Kushal and Volodyovsky, with the prince's Tartars. Led by Rostvorovsky. After them pushed out still new regiments of the prince's Cossacks and the Wallachians of Baikovets. Not only Melnitsky, but the last camp follower of the Cossacks, knew in one moment that the daring chief had determined to hurl his entire cavalry into the enemy's flank. That moment the trumpets sounded a retreat in the ranks of the Cossacks. Face to the cavalry. Face to the cavalry, was heard in alarmed voices. Melnitsky endeavored simultaneously to change the front of his troops and defend himself from cavalry with cavalry. But there was no time. Before he could arrange his ranks the prince's regiments had started, moving as if on wings, shouting, Kill! Slay, with rustling of banners, whistling of plumes, and the iron rattle of arms. The hussars thrust their lances into the wall of the enemy, and followed themselves, like a hurricane, overturning and crushing everything on the road. No human power, no command, no leader could hold the infantry on which their first impetus came. Wild panic seized the picked guard of the hetman. The men of Belotserkov threw down their muskets, pikes, scythes, sabres, and shielding their heads with their hands in helplessness of terror, with the roar of beasts. They rushed against the Tartars in the rear. But the Tartars received them with a storm of arrows. So they rushed to the flank, and ran along the tabor under the infantry fire and the cannon of Wurzel, covering the ground so thickly that it was rare when one did not fall upon another. But now the wild Tugai Bey, aided by Subahazi and Uru Mirza, struck with rage on the onrush of hussars. He did not hope to break. He wished merely to restrain them till the Silistrian and Rumelian genissaries might form in a quadrangle and protect the men of Belotserkov from the first panic. He sprang at them as if into smoke, and flew on in the front rank, not as a leader, but as a simple Tartar, he cut and killed, exposed himself with the others. The crooked sabres of the Nogais rang upon chainmail and breastplates, and the howl of the warriors drowned all other voices. But they could not hold out. Pushed from their places, crushed with the terrible weight of the iron horsemen, against whom they were unaccustomed to stand with open front, they were driven toward the genissaries. Hacked with long swords, whirled from their saddles, thrust through, beaten down, twisted like poisonous reptiles. But they defended themselves with such venom that in fact the onset of the hussars was stopped. Tugai Bey rushed like a destroying flame, and the Nogais went with him, as wolves with their female. Still they gave way, falling more frequently on the plain. When the cry of, Allah! Thundering from the field, announced that the genissaries had formed, Skshetuski rushed on the raging Tugai Bey, and struck him on the head with a double-handed sword. But it was evident either that the knight had not regained his whole strength, or perhaps the helmet forged in Damascus withstood the blow. It is enough that the blade turned on the head, and striking with the side was shivered to fragments. But that instant darkness covered the eyes of Tugai Bey. He dropped into the arms of his Nogais, who, seizing their leader, hurried away on two sides with a terrible uproar, like a cloud blown by a mighty wind. All the prince's cavalry was then in front of the Silistrian and Rumelian genissaries and Mohammedanized Serbs, who together with the genissaries formed one great quadrangle. And were withdrawing slowly to the tabor with their front to the enemy, bristling with muskets, lances, javelins, battle axes, and swords. The squadrons of armored dragoons and the Cossacks of the prince rushed on like a whirlwind, and in the very front, with a roar and heavy tramp, Skshetuski's hussars. He flew on himself in the first rank, and at his side Pan Langin on his Livonian mare, his terrible broadsword in his hand. 
a red ribbon of fire flies from one end of the quadrangle to the other. Bullets whistle in the ears of the riders, here and there a man groans, here and there a horse falls. The line of cavalry is broken, but pushes on, is approaching. The Genissaries now hear the snorting and blown breath of the horses, the quadrangle forms more closely still, and inclines its wall of spears, held by sinewy arms, against the furious chargers. How many points are in that wall? With how many deaths does it threaten the knights? Just then a certain hussar of gigantic size rushes upon the wall of the quadrangle with an irresistible impulse. In a moment the four feet of his great horse are in the air, and the knight with his steed falls into the middle of the throng, splintering lances, overturning men, breaking, mashing, destroying. As an eagle swoops on a flock of white partridges, and they, crouching before him in a timid group, become the prey of the robber, who grasps them in his talons and his beak. So Pan Longin Podbipienta, falling into the midst of the enemy, rages with his broadsword. And never has a whirlwind made such destruction in a young and thick forest as he is making in the throng of genissaries. He is terrible, his form assumes superhuman proportions. His mare becomes a species of dragon, snorting flame from her nostrils, and the double-handed sword triples itself in the hands of the knight. Kislerbach, a gigantic aga, hurls himself upon him and falls, cut in two. In vain do the strongest men put forth their hands, stopping him with their spears. They die as if struck by lightning. He tramples them, pushes on to the densest throng, and when he strikes they fall, like grass beneath the scythe. An open space is made. The uproar of terror is heard, groans, the thunder of blows, the biting of steel on the helmets, and the snorting of the infernal mare. A DIV. A DIV, twenty cried terrified voices. That instant the iron mass of the hussars, with Skshetuski at the head of it, bore down the gate opened by the Lithuanian. The walls of the quadrangle burst, like the walls of a falling house, and the masses of genissaries rushed fleeing in every direction. It was not a moment too soon, for the Nogais under Subahazi were returning to the fight like bloodthirsty wolves, and from the other side Melnitsky, rallying the men of Belotserkov, was coming to the aid of the genissaries. But now everything was in confusion. Cossacks, Tartars, renegade Serbs, genissaries, fled in the greatest disorder and panic to the Tabers, giving no resistance. The cavalry pressed on them, cutting as they came. Those who did not perish in the first furlong perished in the second. The pursuit was so envenomed that the squadrons went ahead of the rear ranks of the fugitives, their hands grew weary from hewing. The fugitives threw away arms, banners, caps, and even coats. The white caps of the genissaries covered the field, like snow. The entire chosen force of Melnitsky's infantry, cavalry, artillery, the auxiliary Tartar and Turkish divisions formed one disorderly mass. Distracted, wild, blinded with terror, whole companies fled before one man. The hussars, having broken the infantry and cavalry, had done their work. Now the dragoons and light squadrons emulated them, and with Volodyovsky and Kushal at their head extended this catastrophe, passing human belief. Blood covered the terrible field, and plashed like water under the violent blows of the horse hoofs, sprinkling the armor and faces of the knights. The fleeing crowds were resting in the center of their tabors when the trumpets called back the cavalry of the prince. The knights returned with singing and shouts of joy, counting on the way with their streaming sabers the corpses of the enemy. But who could with a cast of his eye estimate the extent of the defeat? Who could count all when at the trench itself bodies were lying to the height of a man? Soldiers were as if dizzy from the odor of the blood and the sweat. Fortunately from the side of the ponds there was rather a strong breeze, which carried the odor to the tents of the enemy. Thus ended the first meeting of the terrible Yeremy and Melnitsky. But the storm was not ended, for while Vishnievetsky was repulsing the attacks directed against the right wing of the camp, Burlai on the left barely missed becoming master of the ramparts. Having surrounded the town and the castle in silence at the head of his warriors of the trans Dnieper, he pushed on to the eastern pond, and fell violently upon Furlii's quarters. 
The Hungarian infantry stationed there were unable to withstand the attack, for the ramparts at that pond were not yet completed, the first squadron fled from its banner. Burlai sprang to the center, and after him his men, like an irresistible torrent. The shouts of victory reached the opposite end of the camp. The Cossacks, rushing after the fugitive Hungarians, scattered a small division of cavalry, captured a number of cannon, and were coming to the quarters of the Castellan of Belsk. When Pan Shiemski at the head of a number of German companies hurried to the rescue. Stabbing the flag-bearer with a single thrust, he seized the flag, and hurled himself on the enemy. Then the Germans closed with the Cossacks. A fearful hand-to-hand -hand struggle raged, in which on one side the fury and crushing numbers of Burleigh's legions, on the other the bravery of the old lions of the Thirty Years' War, were contending for superiority. In vain Burleigh pressed into the densest ranks of the combatants, like a wounded wild boar. Neither the contempt of death with which the Cossacks fought nor their endurance could stop the irresistible Germans, who going forward in a wall, struck with such force that they swept them out of their places, pushed them against the trenches, decimated them, and after half an hour's struggle drove them beyond the ramparts. Shiemski, covered with blood, first planted the banner on the unfinished bulwark. Burleigh's position was now desperate, he had to retreat on the same road by which he had come. And since Jeremy had crushed the assailants on his right wing, he could easily cut off Burleigh's whole division. It is true that Mrozovetsky had come to his aid with his mounted Cossacks of Korsen. But at that moment the hussars of Konyetspolsky, supported by Skshetuski returning from the attack on the Genissaries, fell upon Burlai, hitherto retreating in order. With a single onset they scattered his forces, and then began a fearful slaughter. The Cossacks, having the road to the camp closed, had opened to them only the road to death. Some without asking for quarter defended themselves with desperation, in groups or singly, others stretched forth their hands in vain to the cavalry, thundering like a hurricane over the field. Then began pursuit, artifice, single struggles, search for the enemy hidden in holes or uneven places. Tar buckets were now thrown out from the trenches to light up the field. These flew like fiery meteors with flaming manes. By the aid of these red gleams they finished the remainder of the Transnieper Cossacks. Subahazi, who had shown wonders of valor that day, sprang to the aid of the Cossacks, but the brave Merik Sobieski, starosta of Krasnostav, stopped him on the spot, as a lion stops a wild buffalo. Burlai saw now that there was no salvation for him from any side. But, Burlai, thou didst love thy Cossack glory beyond life, therefore thou didst not seek for safety. Others escaped in the darkness, hid themselves in openings, slipped out between the feet of horses, but he still sought the enemy. He cut down with his own hand Pan Domka and Pan Rizitsky, and the young lion Pan Aksak, the same who had covered himself with undying glory at Konstantinov, then Pan Savitsky. Then he stretched out together two winged hussars upon their native earth. At last, seeing a noble enormous in size coursing over the field and roaring like an aurochs, he sprang forward and went at him like a glittering flame. Zagloba, for it was he, bellowed still louder from fear, and turned his horse in flight. What hair he had left stood straight on his head, but still he did not lose his presence of mind. Stratagems were flashing through his head like lightning, and at the same time he roared with all his power, whoever believes in God and he drove like a whirlwind toward the thickest mass of Polish cavalry. Burlai was heading him off from the side, as a bow the string. Zagloba closed his eyes, and in his head a voice was roaring, I shall perish now with my fleas. He heard behind him the rushing of the horse, saw that no one was coming to his aid, that there was no escape, and that no other hand but his own could tear him from the grasp of Burlai. But in that last moment, almost in the agony of death, his despair and terror suddenly turned to rage. He bellowed as no wild bull has ever bellowed, and wheeling his horse in his tracks, turned against his opponent. You are pursuing Zagloba, cried he, pushing on with drawn saber. At that moment a new lot of burning tar buckets was thrown from the trenches, and there was light. Burlai saw and was astounded. 
He was not astounded at hearing the name, for he had never heard it in his life before. But he was astounded when he recognized the man whom a short time before he had feasted in Yampol as the friend of Bogan. But just that unfortunate moment of surprise destroyed the brave leader of the Cossacks, for before he recollected himself Zagloba cut him on the temple, and with one blow rolled him from his horse. This was in view of the whole army. A joyful shout from the hussars answered a cry of terror from the Cossacks, who seeing the death of their old lion of the Black Sea, lost the rest of their courage, and abandoned all resistance. Those who were not rescued by Subahazi perished to a man, no prisoners were taken in that night of terror. Subahazi fled to the camp, pursued by Sobieski in the light cavalry. The assault along the whole line of trenches was repulsed, only near the Cossack Tabor was the cavalry sent out by the prince in pursuit still at work. A shout of triumph and joy shook the whole camp of the attacked, and mighty cries went up to heaven. The bloody soldiers, covered with sweat, dust, black from powder, with raging faces and brows still contracted, with fire still unquenched in their eyes, stood leaning on their weapons. Catching the air with their breasts, ready again to rush to the fight if the need should come. But the cavalry too returned gradually from the bloody harvest near the Tabor. Then the prince himself rode out on the field, and behind him the commanders, the standard bearer, Marek Sobieski, and Shiemski. All that brilliant retinue moved slowly along the entrenchment. Long live Yeremy, cried out the army. Long live our father. The prince, without helmet, inclined his head and his baton on every side. I thank you, gentlemen, I thank you. Repeated he, in a clear, ringing voice. Then he turned to Shiemski. This trench, said he, encloses too much space. Shiemski nodded his head in sign of agreement. The victorious leaders rode from the western to the eastern pond, examining the battlefield, the injuries done to the ramparts by the enemy, and the ramparts themselves. Immediately after the retinue of the prince, the soldiers, carried away by enthusiasm, bore Zagloba in their arms to the camp, as the greatest conqueror of the day. Borne aloft by twenty sturdy arms, appeared the form of the warrior, who, purple, sweating, waving his arms to keep his balance, cried with all his power. Ha! I gave him pepper. I pretended to flee, so as to lure him on. He won't bark at us any more, the dog brother. It was necessary to show an example to the younger men. For God's sake, be careful, or you will let me fall and kill me. Hold on tight, you have something to hold. You may believe me, I had work with him. Today every trash was thrusting itself on nobles. But they have got their own. Be careful. Devil take it, let me down. Long life to him, long life, cried the nobles. To the prince with him, repeated others. Long life to him. Long life to him. The Zaporojan hetman, rushing into his camp, roared like a wounded wild beast, he tore the coat on his breast and disfigured his face. The officers who had escaped the defeat surrounded him in gloomy silence, without bringing a word of consolation, and madness almost carried him away. Foam was on his lips. He drove his heels into the ground, and with both hands tore his hair. Where are my regiments, where are my heroes, asked he, in a hoarse voice. What shall I tell the Khan, what took I bay? Give me Yeremy. Let them put my head on the stake. The officers were gloomily silent. Why have the soothsayers promised victory? Off with the heads of the witches. Why have they said that I should get Yeremy? Generally when the roar of that lion shook the camp the colonels were silent. But now that the lion was conquered, trampled, and fortune seemed to be forsaking him, defeat gave insolence to the officers. You cannot withstand Yeremy, muttered Stepka. You are destroying us and yourself, added Mrozovetsky. The hetman sprang at them like a tiger. And who gained Jalti Avodi, who Korsen, who Palavtsi? You! answered Vorenchenko, roughly, but Vishnyavetsky was not there. Melnitsky tore his hair. I promised the Khan lodgings in the castle tonight, 
howled he, in despair. To this Kalak replied, What you promised the Khan concerns your head. Have a care lest it drop from your neck, but do not push us to the storm, do not destroy servants of God. Surround the poles with trenches, put ramparts round your guns, or woe to you. Woe to you, repeated gloomy voices. Woe to you, answered Melnitsky. And thus they conversed, terrible as thunders. At last Melnitsky staggered, and threw himself on a bundle of sheepskins covered with carpet in the corner of the tent. The colonels stood around him with hanging heads, and silence lasted for a long time. At length the hetman looked up, and cried hoarsely, Gorelka! You will not drink! said Vygovsky, the Khan will send for you. At that time the Khan was about five miles from the field of battle, without knowledge of what was passing. The night was calm and warm. He was sitting at the tent in the midst of mullahs and agas in expectation of news, while waiting, he was eating dates from a silver plate standing near. At times he looked at the starry heavens and muttered, Muhammad Rosella. Meanwhile Subahazi, on a foaming horse, rushed in, breathless, and covered with blood. He sprang from the saddle, and approaching quickly, began to make obeisance, waiting for a question. Speak, said the Khan, with his mouth full of dates. The words were burning Subahazi's mouth like flame, but he dared to not speak without the usual titles. He began therefore in the following fashion, bowing continually. Most mighty Khan of all the hordes, grandson of Muhammad, absolute monarch, wise lord, fortunate lord. Lord of the tree commended from the east to the west, lord of the blooming tree. Here the Khan waved his hand and interrupted. Seeing blood on Subahazi's face, and in his eyes pain, sorrow, and despair, he spat out the uneaten dates on his hand and gave them to one of the mullahs who took them as a mark of extraordinary honor and began to eat them. The Khan said. Speak quickly, Subahazi, and wisely. Is the camp of the unbeliever taken? God did not give it. The Poles? Victorious. Melnitsky? Beaten. Tugai Bay? Wounded. God is one, said the Khan. How many of the faithful have gone to paradise? Subahazi raised his arm and pointed with a bloody hand to the sparkling heavens. As many as of those lights at the foot of Allah, said he, solemnly. The heavy face of the Khan became purple, rage seized him by the breast. Where is that dog, inquired he, who promised that I should sleep tonight in the castle? Where is that venomous serpent whom God will trample under my foot? Let him stand before me and give an account of his disgusting promises. A number of Mirzas hurried off for Melnitsky. The Khan calmed himself by degrees, and at last said, God is one. Then he turned to Subahazi. There is blood on thy face. It is the blood of the unbeliever, answered the warrior. Tell how you shed it, and console our ears with the bravery of the believers. Here Subahazi began to give an extended account of the whole battle, praising the bravery of Tugai Bey, of Galga, of Nureddin. He was not silent either of Melnitsky, but praised him as well as the others, the will of God alone and the fury of the unbelievers were the causes of the defeat. But one circumstance struck the Khan in the narrative. Namely, that they did not fire at the Tartars in the beginning of the battle, and that the cavalry of the prince attacked them only when at last they stood in the way. Allah! They did not want war with me, said the Khan but now it is too late. So it was in reality. Prince Yeremy, from the beginning of the battle, had forbidden to fire at the Tartars, wishing to instill into the soldiers that negotiations with the Khan were already commenced. And that the hordes were standing on the side of the mob merely for show. It was only later that it came to meeting the Tartars by the force of events. The Khan shook his head, thinking at that moment whether it would not be better yet to turn his arms against Melnitsky, when the hetman himself stood suddenly before him. Melnitsky was now calm, and came up with head erect, looking boldly into the eyes of the Khan, on his face were depicted daring and craft. Approach, traitor, said the Khan. The hetman of the Cossacks approaches, and he is not a traitor, 
but a faithful ally, to whom you have pledged assistance not in victory alone, said Melnitsky. Go pass the night in the castle. Go pull the poles out of the trenches as you promised me. Great Khan of all the hordes, said Melnitsky, with a powerful voice, you are mighty, and accept the Sultan the mightiest on earth. You are wise and powerful, but can you send forth an arrow from your bow to the stars, or can you measure the depth of the sea? The Khan looked at him with astonishment. You cannot, continued Melnitsky, with still more force, so can I not measure all the pride and insolence of Yeremy. If I could dream that he would not be terrified at you, O Khan, that he would not be submissive at sight of you, would not beat with his forehead before you. But would raise his insolent hand against your person, shed the blood of your warriors, and insult you, O mighty monarch, as well as the least of your mirzas, if I could have dared to think that. I should have shown contempt to you whom I honor and love. Allah, said the Khan, more and more astonished. But I will tell you this, continued Melnitsky, with increasing assurance in his voice and his manner, you are great and powerful. Nations and monarchs from the east to the west incline before you and call you a lion, Yeremy alone does not fall on his face before your beard. If then you do not rub him out, if you do not bend his neck and ride on his back, your power is in vain, your glory is empty. For they will say that one Polish prince has dishonored the Tsar of the Crimea and received no punishment, that he is greater, that he is mightier than you. Dull silence followed. The Mirzas, the Agas, and the Mullahs looked on the face of the Khan, as on the sun, holding the breath in their breasts. He had his eyes closed, and was thinking. Melnitsky was resting on his baton and waiting confidently. You have said it, answered the Khan at last. I will bend the neck of Yeremy. I will sit on his back as on a horse, so it may not be said from the east to the west that an unbelieving dog has disgraced me. God is great, cried the Mirzas, with one voice. Joy shot from the eyes of Melnitsky. At one step he had averted destruction hanging over his head, and turned a doubtful ally into a most faithful one. At every moment that lion knew how to turn himself into a serpent. Both camps till late at night were as active as bees warmed by the spring sun in the swarming season. While on the battlefield slept, an endless and eternal sleep, the knights thrust through with spears, cut with swords, pierced with arrows and bullets. The moon rose, and began her course over the field of death, was reflected in pools of stiffened blood, brought forth from the darkness every moment new piles of slain, passed from some bodies. Came quietly to others, looked into open and lifeless eyeballs, lighted up blue faces, fragments of broken weapons, bodies of horses. And her rays grew pale, at times very pale, as if terrified with what they saw. Along the field there ran here and there, alone and in little groups, certain ominous figures, camp followers and servants, who had come to plunder the slain, as jackals follow lions. But superstitious fear drove them away at last. There was something awful and mysterious in that field covered with corpses, in that calmness and quiet of human forms recently alive, and in that silent harmony with which Poles, Turks, Tartars and Cossacks lay side by side. The wind at times rustled in the bushes growing over the field, and to the soldiers watching in the trenches it seemed that those were the souls of the slain, circling above their bodies. It was said in fact that when midnight had struck in Zbaraj, over the whole field, from the bulwark of the poles to the tabor of the Cossacks, there rose with a rustle as it were a countless flock of birds. Wailing voices were heard also in the air enormous sighs, which made men's hair stand on end, and groans. Those who were yet to fall in that struggle, and whose ears were more open to cries from beyond the earth, heard clearly the Polish spirits, when flying away, cry, before thy eyes, O Lord. We lay down our sins. And the Cossacks groan, O Christ, O Christ, have mercy on us. As they had fallen in a war of brothers, they could not fly straight to light eternal, but were predestined to fly somewhere in the dark distance, and hover in the wind over this veil of tears. To weep and groan by night, till the full remission of their offenses, till they should receive pardon at the feet of Christ, and oblivion for their sins. 
But at that time the hearts of men grew harder yet, and no angel of peace flew over the field. Chapter 58 Next morning, before the sun had scattered its golden rays over the sky, a new protecting rampart encircled the Polish camp. The old ramparts included too much space. Defense and the giving of mutual assistance were difficult within them. The prince and Pan Shiemski, in view of this, decided to enclose the troops within narrower entrenchments. They worked vigorously, the hussars as well as all the other regiments, and the camp servants. Only at three o'clock in the morning did sleep close the eyes of the wearied knights, but at that hour all save the guards were sleeping like stones. The enemy labored also, and then was quiet for a long time, after the recent defeat. No assault was looked for that day. Skshetuski, Pan Longin, and Zagloba sat in their tent drinking beer, thickened with bits of cheese. And talked of the labors of the past night with that satisfaction peculiar to soldiers after victory. It is my habit to lie down about the evening milking, and rise with the dawn, as did the ancients, said Zagloba, but in war it is difficult. You sleep when you can, and you rise when they wake you. I am vexed that we must incommode ourselves for such rubbish, but it cannot be helped, such are the times. We paid them well yesterday. If they get such a feast a couple of times more, they won't want to wake us. Do you know whether many of ours have fallen? asked Podbipienta. Oh, not many, more of the assailants always fall. You are not so experienced in this as I am, for you have not been through so many wars. We old soldiers have no need to count bodies, we can estimate the number from the battle itself. I shall learn from you, gentlemen, said Pan Longin, with amiability. Yes, if you have wit enough, but I haven't much hope of that. Oh, give us peace, said Skshetuski. This is not Podbipienta's first war. God grant the foremost knights to act as he did yesterday. I did what I could, said the Lithuanian, not what I wanted. Still your action was not bad, said Zagloba, patronizingly, and that other surpassed you, here he began to curl his mustaches, is not your fault. The Lithuanian listened with downcast eyes and sighed, thinking of his ancestor Stavico and the three heads. At that moment the tent door opened and Pan Michael entered quickly, glad as a goldfinch on a bright morning. Well, we are here, said Zagloba, give him some beer. The little knight pressed the hands of his three comrades, and said, you should see how many balls are lying on the square, it passes imagination. You can't pass without hitting one. I saw that too, said Zagloba, for when I rose I walked a little through the camp. All the hens in the province of Lvov won't lay so many eggs in two years. Oh, I only wish they were eggs. Then we should have them fried, and you must know, gentlemen, that I consider a plate of fried eggs the greatest delicacy. I am a born soldier, and so are you. I eat willingly what is good, if there is only enough of it. On this account too I am more eager for battle than the pampered youngsters of today who can't eat anything unusual without getting the gripes. But you scored a success yesterday with Berlai, said Volodyovsky. To cut down Berlai in that fashion. As I live I did not expect that of you, and he was a warrior famous throughout the Ukraine and Turkey. Pretty good work, wasn't it? asked Zagloba, with satisfaction. It's not my first, it's not my first, Pan Michael. I see we were all looking for poppy seed in the bottom of the bushel. But we have found four, and such another four you could not find in the whole commonwealth. If I should go with you, gentlemen, and with our prince at the head, we could reach even Stambul. Just think. Skshetuski killed Berdabut, and yesterday Tugai Bey. Tugai Bey is not killed, interrupted the colonel. I felt that the saber was turning in my hand, then they separated us. All one, don't interrupt me, Pan Yen. Pan Michael cut up Bogan at Warsaw, as we have said. It is better not to mention that, interrupted the Lithuanian. What is said is said, answered Zagloba, though I should prefer not to mention it. But I go further, here is Pan Podbipienta from Mishikishki, who finished Pulian, and I Berlai. I will not hide from you, however, 
that I would give all these for Burlai alone, and this perhaps because I had terrible work with him. He was a devil, not a Cossack. If I had sons like him legitimately born, should leave them a splendid name. I am only curious to know what His Majesty the King and the Diet will say when they reward us, who live more on brimstone and salt petri than anything else. There was a knight greater than all of us, said Pan Longin, and no one knows his name or mentions it. I should like to know who he was, one of the ancients, asked Zagloba, offended. No. He was that man, brother, who at Tshtsiana brought the King Gustavus Adolphus to the ground with his horse, and took him prisoner. I heard it was at Putsek, interrupted Volodyovsky. But the king tore away from him, and escaped, said Skshatuski. He did, said Zagloba, closing his eyes. I know something about that matter, for I was then under Konyatsbalski, father of the standard-bearer. Modesty did not permit that knight to mention his own name, therefore no one knows it. And believe me, Gustavus Adolphus was a great warrior, almost equal to Burlai, but in the hand-to-hand -hand conflict with Burlai I had heavier work. It is I who tell you this. That means that you overthrew Gustavus Adolphus, said Volodyovsky. Have I boasted of it, Pan Michael? Then let it remain unremembered. I have something to boast of today. No need of bringing up old times. This horrid beer rattles terribly in the stomach, and the more cheese there is in it the worse it rattles. I prefer wine, though God be praised for what we have. Soon perhaps we shall not have even the beer. The priest Jabkovsky tells me that we are likely to have short rations, and he is all the more troubled, for he has a belly as big as a barn. He is a rare Bernardine, with whom I have fallen desperately in love. There is more of the soldier than the monk in him. If he should hit a man on the snout, then you might order his coffin on the spot. But, said Volodyovsky, I have not told you how handsomely the priest Yaskalsky acted last night. He fixed himself in that corner of the tower at the right side of the castle, and looked at the fight. You must know that he is a wonderfully good shot. Said he to Jabkovsky, I won't shoot Cossacks, for they are Christians after all, though their deeds are disgusting to the Lord, but Tartars, said he, I cannot stand. And so he peppered away at the Tartars, and he spoiled about a score and a half of them during the battle. I wish all priests were like him, sighed Zagloba. But our Mukovetsky only raises his hands to heaven and weeps because so much Christian blood is flowing. But give us peace, said Skshatuski, earnestly. Mukovetsky is a holy man, and you have the best proof of it in this, that though he is not the senior of these two, they bow down before his worthiness. Not only do I not deny his holiness, retorted Zagloba, but I suppose he would be able to convert the Khan himself. Oh, gentlemen, his majesty the Khan must be so mad that the lice on him are standing on their heads from fright. If we have negotiations with the Khan, I will go with the commissioners. The Khan and I are old acquaintances. Once he took a great fancy to me. Perhaps he will remember me now. They will surely choose Yanitsky to negotiate, said Skshatuski, for he speaks Tartar as well as Polish. Ah, it is disgusting to hear him, said Pan Longin, dropping his eyes. And so do I. The Mirzas and I are as well acquainted as white-faced horses. They wanted to give me their daughters when I was in the Crimea so as to have beautiful grandchildren, as I was young in those days, and had made no pacta conventa with my innocence like Podbipienta. I played many a prank. And you repeat the same thing like a trained starling. It is clear that the Bidvinians are not well acquainted with human speech yet. Further conversation was interrupted by a noise beyond the tent. The knights went out therefore to see what was going on. A multitude of soldiers were on the ramparts looking at the place roundabout, which during the night had changed considerably and was still changing before their eyes. The Cossacks had not been idle since the last assault, they had made a breastwork and placed cannon in it, longer and carrying farther than any in the Polish camp. They had begun traverses, zigzags, and approaches. From a distance these embankments looked like thousands of gigantic molehills, the whole slope of the field was covered with them. 
The freshly dug earth lay black everywhere in the grass, and every place was swarming with men at work. The red caps of the Cossacks were glittering on the front ramparts. The prince stood on the works with Sobieski and Shiemski. A little below, Furlay was surveying the Cossack works through a field glass, and said to Ostrog. The enemy are beginning a regular siege. I see we must abandon defense in the trenches and go to the castle. Prince Yeremy heard these words, and said, bending from above to the castellan, God keep us from that, for we should be going of our own choice into a trap. Here is the place for us to live or die. That's my opinion too, even if I had to kill a burli every day, put in Zagloba. I protest in the name of the whole army against the opinion of the castellan of Belsk. This matter does not pertain to you, said the prince. Quiet. Whispered Volodyovsky, jerking him by the sleeve. We will exterminate them in those hiding places like so many moles, said Zagloba, and I beg your serene highness to let me go out with the first sally. They know me already, and they will know me better. With a sally, said the prince, and wrinkled his brow. Wait a minute. The nights are dark in the beginning now. Here he turned to Sobieski, Shiemski, and the commanders, and said, I ask you, gentlemen, to come to council. He left the entrenchment, and all the officers followed him. For the love of God, what are you doing? asked Volodyovsky, what does this mean? Why, you don't know service and discipline, that you interfere in the conversation of your superiors. The prince is a mild-mannered man, but in time of war there is no joking with him. Oh, that is nothing, Pan Michael. Konyatspolsky, the father, was a fierce lion, and he depended greatly on my counsels, and may the wolves eat me up today, if it was not for that reason that he defeated Gustavus Adolphus twice. I know how to talk with magnates. Didn't you see now how the prince was astonished when I advised him to make a sally? If God gives a victory, whose service will it be, whose? Will it be yours? At that moment Zatsvilikovsky came up. What's this? They are rooting and rooting, like so many pigs, said he, pointing to the field. I wish they were pigs, said Zagloba. Pork sausage would be cheap, but their carrion is not fit for dogs. Today the soldiers had to dig a well in Furly Eyes quarters, for the water in the eastern pond was spoiled from the bodies. Toward morning the bile burst in the dog brothers, and they all floated. Now next Friday we cannot use fish, because the fish have eaten their flesh. True, said Zatsvilikovsky. I am an old soldier, but I have not seen so many bodies, unless at Kodim, at the assault of the Genissaries on our camp. You will see more of them yet, I tell you. I think that this evening, or before evening, they will move to the storm again. But I say they will leave us in peace till tomorrow. Scarcely had Zagloba finished speaking, when long white puffs of smoke blossomed out on the breastwork, and balls flew over the entrenchment. There, exclaimed Zatsvilikovsky. Oh, they know nothing of military art, said Zagloba. Old Zatsvilikovsky was right. Melnitsky had began a regular siege. He had closed all roads and escapes, had taken away the pasture, made approaches and breastworks, had dug zigzags near the camp, but had not abandoned assaults. He had resolved to give no rest to the besieged, to harass, to frighten, to keep them in continual sleeplessness, and press upon them till their arms should fall from their stiffened hands. In the evening, therefore, he struck upon the quarters of Vishnievetsky, with no better result than the day before, especially since the Cossacks did not advance with such alacrity. Next day firing did not cease for an instant. The zigzags were already so near that musketry fire reached the ramparts, the earthworks smoked like little volcanoes from morning till evening. It was not a general battle, but a continual fusillade. The besieged rushed out sometimes from the ramparts, then sabers, flails, scythes, and lances met in the conflict. But scarcely had a few Cossacks fallen in the ranks, when the gaps were immediately filled with new men. The soldiers had no rest for even a moment during the whole day. And when the desired sunset came, a new general assault was begun. 
a sally was not to be thought of. On the night of the 16th of July two valiant colonels, Gladke and Nababa, struck upon the quarters of the prince, and suffered a terrible defeat. Three thousand of the best Cossacks lay on the field, the rest, pursued by Sobieski, escaped to the Tabor, throwing down their arms and powder horns. An equally unfortunate result met Fedorenko, who, taking advantage of the thick fog, barely failed to capture the town at daybreak. Pan Korf repulsed him at the head of the Germans. Then Sobieski and Konietzbalski cut the fugitives almost to pieces. But this was nothing in comparison with the awful attack of July 19. On the previous night the Cossacks had raised in front of Vishnevetsky's quarters a lofty embankment, from which guns of large caliber vomited an uninterrupted fire. When the day had closed, and the first stars were in the sky, tens of thousands of men rushed to the attack. At the same time appeared some scores of terrible machines, like towers, which rolled slowly to the entrenchment. At their sides rose bridges, like monstrous wings, which were to be thrown over the ditches, and their tops were smoking, blazing, and roaring with discharges of small cannon, guns, and muskets. These towers moved on among the swarm of heads like giant commanders, now reddening in the fire of guns, now disappearing in smoke and darkness. The soldiers pointed them out to one another from a distance, whispering, those are the traveling towers. We are the men that Melnitsky is going to grind with those windmills. See how they roll, with a noise like thunder. At them from the cannon. At them from the cannon, cried some. In fact the prince's gunners sent ball after ball, bomb after bomb, at those terrible machines. But since they were visible only when the discharges lighted the darkness, the balls missed them most of the time. Meanwhile the dense mass of Cossacks drew nearer and nearer, like a black wave flowing in the night from the distant expanse of the sea. U.F. said Zagloba, in the cavalry near Skshetuski, I am hot as never before in my life. The night is so sultry that there is not a dry thread on me. The devils invented those machines. God grant the ground to open under them, for those ruffians are like a bone in my throat, amen. We can neither eat nor sleep. Dogs are in a better condition of life than we. U.F. How hot! It was really oppressive and sultry, besides, the air was saturated with exhalations from bodies decaying for several days over the whole field. The sky was covered with a black and low veil of clouds. A storm or tempest was hanging over Zbaraj. Sweat covered the bodies of soldiers under arms, and their breasts were panting from exertion. At that moment drums began to grumble in the darkness. They will attack immediately, said Skshetuski. Do you hear the drum? Yes. I wish the devils would drum them. It is pure desperation. Cut! Cut! roared the crowds, rushing to the ramparts. The battle raged along the whole length of the rampart. They struck at the same time on Vishnevetsky, Lanskaronsky, Furlay, and Ostrog, so that one could not give aid to the other. The Cossacks, excited with Gorelka, went still more ragingly than during the previous assaults, but they met a still more valiant resistance. The heroic spirit of their leader gave life to the soldiers. The terrible quarter infantry, formed of Mazovians, fought with the Cossacks, so that they became thoroughly intermingled with them. They fought with gunstocks, fists, and teeth. Under the blows of the stubborn Mazovians several hundred of the splendid Zaporozhian infantry fell. The battle grew more and more desperate along the whole line. The musket barrels burned the hands of the soldiers, breath failed them. The voices of the commanders died in their throats from shouting. Sobieski and Skshetuski fell with their cavalry upon the Cossack flank, trampling whole regiments. Hour followed hour, but the assault relaxed not, for Melnitsky filled the great gaps of the Cossack ranks, in the twinkle of an eye, with new men. The Tartars increased the uproar, at the same time sending clouds of arrows on the defending soldiers, men from behind drove the mob to the assault with clubs and rawhide whips. Rage contended with rage, breast struck breast, man closed with man in the grip of death. 
They struggled, as the raging waves of the sea struggle with an island cliff. Suddenly the earth trembled. The whole heavens were in blue flames, as if God could no longer witness the horrors of men. An awful crash silenced the shouts of combatants and the roar of cannon. The artillery of heaven then began its more awful discharges. Thunders rolled on every side, from the east to the west. It seemed as though the sky had burst, together with the cloud, and was rolling on to the heads of the combatants. At moments the whole world seemed like one flame. At moments all were blind in the darkness, and again ruddy zigzags of lightning rent the black veil. A whirlwind struck once and again, tore away thousands of caps, streamers, and flags, and swept them in the twinkle of an eye over the battlefield. Thunders began to roll, one after another. Then followed a chaos of peals, flashes, whirlwind, fire, and darkness, the heavens were as mad as the men. The unheard of tempest raged over the town, the castle, the trenches, and the tabor. The battle was stopped. At last the floodgates of heaven were open, and not streams, but rivers of rain poured down upon the earth. The deluge hid the light, nothing could be seen a step in advance. Bodies were swimming in the ditch. The Cossack regiments, abandoning the assault, fled one after the other to the Tabor. Going at random, they stumbled against one another, and thinking that the enemy was pursuing, scattered in the darkness. Guns and ammunition wagons followed them, sticking and getting overturned on the way. Water washed down the Cossack earthworks, roared in the ditches and zigzags, filled the covered places, though provided with ditches, and ran roaring over the plain as if pursuing the Cossacks. The rain increased every moment. The infantry in the trenches left the ramparts, seeking shelter under the tents. But for the cavalry of Sobieski and Skshetuski there came no order to withdraw. They stood one by the other as if in a lake, and shook the water from their shoulders. The tempest began gradually to slacken. After midnight the rain stopped entirely. Through the rents in the clouds here and there the stars glittered. Still an hour passed, and the water had fallen a little. Then before Skshetuski's squadron appeared the prince himself unexpectedly. Gentlemen, inquired he, your pouches are not wet? Dry, serene prince, answered Skshetuski. That's right. Dismount for me, advance through the water to those machines, put powder to them and fire them. Go quietly. Sobieski will go with you. According to orders, replied Skshetuski. The prince now caught sight of the drenched Zagloba. You asked to go out on a sally, go now with these, said he. Ah, devil, here is an overcoat for you, muttered Zagloba. This is all that was wanting. Half an hour later, two divisions of knights, two hundred and fifty men, wading to their waists in the water with sabres in hand, hastened to those terrible moving towers of the Cossacks. Standing about half a furlong from the trench. One division was led by that, Lion of Lions, Marek Sobieski, Starosta of Krasnostav, who would not hear of remaining in the trench, the other by Skshetuski. Attendants followed the knights with buckets of tar, torches, and powder. They went as quietly as wolves stealing in the dark night to a sheepfold. Volodyovsky went, as a volunteer with Skshetuski, for Pan Michael loved such expeditions more than life. He tripped along through the water, joy in his heart and saber in hand. At his side was Podbipienta, with his drawn sword, conspicuous above all, for he was two heads higher than the tallest. Among them Zagloba pushed on panting, while he muttered with vexation and imitated the words of the prince. You asked to go on a sally, go now with these. All right. A dog wouldn't go to a wedding through such water as this. If ever I advise a sally in such weather may I never drink anything but water while I live. I am not a duck, and my belly isn't a boat. I have always held water in horror, and what kind of water is this in which peasant carrion is steeping? Quiet, said Volodyovsky. Quiet yourself. You are not bigger than a gudgeon, and you know how to swim, it is easy for you. I say even that it is unhandsome on the part of the prince to give me no peace. 
After the killing of Berlai, Zagloba has done enough, let everyone do as much, and let Zagloba have peace, for you will be a pretty looking crowd when he is gone. For God's sake, if I fall into a hole, pull me out by the ears, for I shall fill with water at once. Quiet, said Skshatuski. The Cossacks are sitting in those dark shelters, they will hear you. Where? What do you tell me? They're in those hillocks, under the sods. That is all that was wanting. May the bright lightning smash. Volodyovsky stopped the remaining words by putting his hand on Zagloba's mouth, for the shelters were barely fifty yards distant. The knights went silently indeed, but the water spattered under their feet, happily rain began to fall again, and the patter deadened the noise of their steps. The guards were not at the shelters. Who could have expected a sally after an assault in such a tempest, when the combatants were divided by something like a lake? Volodyovsky and Pan Lungin sprang ahead and reached the shelter first. Volodyovsky let his saber drop, put his hand to his mouth and began to cry, Hey, men! What? Answered from within the voices of Cossacks, evidently convinced that someone from the Cossack Tabor was coming. Glory to God, answered Volodyovsky, let us in. Don't you know the way? I do, replied Volodyovsky, and feeling for the entrance he jumped in. Podbipienta, with a few others, rushed after him. At that moment the interior of the shelter resounded with the terrified shout of men, at the same instant the knights rushed with a shout to the other shelter. In the darkness were heard groans and clash of steel, here and there some dark figures rushed past, others fell on the ground, then came the report of a shot. But all did not last longer than a quarter of an hour. The Cossacks, surprised for the most part while in a deep sleep, did not even defend themselves, and were destroyed before they could seize their weapons. To the marching towers. To the marching towers, cried Sobieski. They hurried to the towers. Fire them from within, for they are wet outside, shouted Skshatuski. But the command was not easy of execution. In these towers built of pine planks there was neither door nor opening. The Cossack gunners mounted them on ladders. The guns, since only those of the smaller caliber could be carried, were drawn up with ropes. The knights therefore ran around the tower some time yet, cutting the planks in vain with their sabers or grasping with their hands on corners. Happily the attendants had axes, they began to cut. Sobieski ordered them to place boxes underneath with powder, prepared on purpose. The buckets with tar, as well as the torches were lighted. And flame began to lick the planks, wet outside but full of pitch within. Before, however, the planks had caught fire or the powder had exploded, Pan Langin bent down and raised an enormous stone, dug out of the ground by the Cossacks. Four of the strongest men could not move it from its place, but he raised it, and only through the light of the tar buckets could it be seen that the blood came to his face. The knights grew dumb with amazement. He is a Hercules. May the bullet strike him, cried they, raising their hands. Pan Longin approached the still unkind lead machine, bent and hurled the stone at the very center of the wall. Those present bent their heads, so loud was the whistle of the stone. The mortises were broken by the blow, a rattle was heard all around, the tower twisted as if broken in two, and fell with a crash. The pile of timber was covered with pitch and fired in a moment. Soon gigantic flames illuminated the whole plain. Rain fell continually. But the fire was too strong, and those moving towers were burning, to the astonishment of both armies, since the night was so wet. Stepka, Kalak, and Rosovetsky hurried from the Cossack Tabor with several thousand men, to quench the fire. Pillars of flame and red smoke shot up toward the sky, with power increasing each moment, and were reflected in the lakes and ponds formed by the tempest on the battlefield. The knights began to return in serried ranks to the rampart. They were greeted even at that distance with shouts of joy. Suddenly Skshatuski looked around, cast his eyes into the heart of the company, and called with a thundering voice, Halt! Pan Longin and the little knight were not among the returning. It was evident that, carried away by ardor, 
they had remained too long at the last tower, and perhaps found Cossacks hidden somewhere, it was enough that, seemingly, they had not noticed the retreat. Return, commanded Skshetuski. Sobieski, at the other end of the line, did not know what had happened and ran to inquire. At that moment the two knights showed themselves as if they had risen out of the earth, halfway between the towers and the other knights. Pan Longin with his gleaming broadsword strode with gigantic steps, and at his side ran Pan Michael on a trot. Both had their heads turned to the Cossacks, who were chasing them like a pack of dogs. By the red light of the flames the whole pursuit was perfectly visible. One would have said that an enormous elk with her young was retreating before a crowd of hunters ready to hurl herself at any moment on the enemy. They will be killed. By the mercy of God, forward, cried Zagloba, in a heartrending voice, they will be shot with arrows or muskets. By the wounds of Christ, forward. And not considering that a new battle might begin in a moment he flew, saber in hand, with Skshetuski and others, to the succor. He thrust, twisted, sprang up, panted, cried, was shaking all over, and rushed on with what legs and breath remained to him. The Cossacks, however, did not fire, for their muskets were wet, and the strings of their bows damp, they only pressed on. Some had pushed to the front and were about to run up, when both knights at bay turned to them and giving an awful shout, raised their sabers on high. The Cossacks halted. Pan Longin, with his immense sword, seemed to them some supernatural being. As two tawny wolves pressed over much by hounds turn and show their white teeth, and the dogs whining at a distance do not dare to rush on, so these turned repeatedly. And each time their pursuers halted. Once only a man, evidently of bolder nature, ran up to them with a scythe in his hand, but Pan Michael sprang at him like a wildcat and bit him to death. The rest waited for their comrades, who were coming on the run in a dense body. But the line of Cossacks came nearer and nearer, and Zagloba flew with his saber over his head, shouting with an unearthly voice, Kill! Slay! Then there was a report from the bulwarks, and a bomb screaming like a screech owl described a red arc in the sky and fell in the dense crowd, after it a second, a third, a tenth. It seemed that battle would begin anew. Till the siege of Zberage, projectiles of that kind were unknown to the Cossacks, and when sober they feared them terribly, seeing in them the sorcery of Yeremy. The crowd therefore stopped for a moment, then broke in two, the bombs burst, scattering death and destruction. Save yourselves! Save yourselves! was shouted in tones of terror. All fled. Pan Longin and Volodyovsky dropped into the saving ranks of the hussars. Zagloba threw himself on the neck of one and the other, and kissed them on the cheeks and eyes. Joy was choking him. But he restrained it, not wishing to show the softness of his heart, and cried. Oh, the ox drivers! I won't say that I love you, but I was alarmed about you. Is that the way you understand service, to lag in the rear? You ought to be dragged behind horses over the square by your feet. I shall be the first to tell the prince, that he may think of a punishment for you. Now we'll go to sleep. Thank God for that too. Those dog brothers were lucky to run away before the bombs, for I should have cut them up like cabbage. I prefer fighting to seeing my friends die. We must have a drink tonight. Thank God for that too. I thought we should have to sing the requiem over you tomorrow. But I am sorry there was no fight, for my hand is itching awfully, though I gave them beans and onions in the shelters. Chapter 59 The Poles had to raise new ramparts to render the earthworks of the Cossacks useless and make defense easier for their own reduced forces. They dug therefore all night after the storm. On this account the Cossacks were not idle. Having approached quietly in the dark night between Thursday and Friday, they threw up a second and much higher wall around the camp. All shouted at dawn, and began to fire at once, and four whole days and nights they continued firing. Much damage was done on both sides, for from both sides the best gunners emulated one another. From time to time masses of Cossacks and the mob rushed to attack, but did not reach the ramparts. 
only the musketry fire became hotter. The enemy, having strong forces, changed the divisions in action, leading some to rest and others to fight. But in the Polish camp there were no men for change. The same persons had to shoot, rush to the defense at any moment under danger of assaults, bury the dead, dig walls, and raise the ramparts for better defense. The besieged slept, or rather dozed, on the ramparts under fire, while balls were flying so thickly that every morning they could be swept from the square. For four days no one removed his clothing. The men got wet in the rain, dry in the sun, were burning in the daytime and chilled at night. During four days not one of them had anything warm in his mouth. They drank gorelka, mixing powder with it for greater strength, they gnawed cakes, and tore with their teeth hard dried meat. And all this in the midst of smoke and fire, the whistling of balls and the thunder of cannon. It was nothing to get struck on the head or body. A soldier tied a nasty bit of cloth around his bloody head and fought on. They were wonderful men, with torn coats, rusty weapons, shattered muskets in their hands, eyes red from sleeplessness. Ever on the alert, ever willing day and night, wet weather or dry, always ready for battle. The soldiers were infatuated with their leader, with danger, with assaults, with wounds and death. A certain heroic exaltation seized their souls, their hearts became haughty, their minds callous. Horror became to them a delight. Different regiments strove for preeminence in enduring hunger, sleeplessness, toil, daring, and fury. This was carried to such a degree that it was difficult to keep the soldiers on the walls. They were breaking out against the enemy as wolves ravenous from hunger against sheep. In all the regiments reigned a kind of wild joy. If a man were to mention surrender, he would be torn to pieces in the twinkle of an eye. We want to die, was repeated by every mouth. Every command of the leader was carried out with lightning rapidity. Once it happened that the prince, in his evening tour of the ramparts, hearing that the fire of the quarter regiment of Leszczynski was weakening, came to the soldiers. And asked, Why don't you fire? Our powder is gone, we have sent to the castle for more. You have it nearer, said the prince, pointing to the enemy's trench. He had scarcely spoken when the whole body sprang from the rampart, rushed to the enemy, and fell like a hurricane on the entrenchment. The Cossacks were clubbed with muskets and stabbed with pikes, four guns were spiked. And after half an hour the soldiers, decimated but victorious, returned with a considerable supply of powder in kegs and hunting horns. Day followed day. The Cossack approaches enclosed the Polish rampart with an ever-narrowing ring, and pushed into it like wedges into a tree. The firing was so close that without counting the assaults ten men a day fell in each battalion, the priests were unable to visit them with the sacrament. The besieged sheltered themselves with wagons, tents, skins, and suspended clothing. In the night they buried the dead wherever they happened to lie. But the living fought the more desperately over the graves of their comrades of the day before. Melnitsky expended the blood of his people unsparingly, but each storm brought him only greater loss. He was astonished himself at the resistance. He counted only on this, that time would weaken the hearts and strength of the besieged. Time did pass, but they showed an increasing contempt for death. The leaders gave the example to their men. Prince Yeremy slept on bare ground at the rampart, drank gorelka, and ate dried horseflesh, suffering changes of weather and toils beyond his lordly position. Konietzbalski and Sobieski led regiments to the sallies in person, in time of assault they exposed themselves without armor in the thickest rain of bullets. Even leaders who, like Osterog, were lacking in military experience, and on whom the soldiers looked with distrust, appeared now, under the hand of Yeremy, to become different men. Old Furley and Lanskaronsky slept also at the ramparts. And Shiemsky put guns in order during the day, and at night dug under the earth like a mole, putting countermines beneath the mines of the enemy, throwing out approaches. Or opening underground roads by which the soldiers came like spirits of death among the sleeping Cossacks. Finally Melnitsky determined to try negotiations, with the idea too that in the mean while he might accomplish something by stratagem. 
On the evening of July 24 the Cossacks began to cry from the trenches to the Poles to stop firing. The Zaporozhans declared that the hetman wanted to see old Zats Vilikovsky. After a short consultation the commanders agreed to the proposition, and the old man went out of the camp. The knight saw from a distance that caps were removed before him in the trenches. For Zats Vilikovsky, during the short period that he was commissioner, succeeded in gaining the goodwill of the wild Zaporozhans, and Melnitsky himself respected him. The firing ceased. The Cossacks with their approaches were close to the ramparts, and the knights went down to them. Both sides were on their guard, but there was nothing unfriendly in those meetings. The nobles had always esteemed the Cossacks more than the common herd, and now, knowing their bravery and endurance in battle, they spoke with them on terms of equality as cavaliers with cavaliers. The Cossacks examined with wonder that impregnable nest of lions which checked all their power and that of the Khan. They began to be friendly, therefore, to talk and complain that so much Christian blood was flowing, finally they treated one another to tobacco and gorelka. All, gentlemen, said the old Zaporozhans, if you had stood up like this always, there would have been no Jaltia Vodi, Korsan, or Palavtsi. You are real devils, not men, such as we have not seen yet in the world. Come tomorrow and the day after, you will always find us the same. We'll come. But thank God now for the breathing spell. A power of Christian blood is flowing, but, anyhow, hunger will conquer you. The king will come before hunger, we have just eaten a hearty meal. If provisions fail us, we will go to your tabers, said Zagloba, with his hand on his hip. God grant Father Zatsvilikovsky to make some agreement with our hetman. If he doesn't, we shall have an assault this evening. We are already tired of waiting for you. The Khan has promised that you'll all get your fate. And our prince has promised the Khan that he will drag him by the beard at his horse's tail. He is a wizard, but he can't do that. Better for you to go with our prince against the pagans than to raise your hands against the authorities. Hum. With your prince. Nice work indeed. Why do you revolt? The king will come. Fear the king. Prince Yeremy was a father to you too. Such a father, as death is mother. The plague has not killed so many brave heroes as he. He will be worse, you don't know him yet. We don't want to know him. Our old men say that whatever Cossack looks him in the eye is given to death. It will be so with Melnitsky. God knows what will be. This is sure, that it is not for them both to live in the white world. Our father says if you would give him up Yeremy he would let you all go free, and bow down to the king with all of us. Here the soldiers began to frown and grit their teeth. Be silent, or we'll draw our sabers. You Poles are angry, but you'll have your fate. And so they conversed, sometimes pleasantly and sometimes with threats, which, in spite of them, burst out like thunder peals. In the afternoon Zatsvilikovsky returned to the camp. There were no negotiations, and a cessation of arms was not obtained. Melnitsky put forth monstrous demands, that the prince and Konyatspolsky should be given up to him. Finally he told over the wrongs of the Zaporozhans, and began to persuade Zatsvilikovsky to remain with him for good, whereupon the old knight was enraged, sprang up, and went away. In the evening followed an assault, which was repulsed with blood. The whole camp was in fire for two hours. The Cossacks were not only hurled from the walls, but the infantry captured the first entrenchment, destroyed the embrasures, the shelters, and burned fourteen moving towers. Melnitsky swore that night to the Khan that he would not withdraw while a man remained alive in the camp. The next day at dawn brought fresh musketry firing, digging under the ramparts, and a battle till evening with flails, scythes, sabers, stones, and clods of earth. The friendly feeling of the day before, and regret at the spilling of Christian blood gave way to still greater obstinacy. Rain began to fall in the morning. That day half rations were issued to the soldiers, at which Zagloba complained greatly, but in general empty stomachs redoubled the rage of the Poles. They swore to fall one after the other, and not to surrender to the last breath. 
The evening brought new assaults from the Cossacks, disguised as Turks, lasting, however, but a short time. A night full of uproar and cries followed, a very quarrelsome night. Firing did not cease for a moment. Both sides challenged each other, they fought in groups and pairs. Pan Longin went out to the skirmish, but no one would stand before him, they merely fired at him from a distance. But Stempovsky covered himself with great glory, and also Volodyovsky, who in single combat killed the famous partisan Dundar. At last Zagloba himself came out, but only to encounters of the tongue. After killing Burlai, said he, I cannot meet every common scrub. But in the encounter of tongues he found no equal among the Cossacks, and he brought them to despair. When covered with a good embankment he cried, as if under the ground, with a stentorian voice. Sit here at Zberaj, you clowns, but the Lithuanian soldiers are going down the Dnieper. They are saluting your wives and young women. Next spring you will find crowds of little Bidvinians in your cottages, if you find the cottages. The Lithuanian army was really descending the Dnieper, under Kadzivil, burning and destroying, leaving only land and water. The Cossacks knowing this fell into a rage, and in answer hailed bullets on Zagloba, as a man shakes pears from a tree. But Zagloba took good care of his head behind the embankment, and cried again. You have missed, you dog spirits, but I didn't miss Burlai. I am alone here, come to a duel with me. You know me. Come on, you clowns. Shoot on while you have a chance, for next winter you'll be taking care of young Tartars in the Crimea, or making dams on the Dnieper. Come on, come on. I'll give a copper for the head of your mel. Give him a whack on the snout from me, from Zagloba, do you hear? Hey! You filthy fools, is it little of your carrion that lies on the field smelling like dead dogs? The plague sends her respects to you. To your forks, to your plows, to your boats, you scurvy villains. It is for you to tug salt and dried cherries against the current of the Dnieper, not to stand in our way. The Cossacks had their laugh too at the Panoi 21 who have one biscuit for three, and they were asked why they did not collect their taxes and tithes. But Zagloba got the upper hand in the disputes. These conversations rattled on, interrupted by curses and wild outbursts of laughter for whole nights, under fire and with more or less fighting. Then Pan Yanitsky went out to negotiate with the Khan, who repeated again that all would meet their fate, till the impatient envoy said, you promised that long ago. But nothing has happened to us yet. Whoever comes for our heads will leave his own. The Khan asked Prince Yeremy to meet his vizier in the field. But that was simply treachery, which was discovered, and the negotiations were finally broken off. All this time there was no intermission in the struggle, assaults in the evening, during the day cannonading and musketry fire, sallies from the ramparts, encounters. Hand-to-hand -hand conflict of battalions, and wild attacks of cavalry. A certain mad desire of fighting, of blood, and danger upheld the soldiers. They went to battle with songs, as if to a wedding. They had indeed become so accustomed to uproar and tumult that those divisions which were detailed to sleep slept soundly under fire, amidst thickly falling bullets. Provisions decreased every day, for the commanders had not supplied the camp sufficiently before the coming of the prince. The price of everything was enormously high, but those who had money and bought bread or gorelka shared it gladly with others. No one cared for the morrow, knowing that one of two things would not miss them, either succor from the king, or death. They were equally ready for either, but more ready for battle. An unheard of case in history, tens meeting thousands with such resistance and such rage that each assault was a new defeat for the Cossacks. Besides, there was no day in which there were not several attacks from the ramparts on the enemy in his own trenches. Those evenings when Melnitsky thought that weariness must overcome the most enduring and was quietly preparing an assault, joyful songs would come to his ears. Then he struck his hands on his legs with wonder, and thought, in truth Yeremy is a greater wizard than any in the Cossack camp. Then he was furious, hurried to the fight, and poured out a sea of blood, for he saw that his star was beginning to pale before the star of the terrible prince. 
In the Tabor they sang songs about Yeremi, or in a low voice related things of him, which made the hair stand on the heads of the Cossacks. They said that he would appear at times in the night on the ramparts, and would grow up before one till his head was higher than the towers of Zberaj. That his eyes were then like two moons, and the sword in his hand like that star of ill omen which God sometimes sends out in the sky for the destruction of men. It was said that when he shouted, the Poles who had fallen in battle rose up with clanking armor and took their places in the ranks with the living. Yeremi was in every mouth, they sang about him, minstrels spoke of him, the old Zaporogians, the ignorant mob, and the Tartars. And in those conversations, in that hatred, in that superstitious terror there was a certain wild love with which that people of the steppes loved their bloody destroyer. Melnitsky paled before him, not only in the eyes of the Khan and the Tartars, but in the eyes of his own people. And he saw that he must take Zberaj, or the spell which he exercised would be dissipated, like darkness before the morning dawn, he must trample that lion, or perish himself. But the lion not only defended himself, but each day he issued more terrible from his lair. Neither stratagem, nor treachery, nor evident preponderance availed. Meanwhile the mob and the Cossacks began to murmur. It was difficult for them to sit in smoke and fire, in a rain of bullets, with the odor of corpses, in rain, in heat, before the face of death. But the valiant Cossacks did not fear toil, nor bad weather, nor storms with fire and blood and death, they feared Urema. Chapter 60 Many a simple knight covered himself with undying glory on that memorable rampart of Zberaj. But the liar will celebrate Pan Lungin Podbipienta among the first, since the greatness of his gifts could be equaled only by his modesty. The night was gloomy, dark, and wet. The soldiers, wearied with watching at the ramparts, dozed, leaning on their weapons. After the recent ten days of firing and assaults, this was the first moment of quiet and rest. From the neighboring trenches of the Cossacks, for they were scarcely thirty yards distant, there were neither cries, curses, nor the usual uproar. It appeared as though the enemy, wishing to weary the Poles, had grown weary themselves. Here and there only glittered the faint light of a fire, covered under a mound. From one place came the sweet, low sound of a lute, on which some Cossack was playing, far away in the Tartar camp the horses neighed. And on the embankments, from time to time, was heard the voice of the guards. The armored cavalry of the prince was on infantry duty that night. Skshetuski, Podbipienta, Volodyovsky, and Zagloba on the bulwark were whispering quietly among themselves. In the intervals of the conversation they listened to the sound of the rain falling into the ditch. This quiet is strange to me, said Skshetuski. My ears are so accustomed to thundering and uproar that silence rings in them, but I hope treachery is not hidden in this silence. Since I am on half rations it is all one to me, muttered Zagloba, gloomily. My courage demands three things, to eat well, to drink well, and to sleep well. The best strap, if not oiled, will grow dry and break, what if, in addition, you soak it in water, like hemp? The rain soaks us, the Cossacks hackle us, and why should not strips fall from us? Beautiful conditions, a biscuit costs a florin, and a measure of vodka five. A dog would not take this foul water in his mouth, for in the wells is the essence of the dead. And I am as thirsty as my boots, which have their mouths open like fish. But your boots drink water without extravagant talk. You might keep your mouth shut, Pan Michael. You are no bigger than a titmouse, you can live on a grain of millet and drink out of a thimble. But I thank God that I am not so delicate, and that a hen did not scratch me out of the sand with her hind legs, but a woman gave me birth. Therefore I must live by eating and drinking, like a man, not like a maybug, and as I have had nothing in my mouth but spittle since yesterday noon, your jokes are not at all to my taste. Here Zagloba began to puff with anger, and Pan Michael put his hand on his side and said. I have in my pocket a flask which I got of a Cossack today. But if a hen scratched me out of the sand, I think Gorelka from such an insignificant person would not be to your taste. Here's to you, Yen, said he, turning to Skshetuski. 
Give it here, said Skshatuski, for the air is cold. Drink to Pan Longin. You are a rogue, Pan Michael, said Zagloba, but you are one in a hundred. You take from yourself and give to others. A blessing on hens that scratch such soldiers from the sand. But there are none such, and I was not thinking of you. Then take it after Podbipienta. I have no wish to offend you. What are you doing? Leave some to me, cried Zagloba in alarm, when he saw the Lithuanian drinking. Why do you throw your head back so far? God grant it to remain in its usual place. You are too long, it is no small task to moisten you. May you burst. I've barely touched it, said Podbipienta, handing him the flask. Zagloba turned over the flask completely, and drank to the bottom. Then he snorted, and said. The only consolation is that if our miseries come to an end, and God lets us take our heads out of these dangers in safety, we'll reward ourselves for all. They will be sure to prepare some loaves for us. The priest Jabkovsky has fine skill in eating, but I'll make a ram's horn of him. And what word of truth have you and Jabkovsky heard today from Mokovetsky? Silence, said Skshatuski, there is someone coming in the square. They were silent. And soon a dark figure stood near them, and asked in a hushed voice, Are you watching? We are, answered Skshatuski, straightening himself. Give careful attention, this calm is of evil augury. The prince passed on to see if sleep had overcome the wearied soldiers anywhere. Pan Longin clasped his hands, what a leader! What a warrior! He takes less rest than we do, said Skshatuski. He examines the whole rampart in this way every night as far as the second pond. God grant him health. Amen. Silence followed. All looked with strained eyes into the darkness, but nothing could be seen. The Cossack trenches were quiet, the last light in them quenched. They might be caught napping now, like Suslik's, muttered Volodyovsky. Who knows, answered Skshatuski. Sleep torments me, said Zagloba, so that my eyes are coming out, and sleep is not permitted. I am curious to know when it will be permitted. Whether there is firing or not, one must stand under arms and nod from weariness, like a Jew on the Sabbath. It's a dog's service. I don't know myself what has got hold of me, whether it's the gorelka, or the irritation from that blow which I with the priest Jebkovsky was forced to endure without reason. How was that? Asked Podbipienta, you began to tell us, and didn't finish. I'll tell you now. Maybe we'll shake off sleep somehow. I went this morning with Jebkovsky to the castle, hoping to come upon something to gnaw. We search and search, look everywhere, find nothing, we return in bad humor. In the yard we meet a Calvinist minister who had been giving the last consolation to Captain Schenberg, a Furley Eyes battalion, who was shot yesterday. I opened on him, haven't you, said I, strolled around about long enough, and displeased the Lord sufficiently? You will draw a curse on us. But he, relying evidently on the protection of the Castellan of Belsk, answered, Our faith is as good as yours, if not better. And he spoke in such a way that we were petrified from horror. But we kept silent. I thought to myself, Jebkovsky is here, let him do the arguing. But my Jebkovsky snorted, and whacked him under the ribs with arguments. He made no answer to this strongest of reasons, for he went spinning around till he was brought up standing against the wall. That moment the prince came in with Mukovetsky and fell upon us. Said that we were making an uproar and disturbance, that it was neither the time nor the place, nor were ours the arguments. They washed our heads for us, as if we had been a couple of boys. I wish they were right, for unless I am a false prophet, these ministers of Furlay will bring misfortune to us yet. And did not that Captain Schenberg renounce his errors? asked Volodyovsky. What, renounce? He died, as he had lived, in abomination. Oh that men should yield up their salvation rather than their stubbornness, sighed Pan Longin. God is defending us against Cossack predominance and witchcraft, continued Zagloba, but these heretics are offending him. 
It is known to you, gentlemen, that yesterday, from this very entrenchment before us, they shot balls of thread into the square. And the soldiers say that immediately on the place where the balls fell the ground was covered with a leprosy. It's a known fact that devils wait on Melnitsky, said the Lithuanian, making the sign of the cross. I saw the witches myself, added Skshatusky, and I'll tell you. Further conversation was stopped by Volodyovsky, who pressed Skshatusky's arm suddenly, and whispered, silence. Then he sprang to the very edge of the rampart, and listened attentively. I hear nothing, said Zagloba. T.S. The rain drowns it, answered Skshatusky. Pan Michael began to beckon with his hand not to interrupt him, and he listened carefully for some time. At last he approached his comrades. They are marching, whispered he. Let the prince know. He has gone to Ostrog's quarters, whispered Pan Yen. We will run to warn the soldiers. Straightway they hurried along the ramparts, stopping from moment to moment and whispering everywhere to the soldiers on guard, they are coming. They are coming. The words flew like silent lightning from mouth to mouth. In a quarter of an hour the prince, already on horseback, was present, and issuing orders to the officers. Since the enemy wished, evidently, to spring into the camp while the Poles were asleep and off guard, the prince enjoined on all to maintain this error. The soldiers were to remain in immovable stillness and let the assaulters come to the very rampart, and when cannon shot was given as a signal, to strike unexpectedly. The soldiers were ready. They dropped the muzzles of their guns, bent forward noiselessly, and deep silence followed. Skshatusky, Pan Langin, and Volodyovsky drew long breaths, side by side. Zagloba stayed near them, for he knew by experience that most balls fell on the square, and that it was safest on the ramparts near three such sabers. They merely drew back a little, that the first onrush might not strike them. Podbipienta knelt somewhat to one side with his double-handed sword. Volodyovsky crouched near Skshatusky, and whispered in his very ear. They are coming, surely. With measured tread. That's not the mob, nor the Tartars. Zaporozhian infantry. Or genissaries, they march well. We could strike them better with cavalry. It is too dark for cavalry tonight. Do you hear them now? T.S. T.S. The camp seemed sunk in deepest sleep. In no place movement, in no place life, everywhere the most profound silence, broken only by the rustle of rain fine as if scattered from a sieve. Gradually, however, there rose in this another rustle, low, but more easily caught by the ear, for it was measured, drawing nearer, growing clearer. At last, a few steps from the ditch, appeared a sort of prolonged dense mass, visible in so far that it was blacker than the darkness, and halted. The soldiers held their breaths. But the little knight punched Skshatusky in the side, as if wishing in this way to show his delight. The assailants reached the ditch, let down their ladders into it, descended on them, and moved toward the rampart. The rampart was as silent as if on it and behind it everything had expired. A silence of the grave succeeded. Here and there, in spite of all the care of the assailants, the ladder round squeaked and trembled. You'll get beans, thought Zagloba. Volodyovsky stopped punching Skshatusky, Pan Langin pressed the hilt of his double-handed sword, and distended his eyes. For he was nearest the edge of the rampart and expected to give the first blow. Three pairs of hands appeared on the outer rim, and grasped it firmly, after them began to rise slowly and carefully three helmet points, higher and higher. Those are Turks, thought Pan Langin. At that moment was heard the awful roar of several thousand muskets, it was clear as day. Before the light had gone out Pan Langin had drawn his weapon and cut terribly, so that the air whined under his sword edge. Three bodies fell into the ditch, three heads in helmets rolled to the knees of the kneeling knight. Then, though hell was raging on earth, heaven opened before Pan Langin. Wings grew from his shoulders, choirs of angels were singing in his breast, and he was as if caught up to heaven, he fought as in a dream, and the blows of his sword were like thanksgiving prayers. 
All the Podbipientas, long since dead, beginning with Stavico, the founder of the line, were rejoicing in heaven that the last surviving, Zervicaptor Podbipienta, was such a man. This assault, in which auxiliary forces of Rumelian and Silistrian Turks, with guards from the Genissaries of the Khan, took a preponderant part, received a more terrible repulse than others. And drew a fearful storm on Melnitsky's head. He had guaranteed in advance that the Poles would fight with less rage against the Turks, and if those companies were given him he would capture the camp. He was obliged therefore to mollify the Khan and the enraged Mirzas, and at the same time win them with presents. He gave the Khan ten thousand thalers. Tugai Bey, Kors Aga, Subahazi, Nureddin, and Galga, two thousand each. Meanwhile the camp servants drew the bodies out of the ditch. In this they were not hindered by firing from the entrenchment. The soldiers rested till morning, for it was certain that the assault would not be repeated. All slept uninterruptedly, except the troops on guard and Podbipienta, who lay, in the form of a cross, all night on his sword, thanking God. Who had permitted him to accomplish his vow and cover himself with such renown that his name had gone from mouth to mouth in the camp and the town. Next morning the prince summoned him, and praised him greatly. And the soldiers came in crowds all day to congratulate him and look at the three heads which the attendants had brought before his tent, and which were already blackening in the air. There was wonder and envy not a little, and some would not believe their eyes, for the heads and the capes of the helmets were cut off as evenly as if someone had cut them with shears. You are an awful tailor, said the nobles. We knew that you were a good knight, but the ancients might envy such a blow, for the best executioner could not give a better. The wind does not take off caps as those heads were taken, said another. All pressed the palms of Pan Langin. But he stood with downcast eyes, sunshiny, sweet, timid as a maiden before marriage, and said as if in explanation, they were in good position. Then they tested the sword. But since it was the double-handed sword of a crusader, no man could move it freely, not excepting even the priest Jebkovsky, though he could break a horseshoe like a reed. Around the tent it grew noisier. And Zagloba, Skshetuski, and Volodyovsky did the honors to the visitors, treating them with stories, for they had nothing else to give them since the last biscuits in the camp had been eaten. They had long had no other meat than dried horse flesh. But valor gave them meat and drink. Toward the end, when the others began to disperse, Marek Sobieski appeared with his lieutenant, Stempovsky. Pan Longin ran out to meet him, the starosta greeted him with thanks, and said, it is a holiday with you? In truth it is a holiday, answered Zagloba, for our friend has fulfilled a vow. Praise be to the Lord God, answered the starosta. Then it is not long, brother, till we may congratulate you on your marriage. And have you anyone in mind? Pan Longin was extremely confused, grew red to his ears, and the starosta continued. I see by your confusion that you have. It is your sacred duty to remember that such a stock should not perish. Then he pressed the hands of Pan Longin, Skshetuski, Zagloba, and the little knight. And they were rejoiced in their hearts to hear praise from such lips, for the starosta of Krasnostav was the mirror of bravery, honor, and every knightly virtue, he was an incarnate Mars. All the gifts of God were richly united in him, for in remarkable beauty he surpassed even his younger brother Yen, who was afterward king. He was equal in fortune and name to the very first, and the great Yeremi himself exalted his military gifts to the skies. He would have been a wonderful star in the heaven of the commonwealth, but that by the disposition of God, the younger, Yen, took his glory to himself. And Merrick vanished before his time in a day of disaster. Hitherto our knights had rejoiced greatly at the praises of this hero, but he did not stop at that, and continued. I have heard much of you from the prince himself, who loves you beyond others. I do not wonder that you serve him without reference to promotion, which comes more readily in the regiments of the king. We are all, answered Skshetuski, really enrolled in the Hussar regiment of the king, except Pan Zagloba, who is a volunteer from native valor. We serve under the prince, first, out of love for his person, and, secondly, 
because we wish to have as much as we can of the war. If such be your wish, you have chosen well. Surely Pan Podbipienta could not have found his heads under any other command so easily. But as to war in these times, we all have enough of it. More than of anything else, said Zagloba. Men have been coming here from early morning with praises, but if anyone would ask us to a bite of food and a drink of Gorelka, he would honor us best. Having said this, Zagloba looked diligently into Sobieki's eyes, and muttered unquietly, but the starosta sighed, and said. Since yesterday noon I have taken nothing into my mouth. A gulp of Gorelka, however, I think can be found somewhere. I am at your service, gentlemen, for that. Skshetuski, Pan Langin, and Volodyovsky began to draw back and scold Zagloba, who extricated himself as he could and explained matters as he was able. I did not press myself, said he, for it is my ambition rather to give away my own than touch what belongs to another. But when such a distinguished person invites, it would be churlish to refuse. Well, come on, said the starosta. I like to sit in good company, and while there is no firing we have time. I do ask you to eat, for it is difficult to get horse flesh, for each horse killed on the square a hundred hands are stretched forth. But there are two flasks of gorelka which certainly I shall not keep for myself. The others were unwilling, and refused, but when he insisted urgently, they went. Pan Stempovsky hurried on in advance, and exerted himself so that a few biscuits and some bits of horse flesh were found as a bite after the gorelka. Zagloba was in better spirits immediately, and said, God grant the king, to liberate us from this siege, then we will go at once to the wagons of the general militia. They always carry a world of good things with them, and care more for their stomachs than they do for the commonwealth. I'd rather eat with them than fight in their company. But being under the eye of the king, perhaps they will fight fairly well. The starosta grew serious. Since we have sworn, said he, to fall one after another without surrender, we shall do so. We must be ready for still harder times. We have scarcely any provisions, and what is worse, our powder is coming to an end. I should not say this to others, but to you I can speak. Soon we shall have nothing but desperate determination in our hearts and sabers in our hands, readiness for death, and nothing more. God grant the king to come at the earliest moment, for this is our last hope. He is a military man, and is sure not to spare life, health, or comfort in rescuing us. But his forces are too few, and he must wait, you know how slowly the general militia muster. Besides, how is the king to know the conditions in which we are defending ourselves, and that we are eating the last fragments? We have sacrificed ourselves, said Skshetuski. But couldn't we let him know, asked Zagloba. If there could be found a man of such virtue as to undertake to steal through, said the starosta, he would win immortal glory in his lifetime, he would be the savior of the whole army. And would avert defeat from the fatherland. Even if the general militia has not all appeared yet, perhaps the nearness of the king might disperse the rebellion. But who will go, who will undertake it, since Melnitsky has so possessed every road and exit that a mouse could not squeeze through from the camp? Such an undertaking is clear and evident death. But what are stratagems for, and one is now entering my head? What is it, what is it? asked the starosta. This. Every day we take prisoners, bribe one of these. Let them feign escape from us, and run to the king. I must mention this to the prince, said the starosta. Pan Longin fell into deep thought. His brows were covered with furrows, and he sat a whole hour in silence. Suddenly he raised his head, and spoke with his usual sweetness, I will undertake to steal through the Cossacks. The knights, hearing these words, sprang from their seats in amazement. Zagloba opened his mouth, Volodyovsky's mustaches quivered, Skshetuski grew pale. And the starosta, striking himself on the breast, cried, Would you undertake to do this? Have you considered what you say? asked Pan Yen. I considered it long ago, answered the Lithuanian. 
For this is not the first day that the knights say that notice must be given the king of our position. And I, hearing this, thought to myself, if the Most High God permits me to fulfill my vow, I will go at once. I am an obscure man, what do I signify? What harm to me, even am killed on the road? But they will cut you to pieces, without doubt, cried Zagloba, have you heard what the starosta says, that it is evident death? What of that, brother? If God wishes, he will carry me through, if not, he will reward me in heaven. But first they will seize you, torture you, give you a fearful death. Have you lost your reason, man? asked Zagloba. I will go, anyhow, answered the Lithuanian, mildly. A bird could not fly through, for they would shoot it from their bows. They have surrounded us like a badger in his hole. Still I will go. Repeated the Lithuanian. I owe thanks to the Lord for permitting me to fulfill my vow. Well, look at him, examine him, said Zagloba, in desperation. You would better have your head cut off at once and shoot it from a cannon over the tabor, for in this way alone could you push through them. But permit me, my friends, said Pan Langin, clasping his hands. Oh, no, you will not go alone, for I will go with you, said Skrzytuski. And I with you both. Added Volodyovsky, striking his sword. And may the bullet strike you, cried Zagloba, seizing himself by the head. May the bullet strike you with your, and I, and I, with your daring. They have not had enough of blood yet, not enough of destruction, not enough of bullets. What is doing here is not sufficient for them, they want more certainty of having their necks twisted. Go to the dogs, and give me peace. I hope you will be cut to pieces. When he had said this he began to circle about in the tent as if mad. God is punishing me, cried he, for associating with whirlwinds instead of honorable, solid men. It serves me right. He walked through the tent a while longer with feverish tread. At last he stopped before Skshtuski, then, putting his hands behind his back and looking into his eyes, began to puff terribly, What have I done that you persecute me? God save us! exclaimed the knight. What do you mean? I do not wonder that Podbipienta invents such things, he always had his wit in his fist. But since he has killed the three greatest fools among the Turks he has become the fourth himself. It is disgusting to hear him, interrupted the Lithuanian. And I don't wonder at him, continued Zagloba, pointing at Volodyovsky. He will jump on a Cossack's bootleg, or hold to his trousers as a bird does to a dog's tail, and get through quicker than any of us. The Holy Spirit has not shone upon either of the two. But that you, instead of restraining their madness, should add excitement to it, that you are going yourself, and wish to expose us four to certain death and torture, that is the final blow. Tfo. I did not expect this of an officer whom the prince himself has esteemed a valiant knight. How for? asked Skshtuski, in astonishment. Do you want to go? Yes. Cried Zagloba, beating his breast with his fists, I will go. If any of you go, or all go together, I will go too. My blood be on your heads. I shall know next time with whom to associate. Well may you, said Skshtuski. The three knights began to embrace him, but he was angry in earnest, and puffed and pushed them away with his elbows, saying, Go to the devil. I don't want your Judas kisses. Then was heard on the walls the firing of cannon and muskets. There it is for you, go. That is ordinary firing, remarked Pan Yen. Ordinary firing. Repeated Zagloba, mocking him. Well, just think this is not enough for them. Half the army is destroyed by this ordinary firing, and they turn up their noses at it. Be of good cheer, said Podbipienta. You ought to keep your mouth shut, Bidvinia. You are most to blame, you have invented an undertaking which if it is not a fool's errand then I'm a fool. But still I'll go, brother, said Pan Langin. You'll go, you'll go, and I know why. Don't exhibit yourself as a hero, for they know you. You have virtue for sale, and are in a hurry to take it out of camp. 
you the worst among knights, not the best, simply a drab, trading in virtue. Tfu. An offense to God, that's what you are. It is not to the king you want to go, but you would like to snort through the villages like a horse through a meadow. Look at him. There is a knight with virtue for sale. Vexation, vexation, as God is dear to me. Disgusting to hear him, cried the Lithuanian, thrusting his fingers in his ears. Let disputes rest, said Skshetuski, seriously. Better let us think about this question. In God's name, said the starosta, who had listened hitherto with astonishment to Zagloba, this is a great question, but we can decide nothing without the prince. This is no place for discussion. You are in service and obliged to obey orders. The prince must be in his quarters, let us go to him and see what he will say to your offer. I agree to that, answered Zagloba. And hope shone in his face. Let us go as quickly as possible. They went out and crossed the square on which already the balls were falling from the Cossack trenches. The troops were at the ramparts, which at a distance looked like booths at a fair, so overhung were they with many-colored clothing sheepskin coats, packed with wagons, fragments of tents. And every kind of object which might become a shelter against the shots which at times ceased neither day nor night. And now above those rags hung a long bluish line of smoke, and behind them ranks of prostrate red and yellow soldiers, working hard against the nearest trenches of the enemy. The square itself was like a ruin, the level space was cut up with spades, or trampled by horses, it was not made green by a single grass blade. Here and there were mounds of earth freshly raised by the digging of walls and graves. Here and there lay fragments of broken wagons, cannon, barrels, or piles of bones, gnawed, and whitening before the sun. Bodies of horses were nowhere visible, for each one was removed immediately as food for the soldiers. But everywhere were piles of iron, mostly cannonballs, red from rust, which fell every day on that piece of land. Grievous war and hunger were evident at every step. On their way our knights met greater or smaller groups of soldiers, some carrying wounded or dead, others hurrying to the ramparts to relieve their overworked comrades. The faces of all were black, sunken, overgrown with beard, their fierce eyes were inflamed, their clothing faded and torn, many had filthy rags on their heads in place of caps or helmets. Their weapons were broken. Involuntarily came the question, what will happen a week or two later to that handful hitherto victorious? Look, gentlemen, said the starosta. It is time to give notice to the king. Want is showing its teeth, like a dog, said the little knight. What will happen when we have eaten the horses? asked Skshetuski. Thus conversing, they reached the tents of the prince, situated at the right side of the rampart, before which were a few mounted messengers to carry orders through the camp. Their horses, fed with dried and ground horseflesh and excited by continual fire, reared restively, unable to stand in one place. This was the case too with all the cavalry horses, which in going against the enemy seemed like a herd of griffins or centaurs going rather by air than by land. Is the prince in the tent? asked the starosta of one of the horsemen. Yes, with Pan Shiemski, answered the orderly. The starosta entered first without announcing himself, but the four knights remained outside. After a while the canvas opened, and Shiemski thrust out his head. The prince is anxious to see you, said he. Zagloba entered the tent in good humor, for he hoped the prince would not expose his best knights to certain death. But he was mistaken, for they had not yet bowed when he said. The starosta has told me of your readiness to issue from the camp, and I accept your good will. Too much cannot be sacrificed for the country. We have only come for permission to try, said Skshetuski, since your highness is the steward of our blood. Then you want to go together? Your highness, said Zagloba, they want to go, but I do not. God is my witness that I have not come here to praise myself or to make mention of my services. And if I do mention them, I do so lest someone might suppose that I am afraid. Pan Skshetuski, Volodyovsky, and Podbipienta of Mishikishki are great knights. But Burlai, who fell by my hand, 
not to speak of other exploits, was also a famous warrior, equal to Berdabut, Bogan, and the three heads of the Genissaries. I mean to say by this that in knightly deeds I am not behind others. But heroism is one thing, and madness another. We have no wings, and we cannot go by land, that is certain. You will not go then, said the prince. I have said that I do not wish to go, but I have not said that I will not go. Since God has punished me with their company, I must remain in it till death. If we should be hard pressed, the saber of Zagloba will be of service yet. But I know not why death should be put upon us for, and I hope that your highness will avert it from us by not permitting this mad undertaking. You are a good comrade, answered the prince, and it honorable on your part not to wish to leave your friends, you are mistaken in your confidence in me, for I accept your offer. The dog is dead, muttered Zagloba, and his hands dropped. At that moment Furlay, Castellan of Belsk, entered the tent. Your Highness, my people have seized a Cossack who says that they are preparing an assault for tonight. I have received information too, answered the prince. All is ready, only let our people hurry with the ramparts. They are nearly finished. That is well. We will occupy them in the evening. Then he turned to the four knights. It is best to try after the storm, if the night is dark. How is that? asked Furlay, are you preparing a sally? The sally in its own order, I will lead it myself. But now we are talking about something else. These gentlemen undertake to creep through the enemy and inform the king of our condition. The castellan was astonished, opened his eyes, and looked at the knights in succession. The prince smiled with delight. He had this vanity, he loved to have his soldiers admired. In God's name! said the castellan, there are such hearts then in the world? As God lives, I will not dissuade you from the daring deed. Zagloba was purple from rage. But he said nothing, he only puffed like a bear. The prince thought a while, then said. I do not wish, however, to spend your blood in vain, and I am not willing that all four should go together. One will go first, if the enemy kill him, they will not delay in boasting of it, as they have once already boasted of the death of my servant whom they seized at Lvov. If they kill the first, the second will go, afterward in case of necessity the third and the fourth. But perhaps the first will pass through. In such an event I do not wish to expose the others to a useless death. Your Highness, interrupted Skshetuski. This is my will and command, said Yeremy, with emphasis. To bring you to agreement, I say that he shall go first who offered himself first. It was I, cried Pan Langin, with a beaming face. Tonight, after the storm, if it is dark, added the prince. I will give no letters to the king, you will tell what you have seen, merely take a signet ring as credential. Podbipienta took the signet ring and bowed to the prince, who caught him by the temples and held him a while with his two hands. Then he kissed him several times on the forehead, and said in a voice of emotion. You are as near to my heart as a brother. May the God of hosts and our Queen of Angels carry you through, warrior of the Lord. Amen. Amen, repeated Sobieski, the castellan of Belsk, and Pan Shiemski. The prince had tears in his eyes, for he was a real father to the knights. Others wept, and a quiver of enthusiasm shook the body of Pan Podbipienta. A flame passed through his bones. And rejoiced to its depth was his soul, pure, obedient, and heroic, with the hope of coming sacrifice. History will write of you, cried the castellan. Non nobis, non nobis, said nomini tua, domini, de gloriam, not to us, not to us, but to thy name, Lord, give the glory, said the prince. The knights issued from the tent. Tfo. Something has seized me by the throat and holds me, said Zagloba, and it is as bitter in my mouth as wormwood, and there they are firing continually. Oh, if the thunders would fire you away! said he, pointing to the smoking trenches of the Cossacks. Oh, it is hard to live in this world. Pan Longin, are you really going out? May the angels guard you! 
if the plague would choke those ruffians. I must take farewell of you, said Podbipienta. How is that? Where are you going? asked Zagloba. To the priest Mukovetsky, to confess, my brother. I must cleanse my sinful soul. Pan Longin hastened to the castle, the others returned to the ramparts. Skshatuski and Volodyovsky were silent, but Zagloba said. Something holds me by the throat. I did not think to be sorrowful, but that is the worthiest man in the world. If anyone contradicts me, I'll give it to him in the face. Oh, my God, my God! I thought the castellan of Belsk would restrain the prince, but he beat the drum still more. The hangman brought that heretic. History, he says, will write of you. Let it write of him, but not on the skin of Pan Longin. And why doesn't he go out himself? He has six toes on his feet, like every Calvinist, and he can walk better. I tell you, gentlemen, that it is getting worse and worse on earth, and Jabkovsky is a true prophet when he says that the end of the world is near. Let us sit down a while at the ramparts, and then go to the castle, so as to console ourselves with the company of our friend till evening at least. But Pan Longin, after confession and communion, spent the whole time in prayer. He made his first appearance at the storm in the evening, which was one of the most awful. For the Cossacks had struck just when the troops were transporting their cannon and wagons to the newly raised ramparts. For a time it seemed that the slender forces of the Poles would fall before the onrush of two hundred thousand foes. The Polish battalions had become so intermingled with the enemy that they could not distinguish their own, and three times they closed in this fashion. Melnitsky exerted all his power. For the Khan and his own colonels had told him that this must be the last storm, and that henceforth they would only harass the besieged with hunger. But after three hours all attacks were repulsed with such terrible losses that according to later reports forty thousand of the enemy had fallen. One thing is certain, after the battle a whole bundle of flags was thrown at the feet of the prince. And this was really the last great assault, after which followed more difficult times of digging under the ramparts, capturing wagons, continual firing, suffering, and famine. Immediately after the storm the soldiers, ready to drop from weariness, were led by the tireless Yeremy in a sally, which ended in a new defeat for the enemy. Quiet then soothed the Tabor and the camp. The night was warm but cloudy. For black forms pushed themselves quietly and carefully to the eastern edge of the ramparts. They were Pan Longin, Zagloba, Skshatuski, and Volodyovsky. Guard your pistols well to keep the powder dry, whispered Pan Yen. Two battalions will be ready all night. If you fire, we will spring to the rescue. Nothing to be seen, even if you strain your eyes out, whispered Zagloba. That is better, answered Pan Longin. Be quiet. Interrupted Volodyovsky, I hear something. That is only the groan of a dying man, nothing. If you can only reach the oak grove. Oh, my God! My God! sighed Zagloba, trembling as if in a fever. In three hours it will be daylight. It is time, said Pan Longin. Time! Time, repeated Skshatuski, in a stifled voice. Go with God! With God, with God! Farewell, brothers, and forgive me if I have offended any of you in anything. You offend? O oh God, cried Zagloba, throwing himself into his arms. Skshatuski and Volodyovsky embraced him in turn. The moment came. Suppressed gulping shook the breasts of these knights. One alone, Pan Longin, was calm, though full of emotion. Farewell. He repeated once more, and approaching the edge of the rampart, he dropped into the ditch, and soon appeared as a black figure on the opposite bank. Once more he beckoned farewell to his comrades, and vanished in the gloom. Between the road to Zalostsitz and the highway from Vishnievets grew an oak grove, interspersed with narrow openings. Beyond and joining with it was an old pine forest, thick and large, extending north of Zalostsitz. Podbipienta had determined to reach that grove. The road is very perilous, 
for to reach the oaks it was necessary to pass along the entire flank of the Cossack Tabor. But Pan Longin selected it on purpose, for it was just around the camp that most people were moving during the whole night, and the guards gave least attention to passers-by. Besides, other roads, valleys, thickets, and narrow places were set by guards who rode around continually, by Esols, Sotniks, and even Melnitsky himself. A passage through the meadows and along the Nyesna was not to be dreamt for the Cossack horse herders were watching there from dusk till daylight with their herds. The night was gloomy, cloudy, and so dark that at ten paces not only could a man not be seen, but not even a tree. This circumstance was favorable for Pan Langin. Though on the other hand he was obliged to go very slowly and carefully, so as not to fall into any of the pits or ditches. Occupying the whole expanse of the battlefield and dug by Polish and Cossack hands. In this fashion he made way to the second Polish rampart, which had been abandoned just before evening, and had passed through the ditch. He stopped and listened, the trenches were empty. The sally made by Yeremy after the storm had pushed the Cossacks out, who either fell, or took refuge in the Tabor. A multitude of bodies were lying on the slopes and summits of these mounds. Pan Longin stumbled against bodies every moment, stepped over them, and passed on. From time to time a low groan or sigh announced that some one of the prostrate was living yet. Beyond the ramparts there was a broad expanse stretching to another trench made before the arrival of Yeremy, also covered with corpses. But some tens of steps farther on were those earth shelters, like stacks of hay in the darkness. But they were empty. Everywhere the deepest silence reigned, nowhere a fire or a man. No one on that former square but the prostrate. Pan Longin began the prayer for the souls of the dead, and went on. The sounds of the Polish camp, which followed him to the second rampart, grew fainter and fainter, melting in the distance, till at last they ceased altogether. Pan Longin stopped and looked around for the last time. He could see almost nothing, for in the camp there was no light. But one window in the castle glimmered weakly as a star which the clouds now expose and now conceal, or like a glowworm which shines and darkens in turn. My brothers, shall I see you again in this life, thought Pan Longin, and sadness pressed him down like a tremendous stone. He was barely able to breathe. There, where that pale light was trembling, are his people, there are brother hearts, Prince Yeremy, Pan Yen, Volodyovsky, Zagloba, the priest Mukovetsky. There they love him and would gladly defend him. But here is night, with desolation, darkness, corpses, under his feet choruses of ghosts. Farther on, the blood-devouring Tabor of sworn, pitiless enemies. The weight of sadness became so great that it was too heavy even for the shoulders of this giant. His soul began to waver within him. In the darkness pale alarm flew upon him, and began to whisper in his ear, You will not pass, it is impossible. Return, there is still time. Fire the pistol and a whole battalion will rush to your aid. Through those tabers, through that savageness nothing will pass. That starving camp, covered every day with balls, full of death and the odor of corpses, appeared at that moment to Pan Langin a calm, peaceful, safe haven. His friends there would not think ill of him if he returned. He would tell them that the deed passed human power. And they would not go themselves, would not send another would wait further for the mercy of God and the coming of the king. But if Skshetuski should go and perish. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. These are temptations of Satan, thought Pan Langin. I am ready for death, and nothing worse can meet me. And this is Satan terrifying a weak soul with desolation, corpses, and darkness, for he makes use of all means. Will the knight return, cover himself with shame, suffer in reputation, disgrace his name, not save the army, renounce the crown of heaven? Never. And he moved on, stretching out his hands before him. Now a murmur reached him again, not from the Polish camp, however, but from the opposite side, still indefinite, but as it were deep and terrible. Like the growling of a bear giving sudden answer in a dark forest. Disquiet had now left Pan Langin's soul, 
sadness had ceased, and changed into a mere sweet remembrance of those near to him. At last, as if answering that menace coming up from the tabor, he repeated once more in spirit, but still I will go. After a certain time he found himself on that battlefield ere on the first day of the storm the prince's cavalry had defeated the Cossacks and Genissaries. The road here was more even, fewer pits, ditches, shelters, and no corpses, those who had fallen in the earlier struggles had been buried by the Cossacks. It was also somewhat clearer, for the ground was not covered with various obstacles. The land inclined gradually toward the north. But Pan Longin turned immediately to the flank, wishing to push through between the western pond and the Tabor. He went quickly now, without hindrance, and it seemed him already that he was reaching the line of the Tabor, when some new sound caught his attention. He halted at once, and after waiting a quarter of an hour heard the tramp and breathing of horses. Cossack patrols, thought he. The voices of men reached his ears. He sprang aside with speed, and searching with his foot for the first depression in the ground, fell to the earth and stretched out motionless, holding his pistol in one hand and his sword the other. The riders approached still nearer, and at last were abreast of him. It was so dark he could not count them, but he heard every word of their conversation. It is hard for them, but hard for us too, said some sleepy voice. And how many good men of ours have bitten the dust? Oh, Lord, said another voice, they say the king is not far. What will become of us? The Khan got angry with our father, and the Tartars threatened to take us, if there will be no other prisoners. And in the pastures they fight with our men. Father has forbidden us to go to the Tartar camp, for whoever goes there is lost. They say there are disguised Poles among the market men. I wish this war had never begun. It is worse this time than before. The king is not far away, with the Polish forces. That is the worst. Ha, ha. You would be sleeping in the sage at this hour. Now you have got to push around in the dark like a vampire. There must be vampires here, for the horses are snorting. Their voices receded gradually, and at last were silent. Pan Longin rose and went on. A rain fine as mist began to fall. It grew still darker. On the left side of Pan Longin gleamed at the distance of two furlongs a small light. After that a second, a third, and a tenth. Then he knew he was on the line of the Tabor. The lights were far apart and weak. It was evident that all were sleeping, and only here and there might they be drinking or preparing food for the morrow. Thank God that I am out after the storm and the sally, said Pan Longin to himself. They must be mortally weary. He had scarcely thought this when he heard again in the distance the tramp of horses, another patrol was coming. But the ground in this place was more broken, therefore it was easier to hide. The patrol passed so near that the guards almost rode over Pan Longin. Fortunately the horses, accustomed to pass among prostrate bodies, were not frightened. Pan Longin went on. In the space of a thousand yards he met two more patrols. It was evident that the whole circle occupied by the Tabor was guarded like the apple of the eye. But Pan Longin rejoiced in spirit that he was not meeting infantry outposts, who are generally placed before camps to give warning to mounted patrols. But his joy was of short duration. Scarcely had he advanced another furlong of the road when some dark figure shifted before him not more than twenty yards distant. Though unterrified, he felt a slight tremor along his spine. It was too late to withdraw and go around. The form moved, evidently it had seen him. A moment of hesitation followed, short as the twinkle of an eye. Then a suppressed voice called. Vasil, is that you? I, said Pan Longin, quietly. Have you Gorelka? I have. Give me some. Pan Longin approached. Why are you so tall? Asked the voice, in tones of terror. Something rustled in the darkness. A scream of, lore, smothered the instant it was begun, came from the mouth the picket. Then was heard the crash as it were of broken bones, heavy breathing, 
and one figure fell quietly to the earth. Pan Langin moved on. But he did not pass along the same line, for it was evidently a line of pickets, he turned therefore a little nearer to the Tabor, wishing to go between the pickets and the line of wagons. If there was not another line of pickets, Pan Langin could meet in that space only those who went out from camp to relieve those on duty. Mounted patrols had no duty here. After a time it became evident that there was no second line of pickets. But the Tabor was not farther than two bowshots, and wonderful. It seemed to grow nearer continually, though he tried to go at an equal distance from line of wagons. It was evident too that not all were asleep in the Tabor. At the fires smoldering here and there sitting figures were visible. In one place the fire was greater, so large indeed that it almost reached Pan Langin with its light. And he was forced to draw back toward the pickets so as not to pass through the line of illumination. From the distance he distinguished, hanging on cross sticks near the fire, oxen which the butchers were skinning. Disputing groups of men looked on. A few were playing quietly on pipes for the butchers. It was that part of the camp occupied by the herdsmen. The more distant rows of wagons were surrounded by darkness. But the line of the Tabor lighted by the smoldering fires again appeared as if nearer to Pan Langin. In the beginning he had it only on his right hand. Suddenly he saw that he had it in front of him. Then he halted and meditated what to do. He was surrounded. The Tabor, the Tartar camp, and the camps of the mob encircled all's barrage like a ring. Inside this ring sentries were standing and mounted guards moving, that no one might pass through. The position of Pan Langin was terrible. He had now the choice either to go through between the wagons or seek another exit between the Cossacks and the Tartars. Otherwise he would have to wander till daylight along that rim, unless he wished to return to Zbaraj, but even in the latter case he might fall into the hands of the mounted patrol. He understood, however, that the very nature of the ground did not permit that one wagon should stand close to another. There had to be intervals in the rows, and considerable ones. Such intervals were necessary for communication, for an open road, for necessary travel. He determined to look for such a passage, and with that object approached still nearer to the wagons. The gleam of fires burning here and there might betray him, but on the other hand they were useful, for without them he could see neither the wagons nor the road between them. After a quarter of an hour he found a road, and recognized it easily, for it looked like a black belt between the wagons. There was no fire on it. There could be no Cossacks there, since the cavalry had to pass that way. Pan Langin put himself on his knees and hands, and began to crawl to that dark throat like a snake to a hole. A quarter of an hour passed, half an hour, he crawled continually, praying at the same time, commending his body and soul to the protection of the heavenly powers. He thought that perhaps the fate of all's barrage was depending on him then, could he pass that throat. He prayed therefore not for himself alone, but for those who at that moment in the trenches were praying for him. On both sides of him all was silent, no man moved, no horse snorted, no dog barked. And Pan Langin went through. The bushes and thickets looked dark before him, behind them was the oak grove, behind the oak grove the pine woods, all the way to Toporov. Beyond the pine woods, the king, salvation, and glory, service before God and man. What was the cutting of three heads in comparison with this deed, for which something was needed beyond an iron hand? Pan Langin felt the difference, but pride stirred not that clean heart. It was only moved like that of a child with tears of thankfulness. Then he rose and passed on. Beyond the wagons there were either no pickets or few easily avoided. Now heavier rain began to fall, pattering on the bushes and drowning the noise of his steps. Pan Langin then gave freedom to his long legs, and walked like a giant, trampling the bushes. Every step was like five of a common man, the wagons every moment farther, the oak grove every moment nearer, and salvation every moment nearer. Here are the oaks. Night beneath them is as black as under the ground, but that is better. A gentle breeze sprang up, the oaks murmured lightly, you would have said they were muttering a prayer. 
O great God, good God, guard this night, for he is thy servant and a faithful son of the land on which we have grown up for thy glory. About seven miles and a half divided Pan Langin from the Polish camp. Sweat poured from his forehead, for the air was sultry, as if gathering for a storm. But he went on, caring nothing for the storm, for the angels were singing in his heart. The oaks became thinner. The first field is surely near. The oaks rustle more loudly, as if wishing to say, Wait, you were safe among us. But the night has no time, and he enters the open field. Only one oak stands on it, and that in the center. But it is larger than the others. Pan Langin moves toward that oak. All at once, when he was a few yards from the spreading branches of the giant, about a dozen figures push out and approach him with wolf springs, Who are you? Who are you? Their language is unknown, their heads are covered with something pointed. They are the Tartar horse herders, who have taken refuge from the rain. At that moment red lightning flashed through the field, revealing the oak, the wild figures of the Tartars, and the enormous noble. A terrible cry shook the air, and the battle began in a moment. The Tartars rushed on Pan Langin like wolves on a deer, and seized him with sinewy hands, but he only shook himself, and all the assailants fell from him as ripe fruit from a tree. Then the terrible double-handed sword gritted in the scabbard. And then were heard groans, howls, calls for aid, the whistle of the sword, the groans of the wounded, the neighing and the frightened horses, the clatter of broken tartar swords. The silent field roared with all the wild sounds that can possibly find place in the throats of men. The tartars rushed on him repeatedly in a crowd. But he put his back to the oak, and in front covered himself with the whirlwind of his sword, and slashed awfully. Bodies lay dark under his feet, the others fell back, impelled by panic terror. A DIV. A DIV, howled they, wildly. The howling was not without an answer. Half an hour had not passed when the whole field swarmed with footmen and horsemen. Cossacks ran up, and Tartars also with poles and bows and pieces of burning pitch pine. Excited questions began to fly from mouth to mouth. What is it, what has happened? A DIV. Answered the Tartars. A DIV, repeated the crowd. A pole. A DIV. Take him alive, alive. Pan Longin fired twice from his pistols, but those reports could not be heard by his comrades in the Polish camp. Now the crowd approached him in a half circle. He was standing in the shade, gigantic, supported by the tree, and he waited with sword in hand. The crowd came nearer, nearer. At last the voice of command shouted, Seize him. They rushed ahead. The cries were stopped. Those who could not push on gave light to the assailants. A whirl of men gathered and turned under the tree. Only groans came out of that whirl, and for a long time it was impossible to distinguish anything. At last a scream of terror was wrested from the assailants. The crowd broke in a moment. Under the tree remained Pan Langin, and at his feet a crowd of bodies still quivering in agony. Ropes, ropes, thundered a voice. The horsemen ran for the ropes, and brought them in the twinkle of an eye. Then a number of strong men seized the two ends of a long rope, endeavoring to fasten Pan Langin to the tree. But he cut with his sword, and the men fell on the ground on both sides. Then the Tartars tried, with the same result. Seeing that too many men in a crowd interfere with one another, a number of the boldest Nogais advanced once more, wishing absolutely to seize the enormous man alive. But he tore them as a wild boar tears resolute dogs. The oak, which had grown together from two great trees, guarded in its central depression the night. Whoever approached him from the front within the length of his sword perished without uttering a groan. The superhuman power of Pan Langin seemed to increase with each moment. Seeing this, the enraged hordes drove away the Cossacks, and around were heard the wild cries, Bows! Bows! At the sight of the bows, and of the arrows poured out at the feet of his enemies from their quivers, Pan Langin saw that the moment of death was at hand. 
and he began the litany to the Most Holy Lady. It became still. The crowds restrained their breath, waiting for what would happen. The first arrow whistled, as Pan Longin was saying, Mother of the Redeemer, and it scratched his temple. Another arrow whistled, as he was saying, O glorious lady, and it stuck in his shoulder. The words of the litany had mingled with the whistling of arrows. And when Pan Longin had said, Morning Star, arrows were standing in his shoulders, his side, in his legs. The blood from his temples was flowing into his eyes. He saw as through a mist the field and the Tartars, he heard no longer the whistle of the arrows. He felt that he was weakening, that his legs were bending under him, his head dropped on his breast. At last he fell on his knees. Then he said, with a half-groan, Queen of the Angels, these words were his last on earth. The angels of heaven took his soul, and placed it a clear pearl at the feet of the Queen of the Angels. Chapter 61 Zagloba and Volodyovsky were standing on the rampart next morning among the soldiers, looking carefully toward the tabor, from the side of which masses of peasants were approaching. Pan Yen was in council with the prince, but they, taking advantage of the moment of quiet, were talking about the preceding day and the present movement in the enemy's tabor. That forebodes no good for us, said Zagloba, pointing at the dark masses moving like an enormous cloud. They are surely coming to an assault again, and here our hands will not move in their joints. Why should there be an assault in the clear day? They will do nothing more this time, said the little knight, than occupy our rampart of yesterday, dig into our new one, and fire from morning till evening. We might stir them up nicely with our cannon. Volodyovsky lowered his voice. We haven't much powder. With our present use it will not last six days probably. But by that time the king will come surely. Let him do what he likes. If only our Pan Langin, poor man, has got through in safety. I could not sleep the whole night. I was thinking only of him, and whenever I dozed I saw him in trouble, and such sorrow seized me that sweat stood out on my body. He is the best man to be found in the Commonwealth, looking with a lantern for three years and six weeks. And why did you always jeer at him? Because my lip is worse than my heart. But don't make it bleed, Pan Michael, with remembrances, for as matters are I reproach myself, and God forbid that anything should happen to Pan Longin. I should have no peace till my death. Don't grieve so much. He never had any ill feeling against you and I have heard him say himself, an evil mouth, but a golden heart. God give him health, the worthy friend. He never knew how to talk in human fashion, but he made up for a hundred such deficiencies by great virtue. What do you think, Pan Michael, did he pass through? The night was dark, and the peasants after the defeat were terribly tired. We had not a good watch, what must it have been with them? Praise God for that. I told Pan Longin to inquire carefully whether our poor princess had been seen anywhere, for I think Genzian must have taken her to the king's headquarters. Pan Longin will be sure not to rest. He will not come back without the king. In that case we shall have news again soon. I have faith in the wit of that lad Genzian, and think that he saved her somehow. I should know no peace if harm met her. I did not know her intimately and I believe if I had a sister she would not have been dearer to me. She was a sister to you, but to me a daughter. From these troubles my beard will grow white altogether, and my heart break from sorrow. When you love someone, one, two, three, and that one is gone. Then you sit, console yourself, worry, grieve, meditate, having besides an empty stomach, and holes in your cap through which the water is falling on your bald head like rain through a broken thatch. Dogs have at present a pleasanter life in the commonwealth than the nobles, and we four are the worst off of all. It is time to go to a better world, Pan Michael, what do you think? I have thought more than once whether it would not be better to tell Skshetuski all. But this restrains me, that he himself never speaks of her, and when anyone utters a word he just quivers as if something pierced his heart. Tell him, open the wounds dried up in the fire of this war, while now some Tartar maybe is leading her by the hair through Paracop. 
flaming fires stand in my eyes when I think of such a thing. It is time to die, it cannot be otherwise, for there is torture alone in this world, nothing more. If only Pan Longin gets through. He must have more favor in heaven than others, for he is virtuous. But look! What are the rabble doing? There is such a glitter from the sun today that I cannot see. They are cutting up our rampart of yesterday. I said there would be an assault. Let us go, Pan Michael, we have stood here long enough. They are not digging to make an assault. They must have an open road to return, and besides they will surely bring machines to shoot from. Just see how the shovels are working, they have leveled the ground about forty yards already. I see now, but there is a terrible glare today. Zagloba covered his eyes with his hand, and looked. At that moment through the cut made in the rampart rushed a stream of people who scattered in the twinkle of an eye along the space between the ramparts. Some fell to firing. Others, digging the ground with spades, began to raise a new mound and trenches to enclose the Polish camp with a third ring. Oh, ho! cried Volodyovsky, the word is scarcely out of my mouth, and they are rolling in the machines. Well, there will be an assault soon. Let us leave this place, said Zagloba. No. This is another kind of tower, said the little knight. Really, the machines which appeared in the cut were built differently from the ordinary moving tower. The walls were composed of ladders fastened together with hasps, covered with cloth and skins, from behind which the best marksmen, sitting from half the height of the machine to the top, struck the enemy. Come away. Let the dogs gnaw on where they are. Wait, answered Volodyovsky. They began to count the machines, as new ones appeared in the cut. One, two, three, it is evident they have no small supply, four, five, six, they are coming yet, seven, eight, they can kill a dog on our square, for there must be splendid marksmen there, nine, ten, evident as on your hand, for the sun shines on it, eleven, all at once Pan Michael stopped counting. What is that? he asked, in a voice of amazement. Where? There on the highest one, a man is hanging. Zagloba strained his glance. Indeed, on the highest machine the sun was shining on the naked body of a man, swaying on a rope with the movement of the machine, like a great pendulum. True, said Zagloba. Then Volodyovsky grew pale as a sheet, and cried with a terrified voice, Almighty God! It is Podbipienta! A murmur rose on the ramparts like wine through the leaves of trees, Zagloba bent his head, covered his eyes with his hands, and whispered with blue lips, groaning, Jesus, Mary! Jesus, Mary! The murmur changed into a noise of confused words, and then into a roar as of a stormy sea. The men on the ramparts saw that by that infamous cord was hanging the comrade of their sufferings, a knight without reproach. All knew that that was Pan Longin Podbipienta, and terrible anger began to raise the hair on the heads of the soldiers. Zagloba at last took his hands from his eyes. He was a terror to look at. On his mouth was foam, his face was blue, his eyes bursting from his head. Blood! Blood! roared he with such a voice that a quiver passed through those standing near him. He sprang into the ditch. After him rushed everything that had life on the ramparts. No power, not even the commands of the prince, could have restrained that outburst of rage. They climbed out of the ditch, one over the shoulders of the other. They seized the bank of the ditch with their hands and with their teeth, and when one sprang out he ran without looking, not turning to see whether others were following. The machines were smoking like tar factories, and trembled from the roar of musketry, but nothing availed. Zagloba rushed on in advance, his saber above his head, raging like a mad bull. The Cossack sprang forward too with scythes and flails on the assailants. Two walls, as it were, struck with a crash. But fat dogs cannot defend themselves long against hungry and raging wolves. Pushed from their place, cut with sabers, Torn with teeth, beaten, crushed, the Cossacks could not withstand the fury, they were soon confused, and then fled to the cut. 
Zagloba, raging, rushed into the thickest crowd, like a lioness whose cubs are gone. An opening was made before him. And at his side went, like another devouring flame, Volodyovsky, wild as a wounded leopard. The marksmen in the machines were cut to pieces, the rest pursued to the cut in the ramparts. Then the soldiers mounted the machine and freed Pan Langin, letting him down carefully to the ground. Zagloba fell on his body. Volodyovsky's heart was rent in like degree, and he was covered with tears at the sight of his dead friend. It was easy to see how Pan Langin had perished, for his whole body was covered with spots from the wounds inflicted by arrows. But the arrows had not injured his face, except one, which had left a long line on his temple. The few drops of blood had grown dry on his cheek. His eyes were closed, and on his pale face was a quiet smile, and had it not been for the azure paleness of the visage, the chill of death in the features. It might have seemed that Pan Langin was sleeping calmly. His comrades took him at last and bore him on their shoulders to the rampart, and then to the chapel of the castle. Before evening a coffin was made, and the funeral celebrated by night at the Zberich cemetery. All the clergy were present except the priest Jabkovsky, who, shot in the back during the last assault, was near death. Having given the command to Sobieski, the prince had come. Also Konyetspolsky, Shiemsky, Skshatusky, Volodyovsky, Zagloba, and the officers of the squadron in which the dead man had served. The coffin was placed at the newly dug grave, and the ceremony began. It was a starry night. The torches burned with an even flame, gleaming on the yellow planks of the freshly made coffin, on the figure of the priest, and the stern faces of the knights standing in a circle. The smoke from the censer rose slowly, spreading the odor of myrrh and juniper. The silence was broken only by the stifled sobs of Zagloba, the deep sighs of the strong breasts around, and the distant roar of discharges on the ramparts. But the priest Mukovetsky raised his hand in sign that he was about to speak. The knights therefore held their breaths. He was silent a little longer. Then fixing his eyes on the starry heights, he began at length as follows. What knocking do I hear at night on the door of heaven? asks the hoary warden of Christ, springing up from sweet slumber. Open, holy Peter, open. I am Podbipienta. But what deeds, what offices, what services embolden you, O Podbipienta, to trouble so important a doorkeeper? By what right do you wish to enter where neither birth, though as honorable as your own, nor senatorial dignity, nor offices of the crown, nor the majesty even of the purple? of themselves alone give free entrance, since men cannot drive there by the broad highway in a carriage and six, with haydukes, but must climb by the steep and thorny path of virtue? Ah, open, holy Peter, open quickly, for by just such a steep and thorny path did our fellow-soldier and dear comrade Podbipienta pass. Till he came to your presence like a dove wearied after long flight. Came naked, like Lazarus, came like Saint Stephen, torn with pagan arrows, like poor Job. Like the virgin who has never known a husband, pure, obedient as a lamb, patient and quiet, without a spot of sin, with a sacrifice of blood joyfully shed for his earthly fatherland. Admit him, holy Peter, for if you do not admit him, whom will you admit in these days of corruption and ungodliness? Admit him, holy warden. Admit this lamb, let him pasture in the heavenly meadow. Let him nip its grass, for he came hungry from Zbaraj. In this manner the priest Mukovetsky began his discourse. And then he depicted the whole life of Pan Langin with such eloquence that everyone acknowledged himself wicked in the presence of the silent coffin of the night without reproach. Who had surpassed the lowliest in modesty and the loftiest in virtue. All then beat their breasts. Every moment greater sadness seized them and they saw more clearly what the country had suffered and Zbaraj had lost. The priest took a lofty flight, and when at last he described the passage through the enemy and the martyr death of Pan Langin, he forgot altogether his rhetoric and quotations. And while taking leave of the mortal remains in the name of the clergy, the officers, and the army, he broke into weeping himself, and said, sobbing like Zagloba, 
give us your blessing, brother. Give us your blessing, comrade. Not to an earthly, but to a heavenly king, to the surest tribunal, have you carried our groans, our famine, our misery and sufferings. You will gain for us there a more certain salvation. But you will never return yourself, therefore do we weep, therefore do we pour tears upon your coffin, for we loved you, dearest brother. All wept with the worthy priest, the prince, the commanders, the army, and most of all the friends of the deceased, but when the priest intoned for the first time, Requiem Adernam Dona Ei Domini. Grant him eternal rest, Lord, there was a universal outburst, though all were men hardened against death, and long accustomed to it, through their daily service. When the coffin was placed on the ropes it was as difficult to tear Zagloba away as if his father or brother had died. But at last Skshetuski and Volodyovsky drew him aside. The prince approached and took a handful of earth, the priest began to say, Anima Aegis, the ropes rattled, the earth began to fall, it was thrown in with hands, with helmets. And soon above the remains of Pan Longin rose a lofty mound, shone on by the pale sad light of the moon. Three friends were returning from the town to the square, from which came an uninterrupted sound of firing. They walked in silence, for neither wished to speak the first word. But other groups were speaking of the deceased, giving him unanimous praise. It was a splendid funeral, said an officer passing at the side of Skshetuski. They did not give a better to Serikovsky, the secretary of the crown. For he deserved it, answered another officer, who else would have undertaken to break through to the king? But I heard, added the third, that among Vishnyavetsky's men there was a number of volunteers, but after such a terrible example the desire will surely desert them all. Besides, the thing is impossible. A snake could not creep through. As I live, it would be pure madness. The officers passed on. A new moment of silence followed. Suddenly Volodyovsky said, You heard, Yen, what they said? Yes, answered Skshetuski, it is my turn now. Yen, said Volodyovsky, seriously, you know me of old, and you know that I am not quick to withdraw before peril, but peril is one thing, and downright suicide is another. And you, Michael, say this? Yes, for I am your friend. And I am your friend. Give me your word of honor that you will not go third if I perish. Impossible, cried Volodyovsky. Ah, you see, Michael. How can you ask that of me which you will not do yourself? Let the will of God be done. Then let me go with you. The prince has prohibited that, not I. You are a soldier, and you must obey. Pan Michael was silent, for he was a soldier first of all, then his mustaches only quivered violently by the light of the moon. At last he said, The night is very clear, don't go now. I should prefer a darker one, but delay is impossible. The weather is, as you see, settled for a long time, our powder is almost gone, our provisions are at an end. The soldiers are digging through the square, looking for roots. The gums of some of them are rotting from the rubbish they have eaten. I will go tonight, at once, I have taken farewell of the prince already. I see that you are simply desperate. Skshetuski smiled gloomily. God guard you, Michael. It is certain that we are not swimming in luxury, but I shall not seek death of my own will, for that is a sin. Besides, it is not a question of perishing, but of getting through, going to the king, and saving the camp. Volodyovsky was suddenly seized with such a desire to tell Skshetuski all about the princess that he almost opened his mouth. But he thought to himself, his head will be turned by the news, and they will catch him the more easily, he bit his tongue therefore, was silent, and then asked, which way are you going? I told the prince that I should go through the pond, and then by the river till I passed far beyond the Tabor. He said that this was a better road than others. There is no help, I see, said Volodyovsky. Since death is predestined to a man, it is better on the field of glory than in bed. God attend you, God attend you, Yen. If we do not meet in this world we shall in the other, and I shall surely keep my heart for you. As I shall mine for you. 
God reward you for all the good you have done. And listen to me, Michael. If I die, they will perhaps not put me up as they did Pan Longin, for they have received too severe a lesson. But they will be sure to boast of it in some way, in which case let old Zatsvilikovsky go to Melnitsky for my body, for I do not wish that dogs should drag me through their camp. Rest assured. Said Volodyovsky. Zagloba, who from the beginning had listened in semi-consciousness, understood the conversation at last, but he felt unable to restrain or dissuade. He only groaned deeply, yesterday that one, today this one. My God, my God, my God! Have faith, said Volodyovsky. Pan Yen, began Zagloba, and he could go no further. His grey, suffering head rested on the breast of the knight, and he drew up to him like a helpless little child. An hour later Skshetuski sank into the water of the western pond. The night was very clear, and the middle of the pond looked like a silver shield, but Skshetuski vanished straightway from the eye. The shore was thickly overgrown with rushes and reeds. Farther on, where the reeds were thinner, was a rich growth of pondweed and plants. That mixture of wide and narrow leaves, slippery stalks, snaky stems winding around the legs and body to the waist hindered his advance greatly, but at least concealed him from the patrol. To swim across the clear center of the pond was out of the question, for any dark object would have been seen easily. Skshetuski determined therefore to pass along the shore of the pond to the swamp at the other side, through which the river entered the pond. Patrols of Cossacks or Tartars were likely to be there. But the place was overgrown with a whole forest of reeds, only the edge had been cut down to make cabins for the mob. The swamp once attained, it would be possible to push on through the reeds, even in the daytime, unless the quagmire should be too deep. But that road also was a terrible one. Under the sleeping water, not farther than a yard from the shore, the mud was an ell or more in depth. After every step Skshetuski took their rose to the surface of the water bubbles, the gurgling of which could be heard distinctly in the stillness. Besides, in spite of the slowness of his movements, ripples were formed which ran every moment farther from their source to the open water, in which the light of the moon was reflected. In time of rain Skshetuski would have swum straight across the pond, and in half an hour, at most, would have come to the swamp, but there was not a cloud in the sky. Whole torrents of greenish light fell upon the pond, changing the leaves of the lily into silver shields, and the tufts on the reeds to brushes of silver. No breeze was blowing. Happily the gurgling of the bubbles was lost in the noise of the guns, noticing which, Skshetuski moved only when the discharges on the ramparts and trenches became more lively. But that calm, pleasant night caused another difficulty, legions of mosquitoes rose from the reeds and swarmed over the head of the night, fastening on his face and eyes, biting him. Buzzing and singing above his ears their mournful vespers. Pan Yen in selecting this road did not deceive himself as to its difficulties, but he did not foresee everything. He did not foresee, for instance, its terrors. Every depth of water, even the best known, has in it something mysterious and terrifying, and involuntarily urges the question, what is down at the bottom? And this pond of Zbaraj was simply awful. The water in it seemed to be thicker than common water, and exuded the odor of corpses, for hundreds of Cossacks and Tartars had decayed there. Both sides had drawn out corpses, but how many of them might be hidden among the reeds, the plants, and the thick growth? The cold of a wave embraced Pan Yen, and sweat stood on his forehead. What if some slippery arm should seize him suddenly, or if greenish eyes should look at him from under the leaves. The long stems of the water lily wound around his knees, and the hair stood on his head, because that may be the spirit of a drowned man to keep him from going farther. Jesus, Mary! Jesus, Mary! whispered he unceasingly, pushing ahead. At times he raised his eyes, and at the sight of the moon, the stars, and the silence of the sky he found a certain rest. Their God is, repeated he, in an undertone, so that he might hear himself. Then he would look on the shore, and it seemed to him that he was looking on the ordinary world of God from some condemned world beyond the earth, a world of swamps, black depths, pale moonlight. 
ghosts, corpses, and night. Yearning took such hold of him that he wanted immediately to rush forth from that net of reeds. But he pushed along the shore unceasingly, and he had already gone so far from the camp that on that god's world, outside, he saw at some paces distant from the shore a tartar on horseback. He stopped then and looked at the figure, which, nodding with uniform motion toward the neck of the horse, seemed to be sleeping. It was a strange sight. The tartar nodded continually, as if bowing in silence to Skshetuski, and the latter did not take his eye from him. There was something terrible in this. But Skshetuski breathed with satisfaction, for in presence of that definite fear fancies a hundred times more difficult to be born disappeared. The world of ghosts fled somewhere, his coolness returned at once, and only questions like these began to crowd into his head, does he sleep, or not? Must I go on, or wait? At length he went on, moving still more quietly, still more cautiously than at the beginning of his journey. He already halfway to the swamp and the river when the first breath of a light wind rose. The reeds moved therefore, and gave forth a strong sound by striking one another. And Skshetuski was rejoiced, for in spite of all his care, in spite of the fact that sometimes he lost several minutes in taking a step, an involuntary movement, a stumble, a splash might betray him. Now he advanced more boldly, covered by the loud noise of the reeds with which the whole pond was filled. And everything grew vocal about him, the water on the bank began to plash with its rocking wave. But this movement evidently roused not the plants along the shore alone, for at that time some dark object appeared before Pan Yen and began to move toward him as if preparing for a spring. He almost screamed at first, but fear and aversion restrained the voice in his bosom, and at the same time a terrible odor came to him. But after a while, when the first idea that this might be a drowned person barring his road on purpose disappeared, and there remained only aversion, the night passed on. The talk of the reeds continued and increased every moment. Through, their moving tufts Chetuski saw a second and a third Tartar patrol. He passed these, passed a fourth also. I must have gone around half the pond, thought he, and he raised himself a little to look through the reeds and see where he was. Something pushed his legs. He looked around and saw there at his knees a human face. This is the second, thought he. This time he was not frightened, for the second body lay on its back, without signs of life or movement. Skshetuski merely hastened his steps so as not to become dizzy. The reeds grew thicker, which on the one hand gave him a safe shelter, but on the other greatly impeded his advance. Half an hour passed, an hour, he went on unceasingly, but grew more and more weary. The water in some places was so shallow that it just reached above his ankles, but in others it came almost to his waist. He was tortured beyond measure by the slow dragging of his feet out of the mud. His forehead was streaming with perspiration, and from time to time a quiver went through him from head to foot. What is this, thought he, with terror in his heart, is delirium seizing me? Somehow the swamp does not appear, I don't recognize the place among the reeds. Shall I miss it? It was a terrible danger. For in that way he might circle about the pond all night, and in the morning find himself at the same point from which he had started, or fall into the hands of the Cossacks at another place. I have chosen a bad road, thought he, failing in spirits, it is impossible to get through the pond. I will return, and in the morning go as Pan Lungin did. I might rest till morning. But he went on, for he saw that by promising to return and rest he was tempting himself. It also occurred to him that by going so slowly and halting every moment he could not have reached the swamp yet. Still the thought of rest grew on him more and more. At moments he wished to lie down somewhere in the reeds, just to draw breath. He struggled with his own thoughts and prayed at the same time. The trembling passed over him oftener. He drew his legs out of the mud with less force. The sight of the Tartar patrol sobered him, but he felt that his head as well as his body was tormenting him, and that a fever was coming upon him. Again half an hour passed, the swamp was not visible yet. But bodies of drowned men appeared more frequently. Night, fear, corpses, the noise of reeds, toil, 
and sleeplessness benumbed his thoughts. Visions began to come to him. Now Helena is in Kudak, and he is sailing with Gensian in a boat down the Dnieper. The reeds are rustling, he hears the boatman sing. The priest Mukovetsky is waiting in his stole, Pan Grodzitsky takes the place of a father. The girl is there looking day after day on the river, from the walls. Suddenly she sees something, claps her hands, and cries, He is coming. He is coming. My master, says Jensian, pulling him by the sleeve, the lady is here. Skshatuski wakes. It is the tangled reeds that stop him on the way. Visions disappear, consciousness returns. Now he does not feel such weariness, for the fever lends him strength. Oh, is not this the swamp yet? But around him the reeds were still the same as if he had not stirred from the spot. Near the river there must be open water, therefore this is not the swamp yet. He goes on, but his thoughts return with invincible stubbornness to the pleasant vision. In vain he defends himself, in vain he begins to say, Oh, venerable lady! In vain he tries to retain all his consciousness. Again he is sailing down the Dnieper, he sees the boats, the skiffs, Kudak, the sage. Only this time the vision is more disordered, there is a multitude of persons in it. At the side of Helena are the prince and Melnitsky, the Koshivoy Adaman, Pan Langin, Zagloba, Bogan, Volodyovsky, all in gala attire for his wedding. But where is the wedding? They are in some strange place, neither Lubni nor Razloji nor the Sage nor Kudak, in unknown waters among floating corpses. Skshatuski wakes a second time, or rather he is roused by a loud rustling coming from the direction in which he is going, he halts therefore, and listens. The rustling approaches. A kind of grating and plashing is heard, it is a boat, visible already through the reeds. Two Cossacks are sitting in it one is pushing with an oar. The other holds in his hand a long pole gleaming in the distance like silver, and he pushes the water plants aside with it. Skshatuski sank in the water up to his neck, so that only his head was sticking out above the lilies, and he looked. Is that an ordinary picket, thought he, or are they already on the trail? But soon he concluded by the quiet and careless motions of the Cossacks that it must be an ordinary picket. There must be more than one boat on the pond, and if the Cossacks were on his trail a number of boats would be assembled and a crowd of men. Meanwhile they passed by, the noise of the reeds deafened their words, he caught only the following snatch of conversation. Devil take them, they have given orders to patrol this filthy water. The boat pushed on behind bunches of reeds, but the Cossack standing at the prow struck continually with measured blows of his pole among the water plants, as if he wished to frighten the fish. Skshatuski hurried on. After a time he saw a tartar picket standing at the bank. The light of the moon fell straight on the face of the Nogai, which was like the snout of a dog. But Skshatuski feared these pickets less than loss of consciousness. He exerted all his will, therefore, to give himself a clear account of where he was and whither he was going. But the struggle only increased his weariness, and soon he discovered that he was seeing double and treble, and at moments the pond seemed to him the square and the camp, and the bunches of reeds' tents. At such moments he wished to call Volodyovsky to go with him, but he had sufficient consciousness to restrain himself. Don't call, don't call, repeated he to himself, that would be death. But the struggle with himself was more and more difficult. He left Zbaraj tormented with hunger and terrible sleeplessness, from which soldiers there were dying already. That night journey, the cold bath, the odor of corpses in the water, weakened him completely. Added to this were the excitement of fear, and pain from the biting of mosquitoes which pierced his face so that it was covered with blood. He felt therefore that if he did not reach the swamp soon he would either go out on the shore and let what might meet him meet him quickly, or he would fall among the reeds and be drowned. That swamp and the mouth of the river seemed to him a port of salvation, though in fact new difficulties and dangers began there. He defended himself feverishly, and went on, taking less care each moment. In the rustle he heard the voices of men, conversation, it seemed to him that the pond was talking about him. 
Will he reach the swamp or not? Will he go on shore or not? The mosquitoes sang with their thin voices more sadly. The water became deeper, soon it reached to his belt, then to his breast. He thought that if he should have to swim, he would be entangled in the thick web and drown. Again an almost irrestrainable, unconquerable desire of calling Volodyovsky seized him. He had already put his hand to his mouth to cry, Michael. Michael. Fortunately some kind reed struck him with its wet, dripping brush in the face. He came to his mind, and saw in front but a little to one side a dim light. He looked steadily at the light, and went straight toward it for a while. He stopped suddenly. He saw a belt of clear water lying athwart him. He drew breath. It was the river, and on both sides of it a swamp. I will stop going by the shore, and will go into that wedge, thought he. On both sides of the wedge extended two strips of reeds. The knight entered that one to which he had come. After a while he saw he was on a good road. He looked around. The pond was already behind him. He moved parallel with the narrow strip of water, which could be nothing but the river. The water there was cooler also. But after a time terrible weariness possessed him. His legs trembled, and before his eyes rose as it were a dark fog. It cannot be helped, I will go to the shore and lie down. I will not go farther, I will rest. Then he fell on his knees. His hands felt a dry tuft covered with moss, it was like a little island among the rushes. He sat down and began to wipe his bloody face with his hands, and then to draw long breaths. After a while the odor of smoke reached his nostrils. Turning to the shore, he saw, about a hundred paces from the brink, a fire, and around it a knot of people. He was directly in front of this fire, and at moments when the wind bent the reeds he could see everything perfectly. At the first glance he recognized the Tartar horse herds, who were sitting at the fire eating. Then he felt a fearful hunger. Yesterday morning he had eaten a bit of horse flesh which would not have satisfied a wolf whelp two months old, since then he had had nothing in his mouth. He began to pluck the round stems growing about him and suck them greedily. He allayed his thirst as well as his hunger, for thirst tormented him too. At the same time he looked continually at the fire which grew paler and dimmer. The people near it began to be hidden by a mist, and seemed to go into the distance. Oh, sleep torments me. I will sleep here on the mound, thought the knight. But there was a noise by the fire. The horse herds rose. Soon there came to Skshetuski's ears the cries, Losh! Losh! They were answered by a short neigh. The fire was deserted and went out. After a time he heard whistling and the dull thump of hoofs on the moist meadow. Skshetuski could not understand why the horse herds had ridden away. Then he saw the tops of the reeds and the broad leaves of the lilies were somewhat pale. The water received a different light from that of the moon, the air was shrouded with a light of joy. He looked around. The day was breaking. He had spent the whole night in going around the pond before reaching the river and the swamp. He was barely at the beginning of the road. Now he must go by the river and pass through the Tabor in the day. The air was filled more and more with the light of dawn. In the east the sky took on a pale sea-green color. Skshetuski slipped down again from the tuft into the swamp, and pushing toward the shore, after a short interval thrust his head out of the reeds. At the distance of five hundred yards, perhaps, a tartar picket was visible. With this exception the meadow was empty, only the fire shone with a dying light on a dry place at some little distance. Skshetuski determined to crawl to it through the high grass interspersed here and there with tall rushes. Having crawled to the place, he looked carefully to find some remnants of food. He found in fact freshly picked mutton bones with bits of sinew and fat, then some pieces of roasted turnips thrown into the hot ashes. He began to eat with the greed of a wild beast, and ate till he saw that the pickets stationed along the road which he had passed were approaching him through the meadow on their way to the Tabor. Then he began to retreat, and in a few minutes disappeared in the wall of reeds. Having found his tuft, 
he put himself on it without a rustle. The pickets rode by at the same time. Skshetuski began at once on the bones which he had brought with him, and which he broke in his jaws, powerful as those of a wolf. He gnawed off the fat and the sinews, sucked out the marrow, chewed the bone fat, allayed his first hunger. Such a morning feast he had not had for a long time in Zbaraj. He felt stronger now. The food, as well as the rising day, strengthened him. It became brighter every moment. The eastern side of the sky from greenish became rosy and golden. The cool of the morning troubled him greatly, it is true, but he was comforted by the thought that the sun would soon warm his wearied body. He examined the place carefully. The tuft was pretty large, rather short, because round, but wide enough for two persons to lie side by side with ease. The reed stood around like a wall, hiding it completely from the eyes of men. They will not find me here, thought he, unless they go fishing in the reeds, and there are no fish, for they have died of infection. Here will I rest and think what further to do. And he began to think whether he should go on by the river or not. Finally he determined to go if the wind should rise and the reeds tremble. If not, the noise and rustle might betray him, especially as most likely he would have to pass near the tabor. Thanks to thee, O Lord, that I am alive till now, whispered he quietly. And he raised his eyes to heaven. Then his thoughts flew away to the Polish ramparts. The castle was visible from that tuft, especially since it was gilded by the first rays of the rising sun. Maybe someone is looking from the tower to the pond and reads through a field glass. Volodyovsky is there surely. And Zagloba will pass the whole day in looking from the ramparts to see if he can find him hanging on some moving tower. They will not see me, thought the knight, and his breast was full of the happy feeling of security. They will not see me, they will not see me, he repeated several times. I have passed only a short road, but it had to be passed. God will help me to go farther. Here he saw, with the eyes of his imagination, beyond the tabor, in the forest, behind which stand the armies of the king, the general militia of the whole country, hussars, infantry. Foreign regiments. The earth groaned under the weight of men, horses, and cannon, and in the midst of this swarm of people is the king himself. Then he saw an immense battle, broken tabors, the prince with all his cavalry flying over piles of bodies, the greetings of armies. His eyes, aching and swollen, closed beneath the excess of light, and his head bent under the excess of thought, a kind of pleasant weakness began to embrace him. At last he stretched himself at full length and fell asleep. The reeds rustled. The sun rose high in the sky, warmed with its burning glance the night, and dried the clothing on his body. He slept soundly without motion. Whoever should see him lying thus on the tuft with bloody face, would think that a corpse thrown up by the water was lying there. Hours passed, still he slept. The sun reached the zenith, and began to descend the other side of the sky, he was sleeping yet. He was roused by the piercing cry of horses feeding on the meadow, and the loud calls of the herdsmen lashing the stallions with whips. He rubbed his eyes, remembered where he was, looked in the sky, stars were twinkling in the red and still unquenched gleams of the sunset. He had slept the whole day. He felt neither refreshed nor stronger, all his bones were aching. He thought, however, that new toil would restore the activity of his body, and putting his feet into the water he moved on his journey without delay. He went now through clear water by the reeds, so as not to rouse the attention of the horse herds on shore by the rustle. The last gleams had disappeared and it was quite dark, for the moon had not risen yet from behind the woods. The water was so deep that Skshetuski lost bottom in places and had to swim, which was difficult to do, for he was dressed, and he swam against the current, which, though slow, still pushed him back toward the pond. But as a recompense the sharpest Tartar eyes could not see that head advancing along the dark wall of reeds. He pushed on therefore rather boldly, swimming at times, but for the greater part wading to his waist and armpits, till at last he reached the place from which his eyes beheld. On both sides of the river, thousands upon thousands of lights. 
These are the tabers, thought he, now God aid me. And he listened. The bustle of mingled voices reached his ear. Yes, these were the tabers. On the left bank of the river stood the Cossack camp with thousands of wagons and tents. On the right the Tartar camp, both noisy, uproarious, full of conversation, wild sounds of drums and flutes, bellowing of cattle, camels, neighing of horses, shouts. The river divided them, forming a barrier against disputes and fights, for the Tartars could not remain in peace at the side of the Cossacks. The river was widest at this place, and perhaps dug out on purpose. On one side the wagons, on the other reed huts were near the bank, judging by the fires, within a few score of yards. But at the water itself there were surely pickets. The reeds and rushes became thinner, opposite the camps the banks were evidently bare. Skshetuski pushed on some yards farther, and halted. A certain power and terror came out against him from those swarms. At that moment it seemed to him that all the watchfulness and rage of those thousands of human beings were turned upon him, and in presence of them he felt perfectly helpless. He was alone. No one can pass them, thought he, but he pushed on still, for a certain painful, irrestrainable curiosity attracted him. He wished to look more nearly on that terrible power. Suddenly he stopped. The forest of reeds ended as if cut with a knife, perhaps they had been cut to make cabins. Farther on the clear water was red from the reflection of the fires. Two great and clear flames were blazing there at the banks. Before one stood a Tartar on horseback, before the other a Cossack with a long lance in his hand. Both looked at each other and at the water. In the distance were to be seen others standing on guard in the same way and looking. The gleam of the piles threw as it were a fiery bridge across the river. Under the banks were to be seen rows of small boats used by the guards on the pond. An impossibility, muttered Skshetuski. Despair seized him at once. He could neither go backward nor forward. The time had been passing as he was pushing through the swamps and reeds breathing the infected air and soaked in water. Only to discover after he had come to those very camps through which he had undertaken to pass, that it was impossible. But it was impossible to go back, the knight knew that he might find sufficient strength to drag himself ahead, but he could not find it to go back. In his despair there was at the same time a dull rage, for the first time he wished to emerge from the water, throttle the guard, then rush on the crowd and perish. Again the wind began to move along the reeds with a wonderful whisper, bringing with it the sound of bells from Zbaraj. Skshetuski began to pray ardently and beat his breast, imploring aid from heaven with the strength and the desperate faith of a drowning man. He prayed, but the two camps roared ominously as if in answer to his prayer. Black figures and figures red from fire pushed around like herds of devils in hell. The guards stood motionless. The river flowed on with its blood-colored water. The fires will go down when deep night comes, said Pan Yen to himself, and waited. One hour passed, and another. The noise decreased. The fires really began to smolder, except the two fires of the guards, which blazed up more brightly. The guards were changed, and it was evident that the fresh ones would remain till morning. The thought came to Skshetuski that perhaps he might be able to slip through more easily in the daytime, but he soon abandoned that idea. In the daytime they took water, watered the cattle, bathed. The river must be full of people. Suddenly his glance fell upon the boats. On both banks of the river there was a number of them in a line, and on the Tartar side the rushes extended to the first boat. Skshetuski sank in the water to his neck, and pushed slowly toward the boats, keeping his eyes fastened on the Tartar guard as on a rainbow. At the end of half an hour he was at the first boat. His plan was simple. The sterns of the boats were raised over the water, forming above it a kind of arch through which the head of a man might pass easily. If all the boats stood side by side there, the Tartar guard could not see a head pushing under them. There was more danger from the Cossack. But he might not see it, for under the boats, notwithstanding the opposite fire, it was dark. Anyhow there was no other passage. Skshetuski hesitated no longer, 
and soon found himself under the sterns of the boats. He crawled on his hands and feet, or rather dragged himself, for the water was shallow. He was so near the tartar standing on the bank that he heard the breathing of his horse. He stopped a moment and listened. Fortunately the boats were placed side by side. He had his eyes then fastened on the Cossack guard, whom he saw as on the palm of his hand. The Cossack was looking at the Tartar camp. Skshetuski had passed fifteen boats, when suddenly he heard steps on shore and Tartar voices. He stopped immediately and listened. In his journeys to the Crimea he had learned Tartar. Now a shiver ran through his whole body when he heard the words of command, Get in and go. He grew feverish, though he was in the water. If they should take the boat under which he was hiding, that moment he was lost, if they should take the one before him he was lost too, for there remained an open lighted space. Each second seemed to him an hour. Soon steps sounded on the planks. The Tartars sat in the fourth or fifth boat behind him, pushed it out and began to sail in the direction of the pond. But that movement directed the eyes of the Cossack guard to the boats. Skshetuski did not stir for something like half an hour. Only when the guards were changed did he resume his onward movement. In this way he reached the end of the boats. After the last boat began the rushes again, and farther on the reeds. When he reached the rushes the knight, breathless, dripping with perspiration, fell upon his knees and thanked God with his whole heart. He hastened on somewhat more boldly, taking advantage of every breeze which filled the banks with rustling. From time to time he looked around. The guard fires began to retreat, to be hidden, to glimmer, to weaken. The lines of rushes and reeds became darker and thicker, for the shores were more swampy. The guards could not stand close to one another, the noise of the camp grew less. A kind of superhuman power strengthened the limbs of the night. He pushed through reeds, clumps of earth, sank in the swamp, went under water, swam, and rose again. He did not dare yet to go on shore, but he almost felt that he was saved. He could not render account to himself of how long he advanced, waiting in this way, but when he looked around again the watchfires seemed like little points gleaming in the distance. A few hundred yards farther, and they vanished altogether. The moon went down, around about was silence. Now a noise was heard louder and more solemn than the rustle of the reeds. Skshetuski came near screaming with joy, the woods were on both sides of the river. He turned then to the bank and came out of the reeds. The pine forest began here, beyond the rushes and reeds. The odor of rosin came to his nostrils, here and there in the depths shone the fern, like silver. He fell a second time on his knees, and kissed the earth in prayer. He was saved. Then he entered the forest darkness, asking himself where he should go, where those forests would take him, where the king and the army were. His journey was not finished. It was not easy, it was not safe. But when he thought that he had come out of Zbaraj, that he had stolen through the guards, swamps, tabers, and almost half a million of enemies, then it seemed to him that all dangers were past. That that forest was a clear highway which would lead him straight to his majesty the king. And that wretched-looking, hungry, shivering man, bespattered with his own blood, with red filth, and black mud, passed on with joy in his heart. And hoped that he would soon return in different circumstances and with greater power. They will not be left hungry and hopeless, thought he of his friends in Zbaraj, for the king will come. His heart rejoiced at the near rescue of the prince, the commanding officers, Volodyovsky, Zagloba, and all those heroes confined in the ramparts. The forest depths opened before him and covered him with their shade. Chapter 62 In the drawing-room of the court at Toporov sat three magnates one evening in secret consultation. A number of bright lights were burning on a table covered with maps of the surrounding country. Near them lay a tall cap with a dark plume, a field glass, and a sword with hilt set in pearls, on which was thrown a handkerchief embroidered with a crown, and a pair of elkskin gloves. Near the table, in a high-armed chair, sat a man about forty years of age, rather small and slender, but powerfully built. He had a swarthy, 
sallow, wearied face, black eyes, and a Swedish wig of the same color, with long locks falling on his neck and shoulders. A thin black mustache, trimmed upward at the ends, adorned his upper lip. His lower lip with his beard protruded strongly, giving his whole physiognomy a characteristic mark of pride and stubbornness. It was not a beautiful face, but unusually lofty. A sensuous expression, indicating an inclination to pleasure, was combined in it with a certain sleepy torpor and coldness. The eyes were as if smoldering. But it was easy to guess that in a moment of exaltation, joy, or anger they could cast lightnings which not every eye might meet. At the same time kindness and affability were depicted on his countenance. The black dress, composed of a satin doublet with lace ruffles, from under which a gold chain was visible, increased the distinction of this uncommon figure. On the whole, in spite of sadness and anxiety evident in the face and form, there was something majestic in them. In fact it was the king himself, Yen Kazimir Vaza, who had succeeded his brother Vladislav somewhat less than a year before. A little behind him, in the half-shade, sat Hieronym Radzievsky, the starosta of Lomjin, a thick, corpulent, low-set, red-visaged man with the unblushing face of a courtier. And opposite him, at the table, a third personage, leaning on his elbow, looking at the maps representing the country around, raising from time to time his eyes to the king. His face had less majesty, but almost more official distinction, than that of the king. The cool and reasoning face of the statesman was furrowed with cares and thought, the severity of which had not marred his unusual beauty. He had penetrating blue eyes. His complexion was delicate, in spite of his age. A magnificent Polish dress, a beard trimmed in Swedish fashion, and the lofty tuft above his forehead, added still something of senatorial dignity to his features, regular as if chiseled from stone. This was Jerzy Ossolinsky, Chancellor of the Crown, a Prince of the Roman Empire, an orator, and a diplomat admired by the courts of Europe, the famous opponent of Jeremy Vishniewiecki. His unusual abilities turned upon him early in life the attention of preceding reigns, and soon raised him to the highest offices, in virtue of which he guided the ship of state. At the present moment near its final wreck. But still the Chancellor was as if created to be the helmsman of such a ship. Laborious, enduring, wise, looking to the distant future, calculating for long years, he would have directed any other state but the Commonwealth to a safe harbor with a sure and steady hand. For every other state he would have secured internal power and long years of strength, if he had only been the absolute minister of such a monarch, for example, as the King of France or Spain. Reared beyond the boundaries of his own country, furnished with foreign models, in spite of all his innate quickness of mind, in spite of long years of practice. He was unable to accustom himself to the helplessness of government in the Commonwealth. And all his life he could not learn to reckon with it, though that was the rock on which all his plans, designs, and efforts were wrecked. Though by reason of this he saw now in the future a precipice and ruin, and later died with despair in his heart. He was a genial theorist who did not know how to be genial in practice, and he fell into a circle of errors without issue. Possessing an idea which might give fruit in the future, he went to the realization of it with the stubbornness of a fanatic, not observing that that idea, saving in theory, might, in view of the actual condition of affairs, bring terrible disasters. Wishing to strengthen the government and the state, he let loose the terrible Cossack element, not foreseeing that the storm would turn not only against the nobles. The great estates of the magnates, the abuses, license of the nobility, but against the most vital interests of the state itself. Melnitsky rose out of the steps and grew into a giant. On the Commonwealth fell the defeats of Jaltia Vodi, Korsan, Palavtsi. At the first step this Melnitsky joined with the enemy, the Crimean power. Thunderbolt followed Thunderbolt, there remained only war and war. The terrible element should have been crushed first of all, so as to use it in the future. But the Chancellor, occupied with his idea, was still negotiating and delaying, and still believed even Melnitsky. The power of events crushed his theories. 
it became clearer every day that the results of the Chancellor's efforts were directly opposed to his expectations, till at last came Zberage and confirmed it most convincingly. The Chancellor was staggering under the burden of regrets, bitterness, and universal hatred. He did that therefore which in times of failure and disaster people do whose faith in themselves is greater than all disasters, he looked for the guilty. The whole commonwealth was to blame, and all the estates, the past, and the aristocratic structure of the state. But he who fearing lest a rock lying on the incline of a mountain might fall to the bottom, wishes to roll it to the top without calculating the necessary force to do this, only hastens its fall. The Chancellor did more and worse, for he called in the rushing and terrible Cossack torrent. Not considering that its force could only wash out and carry off the foundation on which the rock was resting. When he sought then for persons to blame, all eyes were turned upon himself as the cause of the war, the calamities and misfortune. But the king believed in him yet, and believed in him the more because the voice of all without sparing his majesty accused him in an equal degree with the chancellor. The king sat therefore in Toporov suffering and sad, not knowing well what to do, for he had only twenty-five thousand troops. The conscript writs had been sent out too late, and barely a part of the general militia had assembled up to that time. Who was the cause of this delay, and was it not one more mistake of that stubborn policy of the Chancellor, the mystery was lost between the King and the Minister. It is enough that both felt disarmed at that moment before the power of Melnitsky. What was more important yet, they had no accurate information concerning him. In the camp of the King it was still unknown whether the Khan with all his forces was with Melnitsky, or only Tugai Bey and a few thousands of the horde were accompanying the Cossacks. This was a matter as important as life or death. With Melnitsky himself the king might in extremities try his fortune, though the rebellious hetman disposed of ten times greater power. The magic of the king's name meant much for the Cossacks, more perhaps than the crowds of the general militia of unformed and untrained nobles. But if the Khan were present, it was an impossibility to meet such superior force. Meanwhile there were the most varied reports on this head, and no one knew anything accurately. The careful Melnitsky had concentrated his forces, he had not let out a single party of Cossacks or Tartars on purpose, that the king might not capture an informant. The rebellious hetman had another plan, it was to shut in with a part of his forces Zberage, already dying and appear himself unexpectedly with the whole Tartar and remaining Cossack force before the king, surround him and his army, and deliver him into the hands of the Khan. It was not without reason then that a cloud covered the royal face, for there is no greater pain for a king than a feeling of weakness. Yen Kazimir leaned impotently on the back of the chair, threw his hands on the table and said, pointing to the maps. These are useless. Get me informants. There is nothing I wish for more, answered Ossolinsky. Have the scouts returned? They have returned, but brought no one. Not a single prisoner. Only neighboring peasants who know nothing. But Pan Pelka, has he returned? He is a splendid partisan. Your Majesty, said the Starosta of Lomjin, from behind the chair. Pan Pelka has not returned, and he will not, for he is killed. A moment of silence followed. The king fixed his gloomy look on the flickering light, and began to drum with his fingers on the table. Have you no help? asked he at length. Wait, said the chancellor, with importance. The forehead of Yen Kazimir was covered with wrinkles, wait, repeated he, and Vishnevetsky and the commanders will be in worse condition under Zbarage. They will hold out a while yet, said Radziovsky, carelessly. You might be silent if you have nothing good to offer, said the king. I have my own counsel, your majesty. What is it? To send someone as if to negotiate with Melnitsky at Zbarage. The envoy will discover whether the Khan is there in his own person, and will report when he returns. Impossible, said the king. Now when we have proclaimed him a rebel and laid a price on his head, have given the baton of the Zaporozhans to Zabuski, it is not becoming our dignity to enter into negotiations with him. Then send to the Khan, said the Starosta. The king turned an inquiring glance on the Chancellor, 
who raised upon him his blue, severe eye, and after a moment's thought answered, the council would be good were it not that Melnitsky, beyond a doubt, would detain the envoy, and for this reason it would serve no purpose. Yen Kazimir waved his hand. I see, said he, slowly, that you have no plan, then I will tell you mine. I will order to horse, and move with the whole army to Zbaraj. Let the will of God be done. There we shall discover whether the Khan is present or not. The Chancellor knew the daring of the King, restrainable by nothing, and he doubted not that he was ready to do this. On the other hand he knew from experience that when the King had something in view and was opposed in the undertaking, no dissuasion was of avail. Therefore he did not oppose him at once, he even praised the idea, but he dissuaded from haste, explained to the king that it could be done tomorrow or the day after. In the meanwhile favorable news might come. Every day would increase the dissension of the rabble, weakened by disasters at Zberaj and by the news of his majesty's approach. The rebellion might dissolve from the presence of the king, as snow from the rays of the sun, but time was necessary. The king bears within himself the salvation of the whole commonwealth, and responsibility before God and posterity. He should not expose himself, especially since, in case of misfortune, the forces at Zbaraj would be lost beyond redemption. Do what you like, if I only have an informant tomorrow. Again a moment of silence. An enormous golden moon shone in through the window, but it was darker in the room, for the tapers needed trimming. What o'clock? asked the king. Almost midnight, answered Radziovsky. I will not sleep tonight. I will go around the camp, and do you go with me? Where are Ubald and Artsyshevsky? In the camp. I will go and order the horses, answered the starosta. He approached the door. At that moment there was some movement in the antechamber. A lively conversation was audible, the sound of hurried steps, then the doors opened halfway, and Tizenhaus, the personal attendant of the king, rushed in panting. Your Majesty, cried he, an officer has come from Zbaraj. The king sprang from his chair, the chancellor rose too, and from the mouths of both came the cry, impossible. Yes, he is standing in the antechamber. Bring him here, cried the king, clapping his hands. Let him end our anxiety. This way with him, in the name of the Most Holy Mother. Tizenhaus vanished through the door, and after a moment there appeared instead of him some tall, unknown form. Nearer, cried the king, nearer. We are glad to see you. The officer pushed up to the table, and at sight of him, the king, the chancellor, and the starosta of Lomjan drew back in astonishment. Before them stood a kind of frightful-looking man, or rather an apparition. Rags torn to shreds barely covered his emaciated body. His face was blue, covered with mud and blood, his eyes burning with feverish light, his black tangled beard fell toward his breast. The odor of corpses went forth from him roundabout, and his legs trembled to such a degree that he was forced to lean on the table. The king and the two dignitaries looked on him with staring eyes. At that moment the doors opened and a crowd of dignitaries, military and civil, came in, and among them, the generals Ubald and Artsyshevsky, with Sapiha, vice-chancellor of Lithuania. All stood behind the king, looking at the newly arrived. The king asked, Who are you? The miserable-looking man tried to speak, but a spasm seized his jaw. His beard began to tremble, and he was able only to whisper, From, Zbaraj. Give him wine, said a voice. In the twinkle of an eye a goblet was filled, he drank it with difficulty. By this time the Chancellor had taken off his own cloak and covered the man's shoulders with it. Can you speak now? inquired the king after a time. I can, he answered, with a voice of more confidence. Who are you? Yen Skshatuski, Colonel of Hussars. In whose service? The Voivoda of Rus. A murmur spread through the hall. What news have you, what news have you, asked the king, feverishly. Suffering, hunger, the grave. The king covered his eyes. Jesus of Nazareth. 
Jesus of Nazareth, said he in a low voice. After a while he asked again, Can you hold out long? There is lack of powder. The enemy is on the ramparts. In force? Melnitsky, the Khan with all his hordes. Is the Khan there? He is. Deep silence followed. Those present looked at one another, uncertainty was on every face. How could you hold out? asked the Chancellor, with an accent of doubt. At these words Skshatuski raised his head, as if new power entered him. A flash of pride passed over his face, and he answered with a voice strong beyond expectation, twenty assaults repulsed, sixteen battles in the field won, seventy-five sallies. Again silence followed. Then the king straightened himself, shook his wig as a lion would his mane, on his sallow face came out a blush, and his eyes flashed. As God lives! cried he, I've enough of these counsels, of this halting, of this delay. Whether the Khan is there or not, whether the general militia has come or not, I have enough of this. We will move today on Zbaraj. To Zbaraj. To Zbaraj, was repeated by a number of powerful voices. The face of the newly arrived brightened like the dawn. Your Majesty, we will live and die with you. At these words the noble heart of the king grew soft as wax, and without regarding the repulsive appearance of the knight. He pressed his head with his hands and said, You are dearer to me than others in satin. By the Most Holy Mother, men for less service are rewarded with starostaships. But what you have done will not pass unrewarded. I am your debtor. Others began immediately to call out after the king, There has been no greater knight. He is the first among the men of Zbaraj. You have won immortal glory. And how did you push through the Cossacks and Tartars? I hid in the swamp, the reeds, went through the woods, got astray, ate nothing. Give him to eat, cried the king. To eat! repeated others. Clothe him. They will give you horses and clothing tomorrow, said the king again. You shall want for nothing. All, following the king, surpassed one another in praises of the knight. Then they began again to hurl questions at him, to which he answered with the greatest difficulty, for growing weakness had seized him, he was barely half conscious. Meanwhile they brought him refreshments, and at the same time entered the priest Tsetsushovsky, the chaplain of the king. The dignitaries made way for him, for he was a very learned man, and respected. His word had almost more weight with the king than that of the chancellor, and from the pulpit he gave utterance to words such as few would dare to say at the diet. The priest was surrounded then, and they began to tell him that an officer had come from Zbaraj. That the prince was there, though in hunger and wretchedness, and was still beating the Khan, who was present in his own person, as well as Melnitsky, who during the whole past year had not lost so many men as at Zbaraj. Finally, that the king was going to move to his succor, even if he had to lose his whole army. The priest listened in silence, moving his lips and looking every moment at the emaciated knight, who was eating at the time, for the king had commanded him not to mind his presence. And he even waited on him himself, and from time to time drank to him from a little silver goblet. What is the name of this knight? asked the priest at last. Skshatuski. Yen? Yes. Colonel with the Voivoda of Rus? Yes. The priest raised his wrinkled face, prayed again, and said, Let us praise the name of the Lord, for undiscoverable are the ways by which he brings a man to happiness and peace. Amen. I know this officer. Skshatuski heard, and involuntarily turned his eyes to the face of the priest, but his face, form, and voice were completely unknown to him. You are the man out of the whole army who undertook to pass through the enemy's camp, asked the priest. A worthy man tried before me, but he perished. The greater is your service, since after him you dared. I see by your suffering that the road must have been an awful one. God looked on your sacrifice, on your virtue, on your youth, and he led you through. Suddenly the priest turned to Yen Kazimir. Your gracious majesty, said he, 
it is then your unchangeable decision to march to the rescue of the Voivoda of Rus? To your prayers, Father, answered the king, I commit the country, the army, and myself, for I know it is an awful undertaking. But I cannot permit that the prince should perish behind those unfortunate ramparts, with such knights as this officer. God send down victory, cried a number of voices. The priest raised his hands to heaven, and silence followed in the hall. I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen, said the king. Amen, repeated all the voices. Peace was spread over the face of Yen Kazimir after his previous suffering, but his eyes shot forth unusual gleams. Among all assembled rose the buzz of conversation about the impending campaign, for it was much doubted yet whether the king could move at once. He took his sword, however, from the table, and nodded to Tizenhaus to gird him. When does your majesty think of marching? asked the chancellor. God has granted a pleasant night, said the king. The horses will not be heated. Commander of the camp, he added, turning to the dignitaries, order the march to be sounded. The commander of the camp left the room at once. Ossolinsky, the chancellor, said with quiet dignity that all were not ready, that they could not move the wagons before day. But the king answered immediately, let that man remain to whom the wagons are dearer than the country. The hall grew empty. Each man hastened to his standard, put everything in order, and prepared for the march. Only the king, the chancellor, the priest, with Skshetuski and Tizenhaus, remained in the room. Gentlemen, said the priest, you have learned already from this officer what you had to learn. He should now get rest, for he is barely able to stand on his feet. Allow me, your majesty, to take him to my quarters for the night. All right, father, replied the king. Your demand is just. Let Tizenhaus and someone else conduct him, for surely he cannot walk alone. Go, go, dear friend, said he, no one has earned his rest better than you. And remember that I am your debtor. Henceforth I shall forget myself rather than you. Tizenhaus caught Skshetuski under the arm and they passed into the antechamber. They met Sapiha, who supported the tottering knight on the other side. The priest went in advance, before him a boy with a lantern. But the boy carried it to no purpose, for the night was clear, calm, and warm. The great golden moon sailed over Toporov like a boat. From the square of the camp came the bustle of men, the creaking of wagons, the noise of trumpets sounding the tattoo. At some distance, in front of the church lighted by the gleams of the moon, were already visible crowds of soldiers, infantry and cavalry. Horses were neighing in the village. To the creaking of wagons was joined the clatter of chains and the dull thump of cannon. The uproar increased every moment. They are moving already, said the priest. On Zbarage, to the rescue, whispered Pan Yen. And whether from joy or from the toils he had endured, or from both together, he grew so weak that Tizenhaus and the starosta were obliged almost to drag him along. When they were turning to the priest's house they went among the soldiers standing in front of the building. These were the cavalry of Sapiha and the infantry of Artsyshevsky. Not in rank yet for the march, they stood without order, crowded in places and hindering the passage. Out of the road, out of the road, cried the priest. Who wants the road? An officer from Zbaraj. With the forehead to him. With the forehead to him, cried many voices. A way was opened at once, but some crowded the more to see the hero. They looked with astonishment on that suffering, on that terrible face, lighted by the gleam of the moon, and they whispered in wonder, from Zbaraj. From Zbaraj. The priest brought Skshetuski to the house with the greatest difficulty. After he had been bathed and washed from the mud and blood, he had him put in the bed of the priest of the place, and went out himself at once to the army, which was moving to the march. Skshetuski was half conscious. Fever did not let him sleep immediately, he knew not where he was, or what had happened. He heard only the noise, the tramp, the rumble of wagons, the thundering tread of infantry, the shouts of soldiers, then the blare of trumpets. 
and all this was mingled in his ears in one enormous sound. The army is moving, he muttered. That sound began to retreat, to weaken, to vanish, to melt, till at last silence embraced Toporov. Then it seemed to Skshatusky that together with the bed he was flying into some bottomless abyss. Chapter 63 Skshatusky slept a number of days, and when he woke he had a violent fever, and suffered long. He talked of Zberage, of the prince, of the starosta of Krasnovstav. He talked with Pan Michael, with Zagloba, he cried, not this way, to Pan Longin, of the princess alone he spoke not a word. It was clear that the great power with which he had confined in himself the memory of her did not desert him a moment even in weakness and pain. At that moment, he seemed to see hanging over him the chubby face of Genzian. Precisely as he saw it when the prince after the battle of Konstantinov sent him with troops to Zaslav to cut down lawless bands, and Genzian appeared to him unexpectedly at his night quarters. This face brought confusion to his mind, for it seemed to him that time halted in its flight, and that nothing had changed from that period. So he is again at Komor, is sleeping in the cottage, is marching to Tarnopol to give over his troops, Krivonos, beaten at Konstantinov, has fled to Melnitsky. Jensian has come from Gushchi, and sits with him. Skshatusky wanted to talk, wanted to order the lad to have the horse saddled, but could not. And again it comes into his head that he is not at Komor, that since that time too was the taking of Bar. Here Skshatusky halted in his pain, and his unfortunate head sank in darkness. He knows nothing now, sees nothing, but at times out of that chaos comes the heroism of Zberage, the siege. He is not at Komor then. But still Genzian is sitting over him, bending toward him. Through an opening in the shutters a narrow bright ray comes into the room, and lights completely the face of the youth, full of care and sympathy. Genzian, cried Skshatusky, suddenly. Oh, my master! Do you know me already? cried the youth, and fell at the feet of his master. I thought you would never wake again. A moment of silence followed. Only the sobbing of the youth could be heard as he continued to press the feet of his master. Where am I? asked Skshatusky. In Toporov. You came from Zberage to the king. Praise be to God. And where is the king? He went with the army to rescue the prince. Silence followed. Tears of joy continued to flow along the face of Genzian, who after a while began to repeat with a voice of emotion, that I should look on your body again. Then he opened the shutters and the window. Fresh morning air came into the room, and with it the bright light of day. With this light came all Skshatusky's presence of mind. Genzian sat at the foot of the bed. Then I came out of Zbarage? Yes, my master. No one could do that but you, and on your account the king went to the rescue. Pan Podbipienta tried before me, but he perished. Oh, for God's sake! Pan Podbipienta, such a liberal man, so virtuous. My breath leaves me. How could they kill such a strong man? They shot him with arrows. And Pan Volodyovsky and Zagloba? They were well when I came out. Praise be to God. They are great friends of yours, my master, but the priest won't let me talk. Genzian was silent, and for a time was working at something with his head. Thoughtfulness was expressed on his ruddy face. After a while he said, my master? Well, what is it? What will be done with the fortune of Pan Podbipienta? Very likely he has villages and every kind of property beyond measure, unless he has left it to his friends. For, as I hear, he has no relatives. Skshatusky made no answer. Genzian knew then that he did not like the question, and began as follows. But God be praised that Pan Zagloba and Pan Volodyovsky are well. I thought that the Tartars had caught them. We went through a world of trouble together, but the priest won't let me talk. Oh, my master, I thought that I should never see them again, for the horde so pressed upon us that there was no help. Then you were with Pan Volodyovsky and Zagloba? They did not tell me anything about that. 
for they didn't know whether I was dead or alive. And where did the horde press on you so? Beyond Pluskiri, on the road to Zberaj. For, my master, we traveled far beyond Yampol, but the priest Setsushovsky won't let me talk. A moment of silence. May God reward you for all your good wishes and labors, said Skshatuski, for I know why you went there. I was there before you to no purpose. Oh, my master, if only that priest, but this is how it is. I must go with the king to Zberaj, and do you, says he, take care of your master. Don't you tell him anything, for the soul will go out of him. Pan Yen had parted long since from every hope to such a degree that even these words of Genzian did not rouse in him the least spark. He lay for a time motionless, and then inquired, Where did you come from Tetsetsushovsky and the army? The wife of the castellan, Pani Vitovska, sent me from Zamost to inform her husband that she would join him at Toporov. She is a brave lady, my master, and wishes to be with the army, so as not to be away from her husband. I came to Toporov the day before you. She will be here soon, ought to be here now. But what if he has gone away with the king? I don't understand how you could be in Zamost when you went with Volodyovsky and Zagloba beyond Yampol. Why didn't you come to Zbaraj with them? You see, my master, the horde pressed us sorely. There was no help. So they two alone resisted a whole shambol, and I fled and never drew bridle till I reached Zamost. It was happy they were not killed, but I thought you were a better fellow. Was it manly of you to leave them in such straits? But, my master, if there had been only three of us, should not have left them, you may be sure, but there were four of us. Therefore they threw themselves against the horde. And ordered me to save, if I were sure that joy wouldn't kill you, for beyond Yampol we found, but since the priest. Skshatuski began to look at the youth. And to open and shut his eyes like a man waking from sleep. Suddenly it seemed as though something had broken within him, for he grew pale, sat up in the bed, and cried with a thundering voice, Who was with you? My master, my master! called the youth, struck with the change that had come on the face of the night. Who was with you? cried Skshatuski. And seizing Jensian by the shoulder, he shook him, began himself to tremble as in a fever, and pressed the youth in his iron hands. I'll tell anyhow, shouted Jensian, let the priest do what he likes. The princess was with us, and she is now with Pani Vitovska. Pan Yen grew rigid. He closed his eyes, and his head fell heavily on the pillow. Help, cried Genzian. Surely, my master, you have breathed your last. Help. What have I done? Better I had been silent. Oh, for God's sake. My master, dearest master, but speak. For God's sake. The priest was right. My master, my master. Oh. This is nothing, said Skshatuski at length. Where is she? Praise be to God that you have revived. Better for me to say nothing. She is with Pani Vitovska, you will soon see them here. Praise be to God, my master. Only don't die, you will see them soon. The priest gave her to Pani Vitovska for safe keeping, because there are libertines in the army. Bogan respected her but misfortune is easily found. I had a world of trouble. But I told the soldiers, she is a relative of Prince Yeremy, and they respected her. I had to give away no small money on the road. Skshatuski lay motionless again. But his eyes were open, turned to the ceiling, and his face very serious. It was evident he was praying. When he had finished, he sprang up, sat on the bed, and said, give me my clothes, and have the horse saddled. If you knew, my master, what a plenty of everything there is. For the king before going gave much, and others gave. And there are three splendid horses in the stable, if I only had one like them, but you would better lie and rest a little, for you have no strength yet. There is nothing the matter with me. I can sit on a horse. In the name of the living God, make haste. I know that your body is of iron, let it be as you say. 
but defend me from the priest. Here are your clothes. Better cannot be had from the Armenian merchants. You can choose, and I'll tell them to bring wine, for I told the priest's servant to heat some. Jensian occupied himself with the food, and Skshetuski began to put on hastily the clothes presented by the king and others. But from time to time he seized the youth by the shoulders and pressed him to his bosom. Jensian told him everything from the beginning, how Bogan, stricken down by Volodyovsky, but already partly recovered, had met him in Vlodava, and how he had learned of the princess from him. And received the baton. How he had gone subsequently with Volodyovsky and Zagloba to Valadinka, and having killed the witch and Cherimus, had taken away the princess. And finally, what peril they were in while fleeing before the forces of Burlai. Pan Zagloba killed Burlai, interrupted Skshetuski, feverishly. He is a valiant man, answered Jensian. I have never seen his equal, for one is brave, another eloquent, a third cunning, but all these are sitting together in Zagloba. But the worst of all that happened was in those woods behind Pluskiri, when the horde pursued us. Pan Volodyovsky with Zagloba remained behind to attract them and stop the pursuit, I rushed off sidewise toward Konstantinov, leaving Zbaraj. For I thought this way, that after they had killed the little man and Zagloba they would pursue us to Zbaraj. Indeed, I don't know how the Lord in his mercy rescued the little man and Pan Zagloba. I thought they were cut to pieces. Meanwhile I with the princess slipped through between Melnitsky, who was marching from Konstantinov, and Zbaraj, to which the Tartars were marching. They did not go there, for Pan Kushal stopped them. But hurry! Yes, if I had known that. But I did not know it. Therefore I pressed through with the princess between the Tartars and the Cossacks, as through a defile. Happily the country was empty. Nowhere did we meet a living man, neither in the villages nor in the towns, for all had fled, each where he could, before the Tartars. But my soul was sitting on my shoulders from terror, lest that should catch me which I did not escape in the end. Skshetuski stopped dressing and asked, What was that? This, my master. I came upon the division of the Cossack Doniats, brother of that Horpina with whom the princess was lodged in the ravine. Fortunately I knew him well, for he saw me with Bogan. I brought him a greeting from his sister, showed him Bogan's baton, and told him all, how Bogan had sent me for the lady, and how he was waiting for me beyond Vlodava. But being Bogan's friend, he knew that his sister had been guarding the lady. As a matter of course, I thought he would let me go and give me provisions and money for the road. But, said he, ahead there the general militia is assembling, you'll fall into the hands of the Poles. Stay with me. We'll go to Melnitsky, to his camp. There the girl will be safest of all, for there Melnitsky himself will take care of her for Bogan. When he told me this I thought I should die, for what could I say to it? I said then, Bogan is waiting for me, and my life depends on bringing her at once. But he said, we'll tell Bogan, but don't you go, for the Poles are on that side. Then I began to dispute, and he disputed, till at last he said, it is a wonder to me that you are afraid to go among the Cossacks. Ho! Ho! Are you not a traitor? Then I saw there was no other help but to slip away by night, for he had already begun to suspect me. Seven sweats came out on me, my master. I had prepared everything for the road, when Pan Pelka, from the armies of the king, fell upon us that night. Pan Pelka, asked Pan Yen, holding his breath. Yes, my master. A splendid partisan, Pan Pelka, who was killed the other day. May the Lord light his soul. I don't know whether there is anyone who could lead a detachment better and creep up to the enemy better than he, unless Volodyovsky alone. Pan Pelka came then, and cut up the detachment of Donietz so that not a foot got away. They took Donietz himself prisoner. They drew him on a stake with oxen a couple of weeks ago, served him right. But with Pan Pelka I had trouble not a little, for he was a man desperately intent on the virtue of women, God light his soul. I was afraid that the princess, who had escaped harm from the Cossacks, would be worse treated by her own. 
but I told Pan Pelka that the lady was a relative of our prince. And I must tell you that he, whenever he mentioned our prince, removed his hat, and was always preparing to enter his service. He respected the princess therefore, and conducted us to Zamost to the king. And there the priest Setsashovsky, he is a very holy priest, my master, took us in care, and gave the lady to Pani Vitovska, wife of the castellan of Sandomir. Skshatusky drew a deep breath, then threw himself on the neck of Genzian. You shall be a friend to me, a brother, not a servant. When was Pani Vitovska to come here? The week after I left, but it is now ten days. You lay eight days without consciousness. Let us go, let us go, exclaimed Skshatusky, for joy is tearing me to pieces. But before he had finished speaking the tramp of horses was heard outside, and the window was suddenly darkened by horses and men. Skshatusky saw through the glass, first the old priest Setsashovsky, and then the emaciated faces of Zagloba, Volodyovsky, Kushal, and other acquaintances among the red dragoons of the prince. A shout of joy was given forth, and in a moment a crowd of knights with the priest at the head of them burst into the room. Peace concluded at Zborovo, the siege raised, cried the priest. But Skshatusky inferred this immediately by the look of his companions of Zberij, and at once he was in the embraces of Zagloba and Volodyovsky, who disputed for him with each other. They told us that you were alive, cried Zagloba, but the joy is the greater that we see you so soon in health. We have come here for you, purposely. Yen, you don't know with what glory you have covered yourself and what reward awaits you. The king has rewarded you, said the priest, but the king of kings has provided something better. I know already, said Skshatusky. May God reward you. Genzian has told all. And joy did not kill you? So much the better. Vivat Skshatusky. Vivat the princess, shouted Zagloba. Well, Yen, we didn't whisper a word to you about her, for we didn't know that she was alive. But Genzian is a cunning rogue, he escaped with her, Vulpus Astuta. The prince is waiting for you both. Oh, we went for her to Yagerlik. I killed the hellish monster that was guarding her. Those twelve boys got out of your sight, but now you'll see them, and more. I'll have grandchildren, gentlemen. Genzian, tell us if you met great obstacles. Imagine to yourself that I with Pan Michael checked the whole horde. I rushed first on the Tartar regiment. They were trembling before us. Nothing could help them. Pan Michael stood up well too. Where is my daughter? Let me see my daughter. God give you happiness, Yen. Said the little knight, taking Skshatusky again by the shoulders. God reward you for all you have done for me. Words fail me. My life and blood would not suffice to repay, answered Skshatusky. Enough of this, cried Zagloba. Peace is concluded, a fool's peace, gentlemen, but the position was difficult. It is well that we have left that pestilence barrage. There will be peace now, gentlemen. It is by our labors, especially mine, for if Burli had been living the negotiations would have come to nothing. We'll go to the wedding. After that, Yen, keep your eyes open. But you cannot guess what a wedding present the prince has for you. I'll tell you some other time, but where the hangman is my daughter? Let me have my daughter. Bogan won't get her this time, first he'll have to break the rope that binds him. Where is my dearest daughter? I was just getting into the saddle to meet Pani Vitovska, said Skshatusky. Let us go for I am losing my senses. Come on, gentlemen. Let us go with him, not to lose time. Come on. The lady of Sandomir cannot be far distant, said the priest. To horse. Added Pan Michael. But Skshatusky was already outside the door, and sprang on his horse as lightly as if he had not just risen from a bed of sickness. Gensian kept close to his side, for he preferred not to be alone with the priest. Volodyovsky and Zagloba joined them, and they rode as fast as their horses could gallop in advance of all. 
The whole party of nobles and red dragoons flew along by the Toporov road like poppy leaves borne by the wind. Come on, cried Zagloba, beating his horse with his heels. And so they flew on about ten furlongs, till at the turn of the highway they saw before them a line of wagons and carriages surrounded by a number of attendants. Seeing armed men in front of them, some of these hurried with all speed to inquire who they were. Ours, from the king's army, cried Zagloba. And who is coming there? The lady of Sandomir, was the answer. Such emotion seized Skshetuski that not knowing what he did, he slipped from the horse and stood tottering at the roadside. He removed his cap, his temples were covered with drops of perspiration, and he trembled in every limb in presence of his happiness. Pan Michael sprang also from the saddle, and caught his enfeebled friend by the shoulder. Behind them all the others formed with uncovered heads at the side of the highway. Meanwhile the line of wagons and carriages had come up and begun to pass by. In company with Pani Vitovska were traveling a number of other ladies, who looked with astonishment, not understanding what this military procession at the roadside could mean. At last, in the center of the retinue, appeared a carriage richer than the rest. The eyes of the knights beheld through its open windows the dignified countenance of the gray-haired lady, and at her side the sweet and beautiful face of the princess. Daughter! roared Zagloba, rushing straight to the carriage, daughter! Skshetuski is with us, my daughter! They began to cry, stop! Stop, along the line! Hurry and confusion followed. Then Kushal and Volodyovsky conducted or rather drew Skshetuski to the carriage, he had weakened altogether, and became heavier every moment in their hands. His head hung upon his breast. He could walk no farther, and fell on his knees at the steps of the carriage. But a moment later the strong and beautiful arms of the princess held his weakened and emaciated head. Zagloba, seeing the astonishment of the Lady of Sandomir, cried, This is Skshetuski, the hero of Zbaraj. He worked through the enemy, he saved the army, the prince, the whole commonwealth. May God bless them, and long may they live. Long may they live. Vivant! Vivant! cried the nobles. Long may they live! Long may they live! repeated the Vishniavetsky dragoons, till the thunder of their voices was heard over the fields of Toporov. To Tarnopol, to the prince, to the wedding, cried Zagloba. Well, daughter, your sorrows are over, and for Bogan the executioner and the sword. The priest Setsushovsky had his eyes raised to heaven, and his lips repeated the wonderful words, they sowed in tears, and reaped in joy. Skshetuski was seated in the carriage at the side of the princess, and the retinue moved on. The day was wonderfully bright. The oak groves and the fields were floating in sunlight. Low down on the fallow land, and higher above them, and still higher in the blue air drifted here and there silver threads of spiderweb which in the later autumn cover the fields in those parts as if with snow. And there was great stillness all around, but the horses snorted distinctly in the retinue. Pan Michael, said Zagloba, knocking his stirrup against that of Volodyovsky, something has caught me by the throat, and holds me as in that hour when Pan Longin, eternal rest to him, went out from Zbaraj. But when I think that these two have found each other at last, it is as light in my heart as if I had drunk a quart at a draught. If the accident of marriage does not strike you, in old age will nurse their children. Everyone is born for something special, Pan Michael, and both of us it seems are better for war than wedlock. The little knight made no answer, but began to move his mustaches more vigorously than usual. They were going to Toporov and thence to Tarnopol, where they were to join Prince Yeremy, and thence with his troops to the wedding at Lvov. On the way Zagloba told the lady of Sandomir what had happened recently. She learned therefore that the king, after a murderous, indecisive battle, had concluded a treaty with the Khan, not over favorable, but securing peace to the commonwealth, for some time at least. Melnitsky in virtue of the treaty remained hetman, and had the right to select for himself forty thousand registered Cossacks for which concession he swore loyalty and obedience to the king and the estates. It is an undoubted fact, said Zagloba, 
that it will come to war again with Milnitsky, but if only the baton does not pass by our prince, all will go differently. Tell Skshatusky the most important thing, said Volodyovsky, urging his horse nearer. True, answered Zagloba, I wanted to begin with that, but I couldn't catch my breath till now. You know nothing, Yen, of what has happened since you came out, that Bogan is a captive of the prince. Skshatusky and the princess were astonished at this unexpected news to such a degree that they could not speak a word. Helena merely raised her hands, a moment of silence followed. Then she asked, How? In what manner? The finger of God is there, answered Zagloba, nothing else but the finger of God. The negotiations were concluded, and we were just marching out of that pestilence barrage. The prince hurried with the cavalry to the left wing to watch lest the horde should attack the army, for frequently they do not observe treaties. When suddenly a leader with three hundred horse rushed upon the cavalry of the prince. Only Bogan could do such a thing, said Skshatusky. It was he too. But it is not for Cossacks to fall upon soldiers of Zbaraj. Pan Michael surrounded and cut them to pieces, and Bogan, wounded by him a second time, went into captivity. He has no luck with Pan Michael, and he must be convinced of it now, since that was the third time he tried him, but he was only looking for death. It appeared, added Volodyovsky, that Bogan wished to reach Zbaraj from Valadinka, but the road was a long one. He failed. And when he learned that peace was concluded, his mind was confused from rage, and he cared for nothing. Who draws the sword will perish by the sword, for such is the fickleness of fortune, said Zagloba. He is a mad Cossack, and the matter since he is desperate. A terrible uproar arose on his account between us and ruffiandom. We thought that it would come to war again, for the prince cried first of all that they had broken the treaty. Melnitsky wanted to save Bogan, but the Khan was enraged at him, for, said he, he has exposed my word and my oath to contempt. The Khan threatened Melnitsky with war, and sent a messenger to the king with notice that Bogan was a private robber, and with a request that the prince would not hesitate. But treat Bogan as a bandit. It is probable too that it was important for the Khan to get the captives away in quiet. Of these the Tartars have taken so many that it will be possible to buy a man in Stambul for two hobnails. What did the prince do with Bogan? inquired Skshatusky, unquietly. The prince was about to give orders to shave a stake for him at once, but he changed his mind and said, I'll give him to Skshatusky, let him do what he likes with him. Now the Cossack is in Tarnopol underground, the barber is taking care of his head. My God, how many times the soul tried to go out of that man! Never have dogs torn the skin of any wolf as we have his. Pan Michael alone bit him three times. But he is a solid piece, though, to tell the truth, an unhappy man. But let the hangman light him. I have no longer any ill feeling against him, except that he threatened me terribly and without cause. For I drank with him, associated with him as with an equal, till he raised his hand against you, my daughter. I might have finished him at Rosloji. But I know of old that there is no thankfulness in the world, and there are few who give good for good. Let him, here Zagloba began to nod his head. And what will you do with him, Yen? asked he. The soldiers say you will make an outrider of him, for he is a showy fellow, but I cannot believe you would do that. Surely I shall not. He is a soldier of eminent daring, and because he is unhappy is another reason that I should not disgrace him with any servile function. May God forgive him everything, said the princess. Amen, answered Zagloba. He prays to death, as to a mother, to take him, and he surely would have found it if he had not been late at Zbaraj. All grew silent, meditating on the marvelous changes of fortune, till in the distance appeared Grabovo, where they stopped for their first refreshments. They found there a crowd of soldiers returning from Zborovo. Vitovsky, the castellan of Sandomir, who was going with his regiment to meet his wife, and Merik Sobieski, with Shiemsky and many nobles of the general militia who were returning home by that road. The castle at Grabovo had been burned, as well as all the other buildings. But as the day was wonderful, warm and calm, 
without seeking shelter for their heads, all disposed themselves in the oak grove under the open sky. Large supplies of food and drink were brought, and the servants immediately set about preparing the evening meal. Pan Vitovsky had tents pitched in the oak grove for the ladies and the dignitaries, a real camp, as it were. The knights collected before the tents, wishing to see the princess and Pan Yen. Others spoke of the past war, those who had not been at Zberich asked the soldiers of the prince for the details of the siege. And it was noisy and joyous, especially since God had given so beautiful a day. Zagloba, telling for the thousandth time how he had killed Berlai, took the lead among the nobles. Genzian, among the servants who were preparing the meal. But the adroit young fellow seized the fitting moment, and drawing Skshatuski a little aside, bent obediently to his feet. My master, said he, I should like to beg a favor. It would be difficult for me to refuse you anything, answered Skshatuski, since through you everything that is best has come to pass. I thought at once, said the youth, that you were preparing some reward for me. Tell me what you want. Genzian's ruddy face grew dark, and from his eyes shot hatred and stubbornness. One favor I ask, nothing more do I want. Give me Bogan, my master. Bogan, said Skshatuski, with astonishment. What do you want to do with him? Oh, my master, I'll think of that. I'll see that my own is not lost, and that he shall pay me with interest for having put me to shame in Chigirin. I know surely that you will have him put out of the way. Let me pay him first. Skshatuski's brows contracted. Impossible, said he, with decision. Oh, for God's sake! I'd rather die, cried Genzian, piteously. To think that I have lived for disgrace to fasten to me. Ask what you like, I'll refuse you nothing, but this cannot be. Ask your grandfather if it is not more sinful to keep such a promise than to abandon it. Do not touch God's punishing hand with your own, lest you suffer. Be ashamed, Genzian. This man as it is prays to God for death, and besides he is wounded and in bonds. What do you want to be to him, an executioner? Do you want to put shame on a man in bonds, to kill a wounded man? Are you a Tartar or a Cossack manslayer? While I live I will not permit this, and do not mention it to me. In the voice of Pan Yen there was so much power and will that the youth lost every hope at once. Therefore he added with a tearful voice, when he is well he could manage too like me, and when he is sick it is not becoming to take vengeance. When shall I pay him for what I have suffered? Leave vengeance to God, said Pan Yen. The youth opened his mouth. He wished to say something more, inquire about something. But Pan Yen turned away and went to the tents, before which a large assembly had collected. In the center sat Pani Vitovska, at her side the princess, around them the knights. In front of them stood Zagloba, cap in hand. He was telling those who had been only at Zborovo of the siege of Zbaraj. All listened to him with breathless attention. Their faces moved with emotion, and those who had not taken part in the siege regretted that they had not been there. Pan Yen sat near the princess, and taking her hand, pressed it to his lips, then they leaned one against the other and sat quietly. The sun was already leaving the sky, and evening was gradually coming. Skshatuski was lost in attention, as if hearing something new for himself. Zagloba wiped his brows, and his voice sounded louder and louder. Fresh memory or imagination brought before the eyes of the knights those bloody deeds. They saw therefore the ramparts as if surrounded by a sea, and the raging assaults, they heard the tumult and the howling, the roar of cannon and musketry. They saw the prince, in silver armor, standing on the ramparts, amidst the hail of bullets, then suffering, famine. Those red nights in which death circled like a great ill-omened bird over the entrenchments, the departure of Podbipienta, of Skshatuski. All listened, sometimes raising their eyes to heaven or grasping their swords, and Zagloba finished thus. It is now one tomb, one mighty mound. And if beneath it are not now lying the glory of the commonwealth, the flower of its knighthood, the prince Voivoda, I, and all of U.S., 
whom the Cossacks themselves call the Lions of Zberaj. It is owing to him. And he pointed to Skshatusky. True as life, cried Marek Sobieski and Pan Shiemski. Glory to him, honor, thanks, strong voices began to cry. Vivat Skshatusky. Vivat the young couple. Long life to the hero, was cried louder and louder. Enthusiasm seized all present. Some ran for the goblets, others threw their caps in the air. The soldiers began to rattle their sabers, and soon was heard one general shout, Glory! Glory! Long life! Skshatusky, like a true Christian knight, dropped his head obediently. But the princess rose, shook her tresses, a glow came in her face, her eyes were gleaming with pride, for this knight was to be her husband. And the glory of the husband falls on the wife like the light of the sun on the earth. Late at night the assembly parted, going in two directions. Vitovsky, Shiemsky, and Sobieski marched with their regiments toward Toporov. But Skshatusky, with the princess and the squadron of Volodyovsky, to Tarnopol. The night was clear as day. Myriads of stars shone in the sky. The moon rose and illuminated the fields covered with spiderwebs. The soldiers began to sing. Then white mists rose from the meadows and turned the land as it were into one gigantic lake, shining in the light of the moon. On such a night Skshatusky once went forth from Zberich, and on such a night now he felt the heart of Kurtsevichovna beating near his own. Epilogue but this tragedy of history was finished in either at Zborovo nor Zberich, and not even the first act of it. Two years later all Cossackdom rushed forth to do battle with the Commonwealth. Melnitsky rose mightier than ever before. And with him marched the Khan of all the hordes, attended by the same leaders who had fought at Zberich, the wild Tugai Bey, Uru Mirza, Ardemgiriai, Nureddin, Galga, Amirat, and Subahazi. Pillars of flame and groans of men went on before them, thousands of warriors covered the fields, filled the forests. Half a million of mouths sent forth shouts of war, and it seemed to men that the end of the commonwealth had come. But the commonwealth had risen from its lethargy, had broken with the past policy of the chancellor, with treaties and negotiations. It was seen at last that the sword alone could win enduring peace. When the king therefore marched against the hostile inundation, there went with him an army of one hundred thousand soldiers and nobles, besides legions of irregulars and attendants. No one living of the personages in the foregoing narrative was absent. Prince Yeremy Vishnievetsky was there with his whole division, in which were serving, as of old, Skshatusky and Volodyovsky, with the volunteer Zagloba. Both Hetmans, Patotsky and Kalinovsky, were there, ransomed at that time from Tartar captivity. There were present also Stephen Charnetsky, later on the crusher of Karl Gustav, the Swedish king. Pan Shiemsky, commander of all the artillery, General Ubald, Pan Artsyshevsky, Marek Sobieski, Starosta of Krasnostav, with his brother, Yen Sobieski, Starosta of Yavarov, afterward King Yen III. Ludwig Weyer, Voivoda of Pomery, Jakob, Voivoda of Marienburg, Konyetspolsky, the standard bearer, Prince Dominic Zaslavsky. The bishops, the dignitaries of the crown, the senators, the whole commonwealth, with its supreme leader the king. On the fields of Beristeko those many legions met at last, and there was fought one of the greatest battles of history, a battle the echoes of which thundered through all contemporary Europe. It lasted for three days. During the first two the fates wavered, on the third a general engagement decided the victory. Prince Yeremy began that engagement. And he was seen in front of the entire left wing as, armorless and bareheaded, he swept like a hurricane over the field against those gigantic legions. Formed of all the mounted heroes of the Zaporoji, and all the Tartars, Crimean, Nogai, and Belgorod, of Silistrian and Rumelian Turks, Eurumbulus, Genissaries, Serbs, Wallachians, Periotes, and other wild warriors assembled from the Ural, the Caspian, and the swamps of Meotis to the Danube. As a river vanishes from the eye in the foaming waves of the sea, so vanished from the eye the regiments of the prince in that sea of the enemy. 
A cloud of dust moved on the plain like a mad whirlwind and covered the combatants. The whole army and the king stood gazing on this superhuman struggle. Leschinsky, the vice-chancellor, raised aloft the wood of the Holy Cross, and with it blessed the perishing. Meanwhile, on the other flank, the army of the king was approached by the whole Cossack Tabor, two hundred thousand strong, bristling with cannon, which vomited fire. It was like a dragon pushing slowly out of the woods his gigantic claws. But before the bulk of the enemy had issued from the dust in which Vishniavetsky's regiments had disappeared, horsemen began to drop away from their ranks, then tens, hundreds, thousands. And tens of thousands of them, and rushed to the height on which stood the Khan surrounded by his chosen guard. The wild legions fled in mad panic and disorder, pursued by the Poles. Thousands of Cossacks and Tartars strewed the battlefield. And among them lay, cut in two by a double-handed sword, the sworn enemy of the Poles but the trusty ally of the Cossacks, the wild and manful Tugai Bey. The terrible prince had triumphed. But the king looked with the eye of a leader on the triumph of the prince, and determined to break the hordes before the Cossacks could come up. All the forces moved, all the cannon thundered, scattering death and disorder. Soon the brother of the Khan, the lordly Amurat, fell struck in the breast with a bullet. The hordes roared with pain. Wounded in the very beginning of the battle, the Khan looked on the field with dismay. From the distance came Shiemsky in the midst of cannon and fire, and the king with the horse. From both flanks the earth thundered beneath the weight of the cavalry rushing to the fight. Then Islam Jiri I quivered, left the field, and fled. And after him fled in disorder all the hordes, the Wallachians, the Urumbali, the mounted warriors of the Zaporoji, the Silistrian Turks, and the renegades, as a cloud before a whirlwind. The despairing Melnitsky caught up with the fugitives, wishing to prevail on the Khan to return to the battle. But the Khan, bellowing with rage at the sight of the hetman, ordered the Tartars to seize, bind him to a horse, and bear him away. Now there remained but the Cossack Tabor. The leader of that Tabor, Colonel of Kropivna, Dedialo, knew not what had happened to Melnitsky. But seeing the defeat and shameful flight of all the hordes, he stopped the advance, and pushing back with the Tabor, halted in the marshy forks of the Pleshova. Now a storm burst in the heavens, and measureless torrents of rain rushed down. God was washing the land after a just battle. The rain lasted some days, and some days the armies of the king rested, wearied from struggles. During this time the Tabor surrounded itself with ramparts, and was changed into a gigantic movable fortress. With the return of fair weather began a siege, the most wonderful ever seen in life. The hundred thousand warriors of the king besieged the twice one hundred thousand Zaporogians. The king needed cannon, provisions, ammunition. The Zaporogians had immeasurable supplies of powder and all necessaries, and besides seventy cannon of heavier and lighter caliber. But at the head of the king's armies was the king, and the Cossacks had not Melnitsky. The armies of the king were strengthened by a recent victory, the Cossacks were in doubt of themselves. Several days passed, hope of the return of Melnitsky and the Khan disappeared. Then negotiations began. The Cossack colonels came to the king, and beat the forehead to him, asking for pardon. They visited the senators' tents, seizing them by their garments, promising to get Melnitsky even from under the earth and deliver him to the king. The heart of Yen Kazimir was not opposed to forgiveness. He wished to let the rabble return to their homes if all the officers were surrendered. These he determined to keep till Melnitsky should be rendered up. But such an agreement was not to the mind of the officers, who, from the enormity of their offenses, had no hope of forgiveness. Therefore in time of negotiations battles continued, desperate sallies, and every day Polish and Cossack blood flowed in abundance. The Cossacks fought in the daytime with bravery and the rage of despair, but at night whole clouds of them hung round the camp of the king, howling dismally for pardon. Dedialo was inclined to compromise, and was willing to give his head as a sacrifice to the king, if he could only ransom the army and the people. But dissension rose in the Cossack camp. Some wished to surrender, others to defend themselves to the death, 
but all were thinking how to escape from the Tabor. To the boldest, however, this seemed impossible. The Tabor was surrounded by the forks of the river and by immense swamps. Defense was possible for whole years, but to retreat only one road was open, through the armies of the king. Of that road no one in the camp thought. Negotiations, interrupted by battles, dragged on lazily. Dissensions among the Cossacks became greater and more frequent. In one of these Daedalo was deposed from leadership, and a new man chosen. His name gave fresh strength to the fallen spirits of the Cossacks, and striking a loud echo in the camp of the king, roused in some hearts forgotten memories of past sorrows and misfortunes. The name of the new leader was Bogan. He had already occupied a lofty position among the Cossacks in council, and in action the general voice indicated him as the successor of Melnitsky. Bogan, foremost of the Cossack colonels, stood with the Tartars at Berestecho at the head of fifty thousand men. He took part in the three days' cavalry fight, and defeated with the Khan and the hordes by Yeremi. He succeeded in bringing out of the defeat the greater part of his forces and finding shelter in the camp. Then after Dedialo the party opposed to conciliation gave him chief command, hoping that he was the one man able to save the Tabor and the army. In truth the young leader would not hear of negotiations. He wanted battle and blood, even if he had to drown in that blood himself. But soon he saw that with his troops it was vain to think of passing with armed hand over the bodies of the king's army. Therefore he grasped after other means. History has preserved the memory of those matchless efforts which to contemporaries seemed worthy of a giant, and which might have saved the army and the mob. Bogan determined to pass through the bottomless swamp of the Plashova, and build over those quagmires a bridge of such make that all the besieged might cross. Whole forests began then to fall under the axes of the Cossacks and sink in the swamp. Wagons, tents, coats, sheepskins were thrown in, and the bridge extended day by day. It appeared that there was nothing impossible to that leader. The king deferred the assault, from aversion to bloodshed. But seeing these gigantic works, he recognized that there was no other way, and ordered the trumpets to sound in the evening for the final struggle. No one knew of that intention in the Cossack camp, and the bridge lengthened all night as before. In the morning Bogan went forth at the head of the officers to examine the work. It was Monday, July 7, 1651. The morning of that day rose pale, as if from fright, the dawn was bloody in the east, the sun appeared, red, sickly. A sort of bloody reflection lighted the woods and forests. From the Polish camp they were driving the horses to pasture, the Cossack tabor sounded with the voices of awakened men. Fires were lighted, the morning meal prepared. All saw the departure of Bogan, his retinue, and the cavalry going with him, by the aid of which he intended to drive away the voevoda of Bratslav, who had occupied the rear of the tabor and was injuring the Cossack works with his cannon. The crowd looked on the departure quietly, and even with hope in their hearts. Thousands of eyes followed the young commander, and thousands of mouths said, God bless thee, my falcon. The leader, the retinue, and the cavalry receded gradually from the tabor, came to the edge of the forest, glittered once more in the early sunlight and began to disappear in the thicket. Then some awful, terrified voice shouted, or rather howled, at the gate of the tabor, Save yourselves, men. The officers are fleeing, roared hundreds and thousands of voices. The roar passed through the crowd, as when a whirlwind strikes a pine wood, and then a terrible, unearthly cry burst forth from two hundred thousand throats, Save yourselves! Save yourselves! The Poles! The officers are fleeing! Masses of men rose at once, like a mad torrent. Fires were trodden out, wagons and tents overturned, palings broken to pieces, men trampled and suffocated. Piles of bodies barred the road. They rushed over corpses, amidst howls, shouts, uproar, groans. Crowds poured from the square, burst on to the bridge, stuck in the swamp. The drowning seized one another with convulsive embraces, and crying to heaven for mercy, sank in the cold moving swamp. On the bridge began a battle and slaughter for place. 
The waters of the Pleshova were filled with bodies. The nemesis of history took terrible payment for Palavtsi with Beristeko. The awful shouts came to the ears of the young leader, and he knew at once what had happened. But in vain did he return at that moment to the Tabor. In vain did he turn to meet the crowd with hands raised to heaven. His voice was lost in the roar of thousands. The terrible river of fugitives bore him away, with his horse, his retinue, and all the cavalry, and carried him on to destruction. The armies of the king were amazed at the sight of this movement, which some mistook at first for a desperate attack. But it was difficult not to believe the eyes of all. A few moments later, when their amazement had passed, all the regiments, without waiting even for command, rushed upon the enemy. First went like a whirlwind the dragoon regiment. In the front of it Volodyovsky, with saber above his head. The day of vengeance, defeat, and judgment had come, whoever was not trampled or drowned went under the sword. The rivers were so filled with blood, that it could not be told whether blood or water flowed in them. The bewildered crowds, still more disordered, began to trample and push one another into the water, and drown. Death filled those awful forests, and reigned in them the more terribly since strong divisions began to defend themselves with rage. Battles were fought in the swamp, on the stumps, in the field. The voevoda of Bratslav cut off retreat to the fugitives. In vain did the king give orders to restrain the soldiers. Mercy had perished. And the slaughter lasted till night, a slaughter such as the oldest warriors did not remember, and at the recollection of which the hair rose on their heads in later times. When at last darkness covered the earth, the victors themselves were terrified at their work. No, Te Deum was sung, and not tears of joy, but of regret and sorrow, flowed from the eyes of the king. So ended the first act in the drama of which Melnitsky was the author. But Bogan did not lay down his head with others in that day of horror. Some say that, seeing the defeat, he was the first to save himself by flight, others, that a certain knight of his acquaintance saved him. No one was able to reach the truth. This alone is certain, that in succeeding wars his name came out frequently among the names of the most noted leaders of the Cossacks. A shot from some vengeful hand struck him a few years later, but even then his last day did not come. After the death of Prince Vishnievetsky, from military toils, when the domains of Lubny fell away from the body of the Commonwealth, Bogan obtained possession of the greater part of their area. It was said that at last he would not recognize Melnitsky over him. Melnitsky himself, broken, cursed by his own people, sought aid from abroad. But the haughty Bogan refused every guardianship, and was ready to defend his Cossack freedom with the sword. It was said, too, that a smile never appeared on the lips of this strange man. He lived not in Lubny, but in a village which he raised from its ashes, and which was called Rosloji. Intestine wars survived him, and continued for a long time, then came the plague and the Swedes. The Tartars were almost continual visitors in the Ukraine, carrying legions of people into captivity. The Commonwealth became a desert, a desert the Ukraine. Wolves howled on the ruins of former towns, and a land once flourishing became a mighty graveyard. Hatred grew into the hearts and poisoned the blood of brothers. Notes Polish Alphabet Since the Polish alphabet has many peculiar phonetic combinations which are difficult to one who does not know the language. It was decided to transliterate the names of persons and places in which such combinations occur in this book. The following are the letters and combinations which are met with most frequently. Polish letters. English sounds. Chapter C. T.S. C.Z. C.H. in chief. S.C. S.H. in ship. S.C.C.Z. S.H.C.H. RZ are followed by the French J. W. Chapter 5. Z. J in French. In this transliteration CH retains its ordinary English sound. KH is used as the German CH or the Gaelic CH in Locke. So is H, as in Melnitsky, 
and a few names in which it is used at the beginning and preceding a consonant, where it has the power of the German chj is the French j. The vowels e, i, u, r, respectively, ai in bait, ee -e in beat, oo in pool, when long, when short, bet, bit, put, would represent their values. The following names will illustrate the method of this transliteration. Polish form of name. Form in transliteration. Potocki. Potocki. Kulczynski. Kulczynski. Dasinski. Dasinski. Leskczynski. Leszczynski. Rzenzian. Genzian. Warenchenko. Warenchenko. Zabkowski. Jabkowski. In Genzian the initial R has been omitted. On account of the extreme difficulty of its sound to anyone not a Pole. In Skrzytowski, a very difficult name also, SH has been used instead of the French J, because in this word the two sounds are almost identical, and the sound of SH is known to all, while J is not. Accent. All Polish words, with few exceptions, are accented on the syllable next the last, the penult. The exceptions are foreign names, some compounds, some words with enclitics. Polish names of men and places are generally accented on the penult. In Russian, both of the Ukraine and the North, or of Little and Great Russia, there is much freedom in placing the accent. In this book there are many Russian names of men and places, but the majority of names are accented on the penult. It has been thought best, therefore, to state this fact, and place accents only on words accented on syllables other than the penult. Some of these were accented in the body of the book. The rest are accented here. The following names of men are accented on the last syllable. Balaban. Barabash. Bogan. Berdabut. Chernota. The following names of places are accented as indicated. Baksh Sarai. Basiluk. Belgorod. Bogoslav. Galata. Hassan Pasha. Kamenets. Koravai. Mergorod. Parakop. Sekernaya. Sleparod. Volochysk. Jagerlik. Polish names in Ski and Vich are adjectives. Regularly declined, with masculine and feminine endings. The titles of address pan, pani, panna, refer respectively to a gentleman, a married lady, an unmarried lady. The following are examples. Pan Kurtsevich. Pani Kurtsevichova. Panna Kurtsevichovna. These three forms when applied to one family refer to the father, mother, and an unmarried daughter. The ending in ski is not so complicated. For instance. Pan Patatsky. Pani Patatska. Panna Patatska. The names in which denote descent, those in ski, origin in, or lordship over, a place. Nikolai Patatsky, Grand Hetman, captured at Korsen, was Pan Patatsky, which means Lord of Potok, Potok being the name of the place which he inherited. He was also Pan Krakowski, Lord of Krakow, Krakow, because he was Castellan of Krakow, Krakow, an office to which he was appointed by the king. The names of villages which Zagloba mentions as belonging to Podbipienta are curious enough, whether real or invented by the whimsical narrator. As is also the name Povsinoga, which he gives the tall Lithuanian, and which means, tramp. The villages, taken in the order in which he gives them in chapter XLV, Mishikishki, Sikishki, Pigvishki, Sarutsiani, Tsayaputsiani, Kapustsiana Gloa, Baltapai, are, excluding the first two. The meanings of which are given in chapter 2, Crabapple Town, Homespunville, Simple Town, Cabbage Head, and Slab Town. The soup Bidvinia, mentioned in connection with Podbipienta and Pan Karlamp, which is made of vegetables and fish in eastern Russia, may be made, it seems, without fish in Lithuania. The word is used figuratively to designate a rustic or stay-at-home villager. Offices and Things Balalaika 
a stringed instrument used in southern Russia, resembling the guitar. Castellan. The chief of a town or city under Polish rule, as well as the district connected with it. The Castellan was always a senator, and was appointed by the king. Shambul. A party of mounted Tartars. Koshivoy. Chief of a Cossack camp. Kuren. A company or group of Cossacks as well as the barracks in which they lived. Sotnik. A captain of Cossacks. This word is exactly equivalent to centurion, and is derived from sto, 100, with the nominative ending nik. Stanitsa. A Cossack village. Starosta. Chief of a town under Polish control. Starshini. Elders. This word meant for the Cossacks the whole body of their officers. Telega. The ordinary springless wagon of Russia, smaller than the country wagon in the United States. Tiorban. A large musical instrument of twenty strings or more. Voivoda. Governor and commander of troops in a province, corresponding to the military governor of modern times. This office was common to the Poles and the Russians of the East or Moscow.